Welcome to the Campaign on Violence National Conference. My name is Dr. Kit Evans Ford, and I will be your MC today. I am so glad you are here with us. I've been a national trainer, community organizer, and outreach leader for campaign nonviolence for over a decade now. I'm excited to be here with you today. Today, we are actively embracing the nonviolent shift. Today, we also mark the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Thank you to all who participated in the online vigil, as well as the online nonviolence training this week. That nonviolence training was actually the largest Pache Bene has seen in its history. So thank you so much for your participation. The conference is also being translated in Spanish. You can find the interpretation button on the bottom of your screen. We have live online translators joining us from Mexico City, Mexico. Just click on the link and your audio will be translated. Thank you to our translators, Hilda and Elsa. We're so glad you're here with us today. This year has been a whirlwind, literally, of violence, suffering, pain, and loss. The reality of COVID-19 spread the lack of consciousness and justice for our current, from our current president, the climate crisis, the killings of our black brothers and sisters, the loss of our dear beloved civil rights leader, John Robert Lewis, who served in the United States House of Representatives for Georgia's fifth congressional district for 33 years. We are dedicating this conference to the spirit and work of John Lewis who served all of us and showed all of us the power of active nonviolence by taking courageous action over and over again. In his honor, let us have a moment in remembrance and silence for his life and legacy. Thank you, Congressman John Lewis. John Lewis was a son of sharecroppers and an apostle of nonviolence who took powerful, risky nonviolent action in Nashville, in Selma, and in many other places, including on the floor of the US Congress when necessary. He called this good trouble. His spirit is with us today in this conference as we explore that love, the love that does justice, as Dr. King described nonviolence. As we do our work today, let us savor these words from his very last statement, his opinion piece in the New York Times published on the date of his funeral entitled, Together You Can Redeem the Soul of Our Nation. In that love letter to our world, he wrote, Emmett Till was my George Floyd. He was my Richard Brooks, Sandra Bland, and Breonna Taylor. He was 14 when he was killed, and I was only 15 years old at the time. I will never forget the moment when it became so clear that he could easily have been me. In those days, fear constrained us like an imaginary prison and troubling thoughts of potential brutality committed for no understandable reason were the bars. Like so many young people today, I was searching for a way out, or some might say a way in. And then I heard the voice of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on an old radio. He was talking about the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. He said, we are all complicit when we tolerate injustice. He said, it is not enough to say it will get better by and by. He said, each of us has a moral obligation to stand up, speak up, speak out. When you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. Democracy is not a state, it is an act. And each generation must do its part to help build up what he called and what we called the beloved community. 
a nation and world society at peace with itself. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I called good trouble, necessary trouble. Though I may not be here with you, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and stand up for what you truly believe in. In my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now, is, now it is your turn to let freedom ring. Today, we are exploring this more excellent way of nonviolence. Today's conference, organized by Pacha Bene Nonviolent Service, is action packed with vision, strategies, and practices that will equip us to live and lead on the nonviolent journey. So, dare I say, buckle your seatbelts, everyone. The conference will have three sections nonviolent practices, nonviolent education and action and nonviolent strategies. In each of these three sections, we will hear from powerful visionaries, activists, teachers, artists, and scholars sharing their wisdom as they are struggling to build a culture of active nonviolence. These change agents are working for racial equity, climate justice, indigenous rights, an end to gun violence and an elimination of poverty and a nuclear free future. We are grateful that these amazing agents of change are with us. Thank you so much for your time. A link to today's full schedule of events can be found in your chat box on the screen. To see this, you can click on the chat box icon at the bottom of your screen. You can also find the schedule at campaignnonviolence.org. Additionally, the conference is being recorded and will be available to all registrants after the conference is over. As far as logistics, you can find the restrooms in the comfort of your own home. Snacks are available and coffee or tea are available uh, connected to your personal designated kitchen. I thought I would include some COVID-19 online humor today, so I hope that made you smile or laugh. During the conference, those of you watching from home will have your audio video turned off so that we can focus on the main speakers. One other thing you'll notice is that the chat box has been disabled, except for the staff and presenters to share information with you, like helpful links and other information. If you have a burning question, select the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question in the open field. Most questions will only be seen by the presenters. We won't be able to get to every question that comes in, but we'll do our best with the time available to get your questions answered. If you're hungry for a more participatory, engaged small group environment, come take one of our online classes um, where you'll get really awesome speaker interaction and engagement with trainers. Over the next three months, Pacha Bene will be hosting 10 trainings. So visit pachabene.org slash events. Also wanted to mention, if you have a question that isn't answered during the conference, please do visit pachabene.org or email info at pachabene.org and we'll make sure that question gets to the speaker that you would like to um, ask that question to. Pachabene means peace and all good in Italian. We want to start and maintain the conference with this peace and all good energy. We have over 600 people participating in this conference today. Welcome, welcome. These people and you all are participating from 45 different states in the United States and 15 countries around the world. So I wanna give a shout out to each country represented on the call. We have online participants from Colombia, Pakistan, South Africa, Peru, 
India, Korea, Mexico, Australia, Canada, Germany, Spain, the United Kingdom, Greece, Ireland, as well as the United States. Again, thank you to all who have joined the special conference on active and liberating nonviolence. To today, together, we are embracing the nonviolent shift, connecting with each other, and committing to create a just, healthy, and sustainable world for all. We are so glad that you're here. So, the first part of the conference will be focusing on nonviolent practices. And our first guest is Reverend Richard Rohr from the Center for Action and Contemplation. Reverend Richard Rohr is one of the world's best known theologians and religious leaders. A Franciscan priest, his many books include the recent bestsellers, The Universal Christ, and the Divine Dance. He is the founder of the Center for Action and Contemplation. Thank you so much, Reverend Moore, for being on the conference today, and we welcome him to be present and present with us for the next few minutes. Thank you, Reverend Moore. Thank you, kids. What an honor this is, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, we hoped we were going to have you right here in Albuquerque, literally down the road, but uh, that didn't happen, but maybe something better can happen now. So pray that I say in these few minutes something worth your time that is really helpful to the movement we're trying to create, and that's what we, we have to be trying to create, not just an idea, not just good speakers, but a movement. Uh, you know, it, it's when we first began to speak, at least my generation, of nonviolence back in the 60s, it largely had to do with war itself, the most intense meaning of, of violent behavior. But our inability to really address this issue, understand this issue, has allowed it to move to, to every level of society. We speak, for example, commonly, I think there's a day I don't hear the word weaponized used. Conversation is weaponized, masks are weaponized, healthcare is weaponized. We're living in a, a world that is choosing violence. Now, not everybody, thank God. And our numbers have grown because I do think consciousness is evolving. And I want to say that at the beginning. What used to be un unthinkable uh, by more and more people is thinkable. Although it really isn't. And let me explain that. And why we do what we do here at the Center for Action and Contemplation. And not just ourselves, but I would like to offer that all of the world religions at the higher levels, not the street corner religion of fast food, but people who were really on an inner journey, they all discovered that you had to rewire this. And until this is rewired, uh, just lectures and sermons don't do it. So I was so glad Kim used the word practices. Uh, I'll, I'll get to that in the last few minutes, I hope. But um, unless you have some practices to create some muscle memory, if I can use that mixed metaphor, even up here in the brain, another sermon doesn't do it. Willpower doesn't do it. Saying, I believe in nonviolence doesn't of itself do it, I'm sad to say. And that's why wonderful people like you are still around doing your work 50 years after the 60s when we thought, okay, we brought, not we, but wonderful people like King and Gandhi 
have, have brought nonviolence to the fore. I'm going to start with something real basic, although it isn't basic at all. I think the universally available forms of transformation, and that should be the work of every religion. If it isn't transforming people's anger, hurt, pain, they are just going to transmit it to the people around them, to their family. And that's what we have happening, uh, certainly in America today. Uh, but we don't know what else to do with the inner anger, darkness, resentment, fear, whatever else it might be. So the universal patterns of transformation are so obvious that they'll almost be a disappointment to you. I hope not. Great love and great suffering. And those two paths have been available to human beings, I think, since the Stone Age. Because God did care about Stone Age people too. God didn't just start caring with the emergence of our particular religion, whatever that might be. So uh, if you can observe what's happening in your heart, your mind, and your body, in the presence of a, of a unitive state with another anything, not just a human person, but as my father Francis would say, with an animal, with the beautiful trees I'm looking out at in, from my hermitage here in New Mexico, uh, to a human person where it's more easily reciprocated. That state, we have to find a way to preserve it. You think of it as the honeymoon state or the grief state. But whatever you learn, and, and it's a fast track of learning on honeymoon state or grief state. Uh, but if you don't have some wise teachers, some wise guides, uh, you lose it after the honeymoon passes, after your grief work is done. You get back in to what we call dualistic thinking. So what all the wor world religions discovered at the mature levels was that dualistic thinking, which is our normal mode, at least in the West, because Eastern religions seem to have more easy access. We see the very word non-duality used in uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. Uh, in fact, all over the years when I tried to speak of it, I, I found Asian people would get it immediately. They say it's much more embedded in their language. As others tell us, it was embedded in the Aramaic of Jesus. But we uh, grew out of the Western tradition of Greek clarity, uh, which was clarity that was good for science and, and math and engineering and, and things that demand either or thinking. But we paid a big price for it. We became so enamored with this clarity now, I'm going to describe it in a most simple way. That in most cases, if you listen to conversation, just listen to American politics now. Two options will be offered you. And you're made to think because you choose one option, you're smart. I mean, really, that's what we're up against. Let, let's take one that we've all had to endure for the last few years. Build a wall or open borders. No, nothing in between. Build a wall, open borders. When that's not what most of us are saying, or most of us are even thinking. But the question, the problem, the issue is framed for us, and then we're forced to, to choose. And at that point, we think we're smart and People who chose the other side are dumb, are heretical, or stupid, or wrong, are dangerous. Choose whatever word you want. 
uh, this has so invaded our entire culture that we're now in this uh, postmodern state that we call a post-truth culture, that people would rather have something that resolves their anxiety quickly, usually a bold-faced lie, rather than hold the tension and wait for subtlety, wait for compassion, wait for understanding, something in between uh, build a wall and, you know, open the borders entirely. So what, what we hear, of course, in our school in New Mexico, we call this different mind, and that's what it is, which now Western people have to be trained in. We call it contemplation. Most Eastern religions call it meditation. Some people just call it silence or mindfulness, some way to break out of this obsessive fight or flight uh, place to hide. And that's what it is. And at this point, the Western mind goes there easily. For those of you familiar with integral theory or spiral dynamics, it pretty much continues all the way to what they call the green level. Even greens who believe in equality usually have not radically changed their mind. They still like us and them, winners and losers, right guys and bad guys. And that's why we have to convict those of us on the left, if I can say that, just as much as those of us on the right because those of us on the left are of course convinced we're totally right too. And uh, our job is to defeat, humiliate, exclude uh, those on the right. This isn't gonna get us anywhere. They have a term for that. I, I know it won't make complete sense if, if you're not familiar with integral theory, but they call such people mean greens. They're at this highly evolved level of green equality thinking, but the real heart space, mind space, has not been changed. Radically, anyway. They, they still think dualistically. They still think in terms of us and them. And I got to admit, I do. I mean, <laughs> I'm getting political now, but every day this president opens his mouth. I, uh, <laughs> I have to resist every bit of energy to not dislike him. Let's just leave it at that. How can even 30% of America believe such stupidity? And, and their dualism is so uh, grabbed onto identified with that reality is denied, obvious reality. And I, I don't believe God caused this COVID-19 pandemic, but I do believe, and I am a believer, uh, that God uses everything, which is what I'm trying to say in my book, the universal Christ. The Christ mystery is available universally all the time. And uh, there we, uh, we, we've got to recognize that one thing we might learn from this is that you can't disagree with reality. Reality is the greatest ally of God, the real, what is. Now, that reality has come upon us in a global sense, and we're still denying it <laughs> between those who are for science and those who are against science, those who wear a mask and those who don't wear a mask. That's how invested we are in dualistic thinking. Now, it tells me religion, and of course, I'm a Franciscan, I'm a priest, 
I know some people wish I weren't, but I still try to hang on to the best, and there's a lot of best there. Uh, why uh, the relig I can't give up on religion, because we're most prepared to lead people to what integral theory calls second tier consciousness. And unless you discover practices, now we're coming to what you asked me to do. I hope the first part hasn't been a waste of time. Um, uh, second tier consciousness is what I call the mystical mind. Maybe you'd call the contemplative mind or for our purposes here, maybe you'd call the non-dual mind where I simply refuse to split reality into binary choices. Uh, and that takes years of training to stop doing that, to hold the tension of both and, yes, and. And don't come out too quickly with any absolute no. Now, in the early stages, you, it's, it doesn't sound very religious at all. You just have to watch your mind and how, my God, I'm doing it every three minutes. Creating an enemy, creating something to be upset about, a problem to solve, a president to hate, uh, a race to fear. Oh my God, it's, you, you, you have to suffer that humiliation or you won't let go of this stinking thinking as the alcoholics rightly call it. But we're trained in stinking thinking now. So I don't care where you go, who your teacher is. Uh, it, is it silence? Is it solitude? Is it extended retreats? Is it um, walking meditation? Is it a 20 minute sit in the morning and the afternoon as some do? But somehow you've got to find a practice that helps you to disidentify with this argumentative mind. It loves to argue and it loves to win, even in your head. And when you catch yourself still needing to win, even in your head, you're violent. You are. <laughs> it isn't enough to believe in a theory of nonviolence. It's a matter of rewiring, which means some kind of practicing. Uh, so I don't go there, or at least I catch myself going there. I'm 77 now, and, and you'd think I wouldn't do it anymore, but I do it every day. And, and the only difference is more often than not, not always, I, I tend to catch myself doing it. Why am I fearing that woman? Why am I angry at that man? Why am I judging that person? I was up on Sandia Peak here in New Mexico yesterday with a friend. And we were sitting there for quite a while talking. And I, I'm ashamed to admit this, you know? But uh, I found my mind, I don't know why I was so happy but judging the way people were stupidly dressed. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? You'd think a Franciscan would know better. Or, or covered their beautiful bodies with tattoos, as if God cares. You know? But I cared. Just, just things, things to fuss about. And they didn't last too long. I hope they didn't affect my behavior. And I tried to smile, but they couldn't see it behind my mask. But that's what you have to start doing. Catch it in the bud. There I go again, Richard. You're doing it again. You're projecting your inner negativity onto another person. Your inner insecurity, your inner self-doubt, your inner antagonism. The only way out is great love whatever pulls that great love out of you you know it was some birds up there yesterday and just to delight in one of them 
and most people were bringing their dogs and I love dogs and just to delight in anything for its own sake. Love is always gratuitous for its own sake. Just how lovely. Then the view from the mountaintop overlooking the city of Albuquerque, just glorious. And I live down there in one little part of it. And God now grants me the ability to see all of it. And that's only a dot in this huge universe. So those are prayers that allow you to experience your own reality instead of running from reality. And what we have now, let's bring it home, certainly in American politics, but a lot of other countries, is such an attachment to dualistic denial, dualistic deceit, that uh, a high percentage of people are not just against the opposite group, but the opposite group is the real. It's sort of unbelievable. Huh? How can what's really happening be so frightening to you? Well, for 40 years, you've avoided the real, even by religion. And I say that as a priest. Religion is one of the best ways to hide from reality. To just have an ideology that you believe in instead of what is. What is, is the greatest ally of God. And what is, is something you have to surrender to each day. There it is again, reality. Huh? It's the greatest teacher. It's sure to humiliate you because it's always bigger than you. And if you stay with it, it brings you not to judgment, but to compassion. Because your glib answers don't work anymore. They're counting me down. It's time for Richard to, to shut up. But I'm honored to be asked to speak today. John Deere is so sweet, he's cheering me on. <laughs> uh, but I think we have a few minutes, don't we, for questions. Absolutely, we do, Reverend Rohr, and we we are excited to to have more time with you. We definitely don't want to rush you, um, but we appreciate your wisdom sharing on action and contemplation. And we have had some questions come in. Um, so, uh, Sister Andrea Coverman, she's going to be facilitating the question and answer. So I'm just going to read her uh, bio briefly, and we'll jump right into the questions. Does that sound good, Reverend Rohr? Yes, it does. You don't need to okay. call me Reverend. I don't okay. think I'm not much to be revered. Can okay. I ask Andrea a question when she comes on? Yeah, read, well, how about read. I um, read her bio and okay, then you can ask yes. the question. Okay, yes. all right, sounds yes. good. All right, so Sister Andrea Coverman, formerly on the staff of the Intercommunity Justice and Peace Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, now currently working on the border near El Paso, Texas. Sister Coverman is a member of the Sisters of Charity community whose wisdom, whose mission is to strive to live the gospel values by acting justly, building loving relationships, sharing resources with those in need, and caring for all creation. She has a master's degree in curriculum and administration. Okay, so now Richard, we can jump right in with Sister Andrea, and we have about 15 minutes for question and answer. 15 minutes. I'll try not to belabor my answers. Okay. All right. Welcome, Sister Andrea. Andrea, you're Thank from you. Cincinnati or from Centerville? Um, I grew up in Centerville, so uh, your, your question about my relatives, uh, those are my cousins. Gretchen yeah. is your cousin, huh? Gretchen and Sister Kateri was a, a, a sister of charity. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Was? Is she gone? passed away three years oh. ago. Yeah. You know, you, I'm going to ask you to send me Gretchen's phone number. I'll be happy to. I snuck out of the seminary. <laughs> I shouldn't tell this on national TV. <laughs> and we went horseback riding together. Yes. Does yes. she remember that? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'll tell you a good story about that when she was in division. Oh, for her here is shaking his finger at me. <laughs> But she was such a dear, too. Okay, lead the questions. Okay. 
Well, um, one question that I would like to ask you, uh, given that I am uh, living and working on the border, um, is how you um, could see the um, ideas of non-duality um, helping the contentious situation at the border. Yeah. Well, it better. Uh, but because again, people are so invested in their own narrative. You know, there's only one thing worse than an idea, and it's an opinion. An opinion is an idea that you've wrapped your ego around. Were you in the living school? I am right now in the living school, yes. That's why your face is familiar. Yes. Okay, anyway, uh, you've probably heard me say that there. So we have highly opinionated people on the right for sure, on the left, we have highly fearful people who are desperate for their lives. Now, we can't deny them their anxiety. You and I know what they've gone through. But um, I don't want to say we have to just preach the gospel to one side. But we do, for the sake of their sanity, need to help the refugees, the immigrants, uh, from over-investment in their fear, uh, to keep them as best we can uh, with some kind of inner freedom, some kind of inner hope, even though it's been dashed a dozen times. Uh, I know that's a, a big recipe, but um, otherwise I'm saying one side it has to do all the learning and the other side has nothing to grow from. Even our dear refugees have something to grow from, even though they're running for their lives. So we got to find a way through kindness, through solidarity, through participation, to walk with such people and to say, uh, the world is still good. Uh, life is still good. <laughs> because that's what's so hard for them to believe. Last year, I made a tour down the, uh, to the borderland uh, at the bottom of Texas. And I met so many who just, you wanted to weep. I'm sure you've met them many times. Very often, they're not as educated. And so they, they have no way to explain, why is the world so cruel? Why does the world not like us? And their simple faith often translates this to God. God doesn't like us. I bet I'd feel that way. So you've got to show them that God likes them. <laughs> <laughs> and you will, too. Yeah, please. Thank you, Andrea. You're welcome. We, we do the best we, we can. Um, another question that has come through is to please expand on um, your statement that the opposite is the real. Well, let me, did I say it just that way? Let me try to say it better. Reality, whenever you accept reality in its wholeness, if you're honest about it, it will always, and I'm using that always intentionally, have a paradoxical character to it, if you're honest. <laughs> that, that there's some good effects from the worst decisions that our government makes. Maybe it's only 5%. Uh, to be able to humbly uh, admit the paradoxical character of mystery. And life is a mystery, love is a mystery, death is a mystery, uh, everything that matters. Sex is a mystery. Uh, it's just the biggies are all paradoxical. They, they're, they're good, but they carry a little baggage with them. Um, and uh, so I'm saying reality is that kind of mystery. And even people that we want to make totally bad, uh, uh, I remember when I first preached in Germany and uh, they took me down to the basements of 
all these churches, beautiful German churches. And they're just filled with medieval art and statues and carvings. And they said, well, one good effect of Hitler was we, we hid all of our great art in the basement because we knew you were gonna come and bomb us. Well, maybe that is a big price to pay for art. But if I'm honest, it is one little good effect of a horribly, horribly bad thing. I'm not trying to create a moral equation like he did at Charlottesville. But I am saying you, you've got to hold the tension of opposites or otherwise you just go crazy. You just go crazy. You, compassion won't come your way. It really won't. Okay. Thank you. That was, sorry. That's all. Go ahead, Andrea. I just was going to say that was a question from Lynn Rogers. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and this is a question from um, Catherine Hoffman. And she's asking you to say a little about the way in which racial supremacy conditioning also contributes to our judgments and our reactions. And any strategies for turning towards uh, in order to loosen the hold. The last year and a half, we had uh, training for our whole staff. We have 50 people on our staff and we all think of ourselves as very enlightened and very liberal and very Christian. Well, no, they're not all Christian. But, uh, and it was, it was sincerely humiliating to us uh, to be forced to recognize those of us who were white, our, our hidden white supremacy, our uh, white privilege that was so with us. I know it was for me since my birth that I learned not to see it. Why would you see it? It's been with me all the time. So the secret of exposing the shadow, you see this in the exorcisms of Jesus, is to simply e expose it, <laughs> name it, and name it rightly, name it truthfully. And what we found out uh, in this year and a half of struggling with this as a whole group, it wasn't just white supremacy that most of us enjoyed, if you can enjoy such a thing, uh, but uh, white fragility, that we don't like to be told this. <laughs> We're very tender about it because I'm uh, educated, uh, liberal, broad-minded Franciscan, and I'm not uh, that way. You know, even the, the uh, medieval doctors of the church like Bonaventure, Duns Scotus, Aquinas, they all said the only way evil can succeed is by disguising itself as good. That's, that's why Jesus calls Satan the father of lies. Evil doesn't usually look like evil. The Germans thought they were making Germany great again. And darn it, how can people be so fooled, huh? So to recognize at the beginning that you've got to be fooled first about where evil lies and where goodness lies. And if you don't have some quality of the subtlety of evil, some recognition of that, and you're totally encapsulated inside of your own ego, you'll be fooled every time. You'll think goodness is what's good for moi, for me, for Richard, for America, for the Catholic Church, for the Franciscans, for... New Mexico, whatever little group I'm a part of, uh, has to win. That's what's got to die, because that thinking just can't get you there. So there's got to be a major death, and it is a major death, to your own self-referential world. You're not the center of anything. <laughs> this is where good cosmology should be helping us. Now, why can we 
absorb a really good cosmology because, of course, I'm a Christian, but I've been told by the gospel that I'm precious, beloved, unconditionally in the mind and the heart of God. Once I know that, once I rest in that, I don't need to be the center of anything else. I really don't. I don't need to prove my country's the best, my religion's the best, I'm the best, men are better than women. Just go through the whole list of isms. Those are all the results of people not knowing an infinite love. And that's why, as angry as I get at organized religion, I still can't give up on it. Because we're the only ones free to talk about an infinite love. But usually we preachers talked about conditional love, finite love. God loves you if you go to Mass on Sunday. God loves you if you're straight and heterosexual. God loves you. Just go through the whole list. That gospel is not gospel. It's bad news. It's not good news. Mm -hmm. I hope that's an answer. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. John, you're so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one, a, one, a big question here. So oh, a big one. All right. Up. Um, this is from Mary Hutton, and she says that she is concerned that we may have an armed conflict in the United States surrounding, and especially, especially after the 2020 presidential election. I don't think whichever is the losing side will accept the election results. What can we do beginning now to work toward a peaceful election time? Beginning now. You're pulling me back to practice, aren't you? And I'm, I, I'm lost right now to see how ready people are to fight. I hope it'll show itself in just some local skirmishes. But I bet you're right. There's too many people in America too over-identified with their own side. And when, once you get into that zealotry, that righteousness, you will justify any violence. So your friend who asked that question it is probably right. Let's just hope it doesn't become broad. And... Uh, we have to model the overcoming of, of dualisms right now and dichotomies uh, by not allowing ourselves to be pulled by righteousness. And remember, I'll repeat it once more. Righteousness on the left is just as troublesome as righteousness on the right. I hope that's a tiny bit of an answer. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for keeping me to my timetable. <laughs> Thank you so much. God bless you all. An honor, an honor to be with you. Thank you. And to be translated into Spanish. What a privilege. Thank you. I hope I sounded good in Spanish. Uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful presentation. And thank you, Richard and Sistandria. And thank you for the wisdom sharing, and I'll never forget uh, what you said about infinite, infinite love that really blessed my heart. So thank you so much, everyone. I know there were um, many questions. And so um, you can always check out the Center for Action and Contemplation at cac.org. Um, or if you have burning questions, you can also email them to info at pachebene.org, and we'll be in communication with Richard and his team. Uh, thank you again, Richard and Andrew. Thank you. And one more sentence. If it's not infinite love, it's not God, okay? Don't believe anything less than infinite love. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Bye, Richard. Bye-bye. Okay. Okay, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and, and, and move forward. What a gift um, the presentation uh, and sharing was from Richard Ward. Thank you again, Richard. Um, so next up is Brother M from South Africa. Brother M, a.k.a. Mapumba, um, is a singer, songwriter, and producer based in Cape Town, South Africa. 
Much of his music is inspired by his early years growing up in the Congo, a time marked by the beauty of his family and nature, but also by war and displacement. Through it all, music was an enduring presence, painting a picture of love and joy, no matter the circumstances for Brother N. Over the last 20 years, he has created seven artist albums available on Bandcamp, iTunes, and Spotify. Brother M will be sharing several of his songs during the conference, and many of these songs he wrote specifically for the Campaign Nonviolence Conference. So this is such a special treat, um, and welcome Brother M to the Campaign Nonviolence Conference. Welcome Brother M. Hello everybody, my name is Mapumba, also known as Brother M. I am based in Cape Town and I'm glad to be part of the campaign Nonviolence Conference USA. I'll be playing you my song called Do For Love. Enjoy. Do For Love Let's all live for something Bigger than one man's pocket feeling Money is sweet only when you're happy In your song They said no To the one thing that we can ignore I like it. 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 Do for love Something bigger than one man's pocket feeling And it is sweet only when we are happy In our souls There's a door To the one thing that we can't ignore And that's love That's love That's love That's love That's love That's love that's love, that's love I'm going to love you deeper than I have loved before I'm going to show you a deeper love that we can't ignore So when we're gone tomorrow, we will know that we did do our best To share the essence of our existence We are all responsible in the end do for love, let's all live for something Bigger than one man's pocket feeling And it is sweet only when we are happy In our souls There's a door To the one thing that we can't ignore And that's love That's love That's love That's love, that's love. That's love. That's love. That's love. Yeah, that's love. I'm going to love you deeper than I have loved before. I'm going to show you a deeper love that we can't ignore. So when we are gone tomorrow, we will know that we need to do our best to share the essence of our existence. We are all responsible in the end to for love. To for love. Bigger than one man's pocket feeling But it is sweet only when we are happy In our souls 
There's a door to the one thing that you can't ignore. That's love. 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 Hi, everyone. Wonderful. Wonderful. We um, are so excited and, and um, we will continue to, to move things forward. Okay. So um, right now, uh, Veronica will be our next special guest. Um, she will, Veronica is um, a trainer with, with Pacha Bene Nonviolent Service, and we will continue to move forward with nonviolent practices. Okay. All right, so Veronica is Pacha Bene's Nonviolence Training Coordinator and the co author of the book Engaging Nonviolence. She has led Pacha Bene Nonviolence Workshops in Colombia, Peru, Venezuela, Argentina, Haiti, Australia. Britain, and the Netherlands. A Zen Buddhist, she is conversion in six different languages, and she lives in Montreal, Canada. Um, Veronica will be sharing and leading uh, this section on nonviolent practices. Welcome, Veronica. Thank you, Kit, and thank you, everybody who's here today. What a pleasure, what an honor it is. So I will share with you today the journey of a man who practiced personal, interpersonal, and social global nonviolence. I found this story in a wonderful book called Sweet Fruit from the Bitter Tree, 61 Stories of Creative, Compassionate Ways Out of Conflict by Mark Andreas. If you're out there, Mark, hello, and thank you so much for this book. So it was in 1999 in Albania, and the chief of the White House Commission on Alternative Healthcare set up a team to do international post-war trauma work. The 11-year-old ordeal of the Balkan War had left oceans of grief, devastation, and woundedness in its wake. The team's intention was to give healing tools to deal with trauma to local health professionals who had survived, participated, and witnessed the most horrific events. Christine, a team member, noticed that amidst the group receiving training was a man who was totally different from the rest. He seemed to have come to a different place within himself than the other people. He was serene, steady and focused. She was curious and engaged him in conversation. When the war broke out, he told her, a neighboring Serbian family whose son had been a childhood playmate turned against his family and he had to watch his mother being beaten and his father brutally killed in front of him. He then escaped to the mountains, hiding for four months, and went into deep, deep reflection. He realized that betrayal was part of the human condition. Millions like him had experienced it throughout history. This broad acceptance settled him and gave him some kind of grounding. When Christine asked him how he had arrived, at such an emotionally healthy place. With all the tragedy and suffering around him, he said, I asked myself one question and one question only, over and over again. How can I prevent this from happening to my own children? He realized that if he held on to the anger and bitterness and hate, it would only result in more trauma. So he made a conscious decision and chose a different path. By asking that question, he was laying the foundation to build bridges between two ethnic cultures. 
When Christine visited later on, she got to witness his work in transforming ethnic conflict using many of the methods for processing trauma that they had taught him. Eventually, he took the healing process all the way to organizing his own neighborhood to once again incorporate Albanians and Serbs. I'm going to ask the listeners just to take a moment to incorporate that story. Just take a moment, a few breaths, go inside, and a moment of silence. So that is the story. So what did this man do in terms of nonviolent practice and training? First and foremost, he centered himself. He took the time to center himself. He realized that it all starts within each one of us with creating peace with ourselves. Then he took stock of the situation in terms of a larger narrative, the human condition itself. He heard the cries of the world since the beginning of recorded time. His pain was not unique. It was the shared pain of humanity. He took a good long look at what most people work very hard at ignoring. We have a horrific history of violence and unless we change, it will continue. He courageously accepted what is, exactly like Richard Rohr said, he courageously accepted what is but was not indifferent and that's the difference. This recognition opened his heart to universal compassion. He then connected to what he cared for most in the world, his own children. And from that place of infinite love, he asked himself the one question and one question only. How can I, my little self, contribute to leave them a different legacy? And by answering that question within, he made a decision and an intent that the violence would stop in him. He would not give it continuity. That vengeance and the dynamic of an eye for an eye would not take over. He did not transmit his pain. He went ahead and did the required work on himself. He said a huge yes to life and a huge no to hopelessness and inertia. He trusted himself. He became the change he wanted to see in the world. He stepped into the new story and like the Pied Piper brought a whole string of people along with him. It is true, as Richard says somewhere, transform people, become transformers. The rest of the story is as self-evident as the ripples on a lake when you throw a rock into it. The rock was his own journey, his lived experience, his gift to us all in this very moment, 21 years later. So isn't that the one question we all need to be asking ourselves? What kind of world do we want for our children? Isn't it true that deep down, we all want a world of peace and harmony where we can contribute to each other's well-being? And the next question, the obvious question is, where do we start? Where are the tools to support that endeavor? I believe the process of embracing nonviolent, nonviolence at this moment in history is the most important action we can take. Any other concern like status, wealth, success, even health, talents, and so on is secondary and even unimportant 
in the light of nurturing and sacrificing for nonviolence. The root meaning of the word sacrifice is sacred office. Therefore, a return to the sacred is what is called for, sacred in others and in ourselves. The world is now screaming for us to sacrifice our indifference, our us versus them, our wanting to be special and different and chosen, our false security at the expense of other people's lives. In other words, our clinging to the old story of materialism and power over and separation. Something has to give or we will be sacrificed once more and again on the altar of redemptive violence. In his wonderful new book, The Third Harmony, Michael Nagler points out that the new story is nonviolence, and nonviolence needs the new story. They inform and need each other in essential ways. The old story must give way to the new story of compassion and cooperation, of the power of nonviolence. This whole conference is about this. So listen well. Open your hearts to trust in yourselves and the power within you. It is there, there's no question. We just have to pay attention to it, to become participants in a new adventure of consciousness. Yesterday when I was giving the, the training, I mentioned that there is a, a teacher, a Buddhist teacher that keeps saying to concentrate on four words open, heart, wake, and be. Those four words can take us very, very far because what creates this encapsulation where we think, like Richard was saying, that we are separate from the other, that the other is there and we are here, is just this feeling of needing to defend something that doesn't even exist. So if we open our hearts and we wake up and we decide to be, so many things begin to open for us like they did for this man. And the possibilities and the opportunities begin to show themselves to us. We don't even have to look for them. They show themselves to us and the road opens. There is a uh, Juan Manuel Serrat used to sing a song by Antonio Machado, Caminante no hay camino. Se hace camino al andar. And that translates as traveler, there is no road. The road becomes as you walk it. The road opens to you as you walk it. So this is not even a question of effort of any kind. It's a letting go, an opening up, and a living from the heart. So this is what I want to share with you today. And if there are any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Thank you so much, Veronica, uh, for your special presentation. We appreciate you and, and thank you for your wisdom on nonviolent practices. Uh, we do have a question, if you're willing and able. Um, I am able. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, so you have led nonviolence trainings around the world. How have you seen people transformed in the way that you've been describing in your presentation? I think that the most important thing is that something new is presented to people. A possibility is presented to people that wasn't there before. And because I truly believe that in our heart of hearts, we are all good. And in our heart of hearts, we want the good. So people see this possibility, this seed. Not everybody will plant that seed, but some of people will plant that seed and all of a sudden life becomes like a different possibility for ourselves and others. The extraordinary thing that I think nonviolence gives all of us is the capacity to give meaning to our lives and to think in terms not of our own self-interest, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. I believe nonviolence is what all religions talk about. I believe, like Gandhi says, you know, that it is 
one of the most powerful, it is the most powerful thing in the world. Nonviolence not understood as the opposite of violence necessarily, but as an expansion of consciousness where you can really get out of this little shell of the me and the mine and my emotions and my thoughts and my opinions and my everything that Richard was talking about. It's this infinite possibility because, you know, this is the thing. When you go into that other dimension of consciousness, it, everything is limited at this level, at this level. You know, everything is limited, our bodies, our emotions. But at that other level, like the growth is infinite. This is extraordinary thing. And when you understand that, when you truly understand that, the door that opens is so luminous. It is kind of stronger than anything else. So I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Veronica. Um, so Veronica, a couple uh, other questions. So Alex and Roberta wants to know and hear a little more about, you mentioned a book um, that it seems like people are really interested in. Could you share the name of that book and just talk about that briefly? Yeah, it was it the first book where I got this story is because I mentioned two books. The book is Sweet Fruit from the Bitter Tree, 61 Stories of Creative and Compassionate Ways Out of Conflict by Mark Andreas. You can actually download it, a student told me. So it's, it's downloadable. And the other book that I mentioned is The Third Harmony by Michael Nagler. And he talks about precisely this expansion of consciousness that is now the new story. It's like this adventure in consciousness that we're invited to undertake. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for those helpful resources. Okay, so I have a, a, another question um, and I'm gonna um, really zoom in into this because she seems to, this seems to be really important to her. Um, her name is Martina Miller, and she says, I am stuck in the transition. Urgh. I wish I could jump, leap, let go, but it doesn't seem to happen. I want to jump into the, my, a new story, but I'm dragging. I know it's my job to do my work, but do you have any advice or it's a wisdom for this stage that I am in as she's stuck in this transition? I think that's a beautiful, Martina, that's a beautiful question. Thank you so much, because it is the crucial question. You know, nothing is static. Everything keeps moving all the time, but it is our minds that think we are not moving, but it is moving actually. And so the one thing that is required of us is, is this, it's like just to see that this is a transition because we make the transition in our minds kind of permanent you know it's like it's like uh, the stuckedness we start to tell a story about the stuckedness and then it gets more and more stuck as we dig deeper and deeper into the mire but i think here is what faith comes in hope practice 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 don't give up you know like in my zen practice it took me five years before the, the half lotus didn't hurt me, but eventually it stopped hurting. And then the, the posture in Zen became so extraordinarily fluid that I could really feel like the transformation that occurred in my body through meditation, but it took me five years. And so it's patience, it's perseverance, it's not getting stuck in story, it is faith, there are so many elements here because the, the, the promise somehow is that you will get out into, onto the other side and you have to hold that promise in your heart. It's like fight the gravity that says, I can't, I can't, this is too hard. This is impossible. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's something else that you have the soul force in you that has to become active and engaged in the transition. That's what I would say. Thank you so much, uh, Vera, for, for that uh, wisdom sharing. Um, let's see. Um, uh, one, one question, one final question as we transition. You know, you are one of the, um, you know, main teachers of nonviolent practices with Pacha Bene, and you have such a wealth of information and experience in practicing nonviolent practices and helping to 
um, nurture other people into understanding. So if someone is looking for practical things that they can do to embrace nonviolence in their everyday lives, what would be some of the examples that you would, um, or some suggestions that you would give people okay. on moving forward? Yeah, I, I love stories, so I'm gonna tell you another story. Okay. In the neighborhood where I live in Montreal, there is a man who is, he is very mentally deranged and we're all afraid of him because he shouts, he has this way of shouting that is, is really grating and horrible and he goes around the neighborhood shouting. And one day I was going to the park and he was sitting there on the sidewalk and you know, I was talking to my friend, I wasn't thinking, and all of a sudden I looked at him and I said, good afternoon, I said in French, you know? And so he transformed in front of my eyes. It was, I will never forget. He became this beautiful blue eyed human being and he glowed and he said, good afternoon to you. Oh. And so I will never forget it. I, it's, I just tell that story and all of a sudden I realized, my God, I had so many ideas about him. I was so afraid of him. I didn't give him a chance. And so at that moment when I gave him that chance, he transformed, but he transformed me too. You know, like he was so happy that he was seen, not as this crazy kind of shouting, but as a human being, like, because we feel everything from another person. We do, even if we don't mentalize that we feel it, we still feel it. So my greatest advice be kind be kind be courageous just walk in beauty just give life a chance come out of the shell you know like give life a chance because life is there for you waiting for you life is there waiting for you so that's what i want to say oh, thank you so much veronica thank you so much for your time that kindness that infinite love um, that we can embrace uh, in our daily lives. So thank you so much for your time and, and we'll talk to you later, okay? Thank you, kid. For right. your have, have a beautiful day. Thank you. Blessings. Okay. Okay, okay everyone. So we, we continue on the path, the nonviolent journey as we um, continue with the conference. And right now we'll have a uh, a video on the campaign nonviolence actions that are coming up. Um, this is the sixth year of campaign nonviolence where we are working for a um, culture, a new culture of nonviolence free of war, poverty, racism, and environmental destruction. Um, we have a, uh, uh, every year we have organized um, nonviolent actions. Last year we had 3,300 actions. This year, things may look different in the midst of COVID-19. People are still organizing online, are still organizing as it relates to social distances and being very creative as it relates to peace and nonviolence. Um, the week of actions is September 19th through the 27th. Um, and so it's around the same time as the International Day of Peace, which is September 21st. Um, and so I've been organizing and doing outreach for campaign nonviolence for six years now. And one thing that I that I um, that always stays with me every time I talk to a campaign nonviolence organizer, oftentimes this is this peace work is something that you don't just do one day out of the year. It's something like Vero said, Veronica said that you're working to practice in your daily life. So we invite you um, to the campaign nonviolence week of actions. And right now we'll show a video highlighting some of the actions from last year.
All right, hello everyone. Again, campaignnonviolence.org. Uh, please check out the Campaign on Violence Week of Actions. Um, we um, continue to move forward and journey together. So uh, thank you for all who participated over the last six years, and we invite you to visit our website um, and check out more information um, where there's a, a host of variety of resources for organizing action and also for studying nonviolence as well. Okay. So next we'll go into the section nonviolence education and action. And our first special guest is Kazu Haga. Kazu is the founder of East Point Peace Academy and author of Healing Resistance, a radically different response to harm. He teaches various aspects of nonviolence, restorative justice, and mindfulness. Born in Tokyo, Japan, he now works to empower incarcerated communities, young people, and activists around the country. He currently resides in Oakland, California. Welcome, Kazu. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sending me this awesome shirt. Got in the mail the other day. Nice um, shirt. Really, yeah, really great to be here. And uh, also want to thank uh, everyone who's on the call. All almost 500 of us um, from all over the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're calling from. Um, yeah, really honored to be here and, and share some thoughts that I've been having these days and in, in the, just the crazy wild world that we're living in around, um, you know, what nonviolence can look like in these times. And uh, I wanna share a little bit just about my own personal path to where I've kind of arrived at now. Um, some of you may be familiar with my story, but when I was 17 years old, my life was just a broken mess. I had dropped out of high school two years prior to that. Um, there was a lot of uh, just conflict and violence in my home life. And I ended up turning to alcohol and drugs and was just in a really bad place in my life. And luckily for me, at that time, I met a group of Buddhist monastics who were really committed to peace and nonviolence work. And they were organizing a walking pilgrimage, which for them was a spiritual pilgrimage, um, walking from Massachusetts down the eastern coast of the United States to New Orleans. It was a six month walk. And then eventually down the coast of some parts of Africa to retrace the slave route. This was a project called the Interfaith Pilgrimage of the Middle Passage. And part of their understanding was that if we're going to heal racism as it manifests in our world today, then we need to go all the way back and heal its roots. And for the United States, the roots of racism is the genocide of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of African peoples. And all of the, the, like the police shootings and the manifestations of racism white, and white supremacy today is the direct result of what happened all of those centuries ago. And so they were embarking on this walking pilgrimage as a spiritual journey to begin to reconcile and to heal from that legacy. And so my introduction to nonviolence came from a deeply spiritual place. Um, after spending six months on that walking pilgrimage, I ended up spending a year overseas living in their monasteries throughout South Asia, studying Buddhism and studying nonviolence. And then when I came back to the US, I got involved in social change work. And I got involved in nonviolent civil disobedience and became a nonviolence trainer, became very active in the anti-globalization movement of the late 1990s, um, and was heavily involved in social change movements and direct action. And after so many years of being involved in direct action, over the last six or seven years or so, I've taken a break mostly from that world. And part of that was because I felt like in nonviolent direct action work, something is oftentimes missing for me. Um, part of it is seeing a lot of the culture in social change movements turning incredibly toxic and actually becoming traumatizing for a lot of people to be in those spaces. And I've also felt like oftentimes we use so-called nonviolent tactics to leverage power and then we use that power to shove change down the throats of those on the other side. And I don't think that that's how real lasting long term transformation happens. And so over the last seven years or so I've really been focusing a lot more of my time working in prisons doing restorative justice work and trauma healing work. 
And I've learned a lot about what it takes to heal trauma, both from having, doing, having done a lot of trauma healing work for myself and healing a lot of old childhood wounds and, and family wounds, but also in facilitating dialogues between people in prison and the mothers of the person that they killed or people in prison and, and the survivors of their crime. And all of that, the spiritual practice of nonviolence, the direct action, and what I've learned around healing trauma has been converging in the past couple of years under the umbrella of um, something that we at East Point have been calling fierce vulnerability. And I, I wanna share a little bit about fierce vulnerability. Um, and this is a, a presentation I've given a couple of times recently, so I apologize if you've seen it before, but um, every time I do it, I add some new components to it. So hopefully it'll be um, helpful for everyone. So I'm just gonna share my screen here. You should be able to see that. So part of the, the work of fierce vulnerability is this understanding that change is fractal in nature. Fractals, many of us probably know, is a curve or geometric figure, each part of which has the same statistical characteristic as the whole. So no matter how small of a piece of something you zoom into, or how large of a piece you kind of zoom out and, and take a look at, the same pattern repeats itself over and over and over again. Um, and we see examples of fractals all throughout nature, including in the Nautilus seashell, in Romanesco broccoli, in a lot of uh, succulent plants. And I think a lot of people in activist movements and nonviolent movements have also been saying similar things. The interconnectedness of our, our, the small work that we do, I don't wanna call it small, but like the work that we do to heal violence in our own hearts and the work that we do to heal violence in the world. They're fractal. Um, Adrian Marie Brown talked about it a lot in the book, Emergent Strategies. But also people like Mohandas Gandhi talked a lot about the importance of connecting what he called self-purification work to the work that we're doing in the outside world. And so another example that I see of fractals in nature is when we look at how electrons circle the nucleus of its cell. And then we take a step back a little bit more and look at a bigger piece and we look at how a hurricane circles around the, the center of its storm. And then we extrapolate that out even more and we look at how planets rotate around its sun. And then we look out even further and we see how a galaxy cycles around the center of the galaxy. And so no matter how small or how large, we're all governed by the same laws of physics, right? Like no matter at what scale we're looking at it, we're all governed by the same laws. And I believe that the same can be said about harm and about trauma and about healing from harm and trauma. There's a person in my life that we'll call Marie. Um, it's not her real name, but Marie is someone that I deeply care about who has a lot of unhealed trauma in her life. And over many, many years, me and, and friends and family members of hers have spent countless hours and days supporting her through whatever the most recent crisis is in her life. If there's a major crisis going on in her relationship, we'll help her kind of resolve that at least temporarily. And, th and then a few weeks later, there's a new crisis around her relationship with her daughter or a new crisis around her relationship with money or something going on at work. And it's, it's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. Like as, long, as soon as we resolve one issue, the trauma manifests in another issue. And at some point I realized that Marie has some core trauma from her childhood. And until we're able to support her in healing through her core trauma, there's always gonna be new issues that we deal with. And if we take that lesson and extrapolate it out one level, I used to work for a nonprofit organization, and this nonprofit organization was also always constantly going through crisis, whether it's a conflict between the staff and the board or volunteer turnover. And I realized at the, uh, in a similar way that this organization has core trauma. 
that at the time that the organization was founded, the leadership of the organization had some unhealthy patterns of inability to resolve conflict within the organization, a refusal to talk about how racialized trauma is manifesting in the organization. So all of these unhealthy patterns kind of bega became the, the organizational culture and it got adopted as the core trauma of the organization. And so because that trauma was never healed, there was always new issues. And now we extrapolate that out further and we look at this country that I live in called the United States of America and there's never a shortage of issues. There's never a shortage of crises. And I think the same can be said that this country has core trauma that it has never healed from. This is a nation that is built on the genocide of indigenous peoples and the enslavement of African peoples, as I was saying in my, in my intro. And because these are like some of the worst forms of violence that we've ever witnessed as a species, and we've never attempted to heal from that, we're always gonna be playing a game of whack-a-mole. Like we can abolish policing, but until our country deals with like the, the foundation of the violence of this nation, that is always gonna be manifesting in some other issue. And if you talk to a lot of psychologists who work with trauma, they'll tell you that things like separation, othering, isolation, this is oftentimes what is at the core of trauma. That, like it's that sense of feeling like I'm alone, I don't belong. I'm not part of community that is at the core of so much of the trauma. And so no matter how large or how, how small the scale, I think trauma works the same way. And so I think one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is how is trauma manifesting on a collective level in this nation throughout the world? And what does trauma healing at scale look like? So I want to talk a little bit more about the science of trauma. Um, this is a, 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 like a, a short diagram of what our brain looks like. And there's a part of our brain called the higher cortex or the neocortex. It's the newest part of our brain to develop in the history of evolution. And the neocortex is where all of our logical thinking happens. It's where our creativity happens. It's where we're able to think about things like philosophy, art, long-term consequences, logic, all of that happens in the neocortex. And what happens when our traumas are triggered is neurologically, our neocortex actually gets disengaged and we no longer have access to the part of our brain that is responsible for things like creativity and logic and consequences. And we start operating from the less developed parts of our brain that is responsible for things like emotion and survival, right? When our trauma is triggered, we enter our fight or flight response. So strong emotions are triggered, right? People with a lot of unhealed trauma, they have oftentimes show very short tempers. They go from having like a perfectly great day to screaming at someone in a, in a split second. And that's the result of long-term trauma. And I see that happening collectively, right? Like very strong emotions are being triggered on both sides of the aisle on every single issue. When trauma is triggered, our fight or flight mentality kicks in and everything becomes black and white. Father uh, Rohr was just talking about the importance of non-dualistic thinking. That becomes very difficult when our trauma is triggered. Because when we enter our survival instincts, we don't have time to think about nuance, right? Like if, if we're like, if our body is thinking only about survival, we don't have time to think about nuance. All we have the time for is to see something and determine immediately if that's a threat that's trying to kill us or if that's something that can protect us from, from dying, right? So everything becomes black and white. You're either with us or you're against us. And that polarized black or white thinking is something I'm seeing a lot in activist circles these days. Again, logic and our ability to think long-term, like that goes out the window 
because the part of our brain that is responsible for that is disengaged. And I see that a lot in, in activist movements today where, you know, on, on the one hand, I'm so inspired by the activists in Portland that are out there every single night. And at the same time, I've read some articles recently suggesting that the focus of the movement has now turned to kicking federal troops out of Portland when the, the issue is really about holding local police departments accountable for the violence. And I also saw that happen in Occupy, where the Occupy Wall Street movement began as a movement for economic justice, but at some point it felt like it became a movement about city camping ordinances, right? So like we see the threat that's immediately in front of us and that's all we can think about. The long-term strategy that goes out the window when our trauma is triggered and also hypervigilance. We start seeing danger and threat everywhere. And that's something that I also see a lot in activist movements with constant accusations of infiltration, suggesting that violence and Nazis and, and all these things are everywhere. And that actually doesn't help heal our trauma. Hypervigilance actually um, perpetuates trauma. And finally, environmental cues can become very difficult to interpret. Like, like we, it becomes very hard to take in new information. And this is happening on both sides of the aisle, right? Like I think Donald Trump is an incredibly traumatized person and his trauma is pouring out at the national level. And so I think that is waking up the trauma of all of his supporters. And then on the left, because we're constantly facing police violence and, and talking about historical trauma, our trauma is being triggered. So what we see in the streets is just trauma meeting trauma. And that is not a situation that's conducive to healing. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. And this is a, a chart that I think a lot of folks that are involved in nonviolence are familiar with. But we teach that the more violence escalates, the more our responses to violence has to escalate with it. So if the, the, the conflict is, is not that intense, on an interpersonal level, you can tell someone, just take a deep breath, everything's gonna be fine. And on a social level, if the conflict isn't that escalated, you might fill out a petition. Like if you need a, a stop sign installed at an intersection, a petition might be a great tactic for that. But as the violence escalates, our response also has to escalate with it. So on an interpersonal level, you may actually have to get in between two people and separate them a fireman have to break down a door to get into a house. The United Nations, this may not be purely nonviolent, but oftentimes sends armed forces to separate two parties from and stopping them from killing each other because the violence is so escalated. And on a movement level, we may need to occupy highways because the level of violence that we're responding to is so escalated. But one of the things that I've noticed is that as our nonviolent responses as our tactics escalate, the polarization also tends to escalate with it. The more we escalate our tactics, the more things tend to be black and white and we become the good guys and they become the bad guys. And that division, that separation, that polarization as I was sharing earlier, is at the heart of so much of the violence and destruction of this world. This is an image of an escalated response to an escalated harm. And I wanna invite everyone just to look at this image and feel into your body. What happens to your body when you look at this image? When we scale down and look at an escalated response to an escalated harm on an interpersonal level, the analogy to this image may look something like this. Very polarized, two people screaming at each other. And at the same time, I want us to look at this image, a very well-known image. And I want us to look at this image and feel into our bodies. Like what happens in your body when you see this image? It's also an escalated response to an escalated harm, right? But to me, this image invokes a different spirit. And the analogy on an interpersonal level may look something like this. 
This is a dialogue that is happening between the man on the left, Donald Lacey, who lost his, his daughter to, to homicide, and the man on the right, who is incarcerated for having killed his daughter. And they're coming together in a dialogue to try to heal that wound. And so a lot of the work of fierce vulnerability is about asking the question, how do we escalate our tactics and tactically shut down highways, occupy government buildings, but double down on relationship and actually move with the spirit of opening up. A lot of activist movements today have the message of shut it down. And we may need to shut down like tactically a highway, but how do we move with the spirit of opening up the possibility of healing? And so I just wanna spend the last few minutes talking about if trauma is fractal, then healing also has to be fractal. And what could that look like? Um, this is a picture of another organization that I'm a part of called the Ahimsa Collective. We do a lot of restorative justice work in the prisons. Um, and again, it's, it's through the Ahimsa Collective that I've done these healing dialogues between incarcerated people and the, and the survivors of their crime. Um, we hold um, groups where we meet with a certain group of people for 16 months, two years, healing through their trauma and understanding how their trauma led to the decisions that they made to harm other people. And one of the things that I've learned a lot about is the importance of shame. There's a beautiful quote from Brene Brown who says that shame derives its power from being unspoken. And that when we're able to speak directly to the things that we are ashamed of, that is incredibly liberating. And it, it, it leads to healing. And what are the things that this country, this world should be ashamed of? I, I, I want to propose that this country, the United States, and I, I know that there's people from other parts of the world, but the United States should be ashamed of the legacy of slavery and indigenous genocide. We should be ashamed of what is happening at the US-Mexico border. We should be ashamed of how we treat our houseless population. And we need to somehow create a space that is safe enough for this country to speak directly to those issues. I've learned a lot about the importance of intention, that in these healing dialogues, if the intention of the both sides that are coming to that dialogue is not pure, then we don't invite them into that dialogue. Oftentimes we spend two years working with both sides individually before we bring the two sides together. And so I think we need to do a lot of our own healing on both sides before we can actually come to the table. And part of what that means for activist movements is if we want to shut down a highway, what is our intention? Is our intention vengeance? Is our intention because we wanna beat those other guys over there? And if that's our intention, perhaps we're not ready to engage in healing work. If healing is, our, is indeed our goal. I've also learned a lot about the importance of vulnerability, right? That once vulnerability is introduced into the, into the equation, the possibility of healing that opens up is grand. Also the importance of rage in a lot of activist movements today and a lot of nonviolent communities, I see a lot of people judging people for being upset and for that rage pouring into the streets when particularly from communities who have been oppressed for 500 years, they have every right to want to burn down the entire system. And for me, I just want us to be intentional about what it is that we're trying to do in each space that we're organizing. I think we need to create spaces for rage to be honored, but to me, expressing blind rage in a demonstration where we might get pepper sprayed in tear gas is, the, is not the, the most conducive place for healing. And so I think what we need to do is to create spaces that's explicitly for expressing people's rage and grief so that we can let that, that inferno of rage burn down and settle into a charcoal. And that charcoal is what we take into the streets. And finally, the importance of modeling. When I'm facilitating groups, if I'm able to model my own vulnerability, then that creates space for other people to model theirs. 
So in movements, instead of our message being F the police and you are wrong and we're right and we're here to, to overpower you, what if our message was, if we're talking about climate, what if our message isn't like fossil fuel companies are evil, but what if our message is, I am witnessing the destruction of this planet and it is breaking my heart and I am fearful for the future of my children. And so we need to be doing our own work so that we can model that and lead with that as, as our message. So when I use the words fierce vulnerability, it's an acknowledgement that because the, the, the scale of violence is so escalated in our society today, that we need escalated forms of direct action but how do we do it in a way that is healing? Like, how do we look at nonviolent direct action as a modality for collective trauma healing? And just the, I'm gonna skip a couple of things. The, the last thing that I, I just wanna share is as we think about, you know, how we prepare, when we think about nonviolence trainings, we typically think of the, like the traditional tactical, like how do we de-escalate people? How do we shut down a highway? What are our legal rights? How do we do jail support? But I wanna propose that in addition to all of those things, we need to introduce things like long-term trauma healing and short-term emotional regulation tools into our nonviolence training so that when we're in the front lines and all of the chaos is surrounding us, right? Tear gas, people screaming, police armed in riot gear, that we don't become triggered and lose sight of our own values. And so I, I think that, you know, there was a, a beautiful question asked earlier about, um, you know, what do we need to do to prepare for possible violence in November? And I think part of that is what are we doing to prepare ourselves so that like we can't, there's a way in which we can't control what happens out there in the world, right? All we can control is how we show up in the world. And so I think a lot of the work that we need to do is to ask ourselves of what are the ways in which, you know, and Father Roar talked about this too, what are the ways in which our heart is carrying violence and, and unhealed trauma and how do we heal from that? Thank so you so much, Kazu. Time for yeah. a and a, in, a, in a few minutes after Henry shares, so. We'll yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kazu, this um, important work and conversation around fierce vulnerability, trauma healing, um, you know, it's, a, it's an important conversation for us personally as well as communally. So thank you for, for, for sharing. And the questions are already coming in. So we're going to uh, table them for right after Henry. And then uh, Eric will come on and, and we'll have a question and answer in just a few minutes, okay? All right. Thank you so much, Kazu. We really appreciate you. Okay, everyone, so we'll be coming back to question and answer with Kazu in, in just a bit. Um, but before that, uh, we have Henry here with us. Uh, Henry Cervantes is the Program Manager of Peace Exchange. He is also an artist, educator, and organizer who focuses on nonviolence and restorative justice in prisons with young people and more. He has trained activists from Asia, the Middle East, Central, and South America. Thank you so much, Henry, for being here. Welcome to the conference. Thanks, everyone. Um, very happy to be here. Special thanks to Campaign Nonviolence and work in Chicago. Could you all hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you Great. now. Awesome. So again, I'm very excited to share about our work here in Chicago. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of slides um, and uh, to talk a little bit about our work. And then I'll say next for, for the next slide. So again, I work for an organization called the Peace Exchange, and we're located in the North Lawndale community on the west side of Chicago. And the presentation today is talk a little bit about this nonviolent shift and the work that we're doing in the city of Chicago, particularly in schools and in the jails and in the prisons. Next. Uh, part of what we do with the Peace Exchange is work with young people. Um, and every year we work with a different cohort um, and they go through three phases. Uh, the first phase that we engage young people in from the community is in training. 
And so our youth program, every year we work with a cohort from young people, African-American and Latinos from the neighborhood to share a little bit about, to learn about the roots of violence, but also what things are being done to uh, promote peace and nonviolence in our city. Um, so over here in the top photographs, you see our peace builders learning how to do uh, gunshot uh, first aid trainings. Uh, in the bottom photograph, uh, we, we, it's a, you see here there's a training by former uh, gang members kind of training our young people and understanding you know, why young people go into violence. Uh, next. Um, the second phase um, that our young people go through is international travel. We've been doing this for the last eight years. Uh, and every year, uh, these young people that we recruit from the communities with the help of partner organizations, is we give them the opportunity they wouldn't otherwise have, which is travel to meet with other activists in other parts of the world. So some of the photographs that you see here, we've taken young people from the community uh, to places like Thailand and Burma, uh, Nicaragua, South Africa, India, and most recently we traveled to Rwanda. Now the reason we take young people from the community internationally is to connect with other activists and to learn um, what campaigns and nonviolence have worked abroad and what we can learn from that and bring that back to Chicago. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you each of our trips is documented. You can see, uh, you know, we, we, with the help of our, one of our partners, Free Spirit Media, uh, we kind of document the experiences of our young people and what they've learned abroad. And we create these documentaries. So each one of our delegations, uh, we produce a documentary, then we come back to Chicago and share lessons learned. So um, I'm gonna show you a clip of our most recent documentary of our young people traveling to Rwanda last year, 2019. Um, and we traveled to Rwanda for the 25th anniversary of the genocide against the Tutsi people, and particularly about how the country is rebuilding and the role of forgiveness, the role of healing. So I'm gonna show a clip from the documentary and then we'll come back. Next. A lot of people, when they hear Rwanda, they hear genocide. But that's something that happened and is no longer happening. Decades of tension between Hutu and Tutsi, fueled by hate-filled propaganda, erupted in April 1994. Organized and led by the extremist Hutu-controlled government, well-armed gangs began systematically killing Tutsi and moderate Hutu men, women, and children. A million people were killed in 100 days. Neighbors slaughtered neighbors. Friends murdered friends. The genocide ended on July 4th, 1994, when forces from the Rwanda Patriotic Front liberated the capital city of Kigali. 25 years later, the people of Rwanda continue to heal and reconcile. Mass graves and genocide memorials, some containing the remains of thousands of victims, provide a stark reminder of this terrible period. You hear about what happened and you hear facts and statistics, it doesn't really hit you until you're really there and you see the names of people and the ages and how they were killed. And it really, it really gets to you. I think the people of Rwanda have opened up a window for us to really understand what does it mean for a people to fully embrace their history, not ignore it, not say it didn't happen, but to learn from it. For young people in the United States right now, it's a historical moment for us. I think we live in a world where we see a lot of violence. And I think what's important for us is to figure out how can we come back, how can we rebuild, how can we empower and take charge of our own communities.
bubonera ahantu busho gufatira abantu mu kintu imyaka myinshi baracyumvise ko umututsi ari mubi urumva harimo yanda akwakaza n'ubujiji aho bwira umuntu kwica mu yenzi we akumva ko ari ibintu byibikinisho ko nta kibazo kubera ko datekereza ese uwe na se umuntu wange were you suffering from from tutu that's in the newspaper as well a genocide is preventable violence is preventable and this is the right time that people should think of a world free of violence and and discriminations and i've listened to to the people that regret having participated in the genocide i've listened to the people who survived the genocide i did as well and then i get to somehow understand the person like how the person has gone from being a human being with with, with values of uh, you know that he's supposed to be or she's supposed to be having and turn into a killer but i've listened to the people as well who have gone from being that killer and restore the spirit of humanity and come back to normal so it's a practice that is daily that has challenges that are very enormous but i do it with um with an open heart. I think for our peace builders, we're gonna have a different understanding of what it means to be trauma informed. What does it mean to reconcile, knowing that awful things have happened. Th this idea of forgiveness. I've never thought about forgiveness the way I, I think about it now, being here in Rwanda. I think the people that live on these hills have been through a lot and I don't know how on earth can people walk and still be able to look at each other as fellow human beings. That idea is completely alien to me. But another thing too that I've learned from the people of Rwanda is that forgiveness is not a destination. It's not something that you do or just arrive at. It's a process. And it's something that you work on every day. And I think for us in Chicago, we have a lot to learn about what it means to forgive, uh, what it means to reconcile. It's a big journey. It's a big journey for people to forgive. There are some people who can't understand why they did that, who lost almost every member of their families, who still have that pain on their heart. So it's not easy for them to forgive. But when you come to a time to realize that uh, forgiving will give yourself to be at ease, at peace, uh, you just forgive. The first step to forgive is to, to accept what has happened. What's done is done. And then you have to work on yourself to how to go through it in a positive way living life the best way you can and just appreciating life for what it is. Forgiveness plays a role in that because once you forgive somebody, you're like basically starting your route to healing yourself. And once you heal, then you can appreciate life a lot more and not walk around with hatred in your heart for somebody else. You can appreciate life and love others. <laughs> I was a very depressed woman with no hope, not wanting to live, but after I forgive, I felt like, you know, I want to live again. On the afternoon of our fourth day in Rwanda, we visited Gweru, one of six reconciliation villages where genocide survivors and perpetrators live alongside one another. It was there that we met Maria, a 61-year-old survivor, and Philbert, a 44-year-old man who as a 19-year-old killed Maria's husband and three of her children. At the Reconciliation Village, I had a lot of conflicting feelings. Like, I didn't know whether to feel angry and like mad, but then I, I didn't know whether to feel like at peace with myself and like at peace with them. 
But at the same time, I wanted to feel like, okay, let me just be here in the moment and really understand their testimonies from both the victim and the perpetrator. Sometimes it's best to just be there and just to hear. Great, thank you. Um, again, this is just a, a short video clip of our documentary. Uh, and we have one of these for every trip uh, when we were in South Africa learning about the anti-apartheid movement campaigns, uh, when we were in India learning about the Ahimsa campaigns, uh, but in Rwanda, this particular message of reconciliation and how do you build a community, all of our peace builders come back to Chicago and their task is to go out into the neighborhoods and reach young people in their communi immediate communities. Um, all of you have probably heard about our city and the violence that often dominates the headlines. And so part of our work is going out into the neighborhoods and introducing this idea uh, of nonviolence, reconciliation, and forgiveness. So these are our peace builders sharing their stories in their schools and in their neighborhoods. Next. Uh, just to give you an idea of where our young people are from, uh, since the beginning, since we've been doing this work uh, with the young people, uh, here is a map of the neighborhoods with the most concentrated forms of violence. This is particularly when it comes to gun violence, which is the tip of the iceberg in the city, uh, and where they are in terms of, you know, where they live and where they do their work. So we're really grounded in the community. Next. Um, and this has kind of led us to also rethink how we do outreach. So, um, Using the documentary film, we've also built this uh, four module peace education program. It's kind of like nonviolence training, but very elementary. So we, we, we introduced this to elementary school age kids in the community. Uh, and so since 2017, we've trained uh, over 5,000 children, grades fifth through eighth in, in nonviolence. So teaching peace with the help of our peace builders to go into the neighborhoods, and um, it's amazing to me how this idea of peace is so new to people and nonviolence. Next. Uh, part of our work as well in the city um, is, is working with the incarcerated community. So here's a photograph of, of, a, of, a, of, of our nonviolence training sessions that take place at the Cook County Jail. Um, and particularly, you know, we're working with a particular demographic in this division. Uh, these are young men from the community who are detained for, uh, they're being accused of committing violent crimes in their own communities. So we, we're introducing the, 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 the principles of nonviolence, but also the stories um, and having conversations with these young men. Next. Um, and I have to say this, and I, I always tell this to, to, to educators and people on the ground, some of the most profound conversations that I've had around nonviolent and social change has occurred behind the wall uh, with young people who are incarcerated. Um, I, have the, I have the permission to show these images. Um, and so, you know, this uh, on the left, you see a, a young man, this is Devante from the North Lawndale community. He's been incarcerated four times. Uh, he's young, he's a young man. And um, during one of, the, one of our trainings, uh, we talked about, you know, what does it take for a person to renounce violence? And if we're willing to step up and go back into the communities and be voices for peace. And he told me that, he said, um, he said, yes and no. He said, yes, it's the right thing to do, but no, because he said that takes a lot of courage, you know, to be able to do that. He said, yeah, I get it, you know, but it's kind of like, that's only for, you really got to know what you're doing. So um, this is Devante. And then on the top side, we have Tiberius. He's from the Englewood neighborhood, one of our brightest students. Um, and talking about, you know, oftentimes in, in communities in Chicago, we kind of think of them as negative. Uh, communities like Englewood or, or my community, like Little Village. But these young men always speak highly of their neighborhoods, that they're beautiful places that they're wonderful communities, and that sometimes the, the shadow of violence kind of gives it, um, it gives the neighborhood, 
the neighborhood a bad rep. And so oftentimes these guys, uh, these young men are trapped in cycles of violence and are responding to greater things that are going on in their everyday lives. Next. Um, and the, the last couple of slides that I'll share here is about our work at Stateville Correctional Center. Uh, for the past year, uh, I've been doing some trainings uh, as part of North Park's uh, 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 seminary, um, working with young incarcerated, well, actually, uh, these guys are already serving their, their sentences for, for violent crimes, and we're introducing this idea of conflict transformation and nonviolent communication at Stateville. So a lot of our students here have been incarcerated for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and they come from our neighborhoods, same communities, Englewood, Little Village, Back of the Yards, et cetera. Next. Uh, here's a photograph of, of some of our students in, in the workshops and in our programs. Um, and I want to give credit for these beautiful photographs. Uh, these were taken by a gentleman named Carl Clifton Sordestrom. Uh, and, and him and, and the incarcerated man, we have their permission to use these photos to share with you. So um, this is uh, you know, one, of our, one of our first days in workshops. Next. Uh, and this cohort uh, you know, of, of students, these are master level students, so they're earning a master's degree. In, uh, and part of their requirements is to learn about nonviolent conflict. Uh, and like I've said earlier, it's, it's, it's a fascinating uh, difference from working with the younger guys at the county jail to the guys in the prison. Um, and really, you know, the discussions that we have around, you know, they don't talk necessarily about their particular crimes, but it always goes back to this idea of, you know, having the courage to, to, to be nonviolent in a violent environment like the prison, like the jail, or in the community. Next. Uh, here's a, a photograph on the left side. Um, I have the, the permission to share these photographs. Um, on the left side, you see two young men, uh, an African-American gentleman and, and a Latino gentleman. So we have, um, these guys are from, you know, one is from Englewood, one is from Back of the Yards. And, you know, one of the things that they always say when they write their essays and their projects, um, you know, one of the things that they, they, they created is, you know, we present material, we present content, but then we ask them to create their own content. What are their own ideas? How do you resolve a conflict on the deck? How do you resolve a conflict in the yard? How do you resolve a conflict with your cellmate? And some of the best ideas of nonviolent um, strategy to, to de-escalate and resolve an issue peacefully have come uh, fr from, these, from these young men. Um, and so on the bottom right, you see a photograph. Um, uh, that's uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Clifton Sorderstrom. And you know, we have a, a lot of fun uh, building community and teaching nonviolence in the prison environment. So I thank her a lot for, for opening those doors and introducing us uh, to this particular community. Um, I've learned so much from these young men when it comes to the idea of peace. And they really challenged me to think about, you know, how do we change the narrative of our communities? Um, and how do we get these young men to go back into the communities once they're out to promote peace and nonviolence? And uh, I can't wait till these guys are back out in the neighborhood to, to, for them to carry on the work uh, because I know that they're ready and, 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 and they're just, they have a deep passion for building uh, what we call the beloved community. So I think that's it for the slides. I don't think there's any more. Thank you. Thank yeah, you no so problem. much. And it's all good. Yeah, we're right, right on time, but um, such beautiful, beautiful work that, that you're doing. Um, with the peace exchange, you know, the, just the words that kept coming up, and even for me, forgiveness, reconciliation, peace, and building community. Um, really, really beautiful work, and I look forward to reading even more about the work that you all are doing as an example uh, for our whole country uh, or for the world. So thank you so much. 
Um, right now, I know there are questions already coming in, but I'm going to introduce Eric Stoner, who will facilitate questions and answers um, um, for Kazu as well as Henry. So they'll be in conversation um, and also answering your questions. So if you have any questions, um, please do go ahead and hit the or touch the question and answer uh, Q&A button um, and we'll spend the next few minutes um, journeying with Henry, um, Eric, and Kazu. So Eric Stoner. Eric is the co-founding editor of Waging Nonviolence and an adjunct professor at Rutgers University. His articles have appeared in The Guardian, Mother Jones, Salon, The Nation, Sojourners, and In These Times. Both Henry and Kazu have written for Waging Nonviolence, and Eric, we're excited for, we're so excited for you to be here um, to share and to facilitate the question and answer with Kazu and Henry. Welcome, welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here and I was excited to just be able to have a conversation with uh, two of my favorite people. Um, so yeah, uh, I thought I would start off with just asking, you both share um, uh, a pretty unique experience, right, in uh, teaching nonviolence inside prisons, you know, often to uh, folks who are, have been, you know, both the perpetrators and, and victims of violence in a lot of ways. And I was just wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, how this experience has really influenced your thinking on the possibility or necessity of kind of building a world without prisons and policing. Um, how has that shaped your, your thinking on, on that question, which is so dominant right now? For, for both of you, if you have thoughts on that. I can go first. Uh, uh, yeah, I imagine we both have a lot to say on that because working in, in with incarcerated communities is, is, to be honest, it's it's such a privilege um, that I get to, and, and you know, I know Henry has the same experience, right? Like I get to work with people who have committed some of the grossest forms of violence you can imagine that have now transformed and become the, the greatest peacemakers I've ever met. Like people who are more committed to peace and nonviolence than, than anyone I know. And so every day, I mean, unfortunately, because of COVID, I haven't seen these guys in months, but like, I get to witness that depth of healing and transformation, which gives me so much faith in our resilience as a species, like what we're capable of healing from and bouncing back from. One of our incarcerated nonviolence trainers in Soledad prison one day um, after the workshop that he helped to lead, told me that one of the men that was participating in that workshop on nonviolence and conflict reconciliation was the man that murdered his best friend. And the trainer, Chris, is currently serving a life sentence for a retaliation murder because of that. And now they're close friends and he's teaching him about nonviolence. And you see stories like that and it just, it renews your faith in, in our ability to, to heal through anything. And so, yeah, it's, it's ironically in prison that I've learned about the possibility of a world without prisons. Henry, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the things that I've learned a lot from these young men, I'll, I'll share the story about uh, one particular young man from, from the South side of Chicago. Um, we talked about uh, like structural violence and then grassroots violence. And he talked about his experience of joining uh, a street organization uh, and becoming uh, sucked into the culture. And he said that unconsciously, he figured this out while he was in prison, um, that as a kid, he was conditioned to retaliate in his own community, to, to, to basically commit violence uh, to his own people. Um, and so that was, that was very powerful. Um, and a lot of what they, what, what they share now is, you know, how do we get young people to really think about how they're contributing to the community as opposed to taking away from the community? Um, and so, you know, it comes out a lot in, in the essays and particularly in the discussions. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, these young men have uh, experienced a lot of trauma in their lives. And they're just responding naturally to what has occurred to them. Uh, and, and part of our work in, in education and in training 
is to get them to really wrestle with those ideas of how do you confront trauma and confront suffering in a way that is beneficial, uh, you know? And uh, oftentimes this is such a new idea. Um, you know, I saw in one of the comments or in one of the, the, the questions here about, you know, how people respond to these messages. Cause I know in a prison, a prison is still a prison. It's a very violent environment. And so sometimes we have to be careful about the words that we use, um, you know, and not putting anybody on edge. So I've learned a lot, of, a, a, a lot as a trainer as well, in terms of, you know, how can we talk about peace in a way, <laughs> in a way that doesn't threaten anybody. So, you know, it's, it's been fascinating. So that's what I'll share. Great. Um, Kazu, a question came in for you from, from Sherry Morin, and she asked, can you say a bit more about how you work through rage before going out into the streets? You know, are there exercises or other things that you do to try to prepare uh, and for those intense situations like you were describing in your presentation. Yeah, hi, Sherry, first of all. Um, can't see your face, but good to, to see your name. Yeah, I mean, I think with both shame and grief, like uh, I, the practices that I found helpful are things like meditation and somatics practice. Oftentimes, hard emotions manifest in the body. Right. So like learning to, to feel into our body and to get out of our heads. I know that oftentimes when I feel really strong emotions, because those emotions are so difficult to feel, I like cut off right here and I go into my head and start thinking about stories and narratives. And and that's actually doesn't help us like really feel into it. Um, and I also think that, you know, it's hard to do that kind of deep work if you're only doing it right before a demonstration. And so I think all of us need to commit to long-term processes of feeling into our rage. And sometimes the rage isn't just about the murder of George Floyd, but we have some like frozen rage around an experience that we went through in childhood that has never really felt been expressed. And until we're able to express that, it's actually hard for us to express the rage that we're feeling from things that we're experiencing today. And so as much as we can commit ourselves to long-term healing, whether it's through talk therapy or joining groups or going to transformative retreats, um, the more we can do that work, I think the easier it becomes to access those hard emotions. Thanks, Kazu. Um, uh, Henry uh, had a question about, you know, I was interested to see the map of where your peace builders are from in Chicago and kind of how that overlaps with some of the neighborhoods that experience a lot of gun violence and that kind of thing. And I was just wondering to, if, if you uh, were seeing kind of the culture begin to shift or any signs of kind of hope in those uh, neighborhoods kind of potentially as a result from kind of teaching people nonviolence and preparing them with um, you know, the, the skills to, to address conflict kind of on their own, you know, without turning to, to the state or police. And uh, yeah, any stories about how, how you see the impact of, of uh, this program of yours in those, in those neighborhoods? Sure. Uh, what, one of the things that I've learned in my, in, my, uh, in my time as an activist and as an educator is, um, that we have to support our young people and provide them with as many opportunities as we can so they can they can grow and 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 and, and come back to the neighborhood uh, oftentimes particularly you know i live in a little village you know in, in immigrant mexican community and sometimes people see it as we, you've made it when you've left you know you've you, you know you you've you moved up um and you know how do we support young people so that they they don't forget about their roots and, and, and their hoods and their communities. Um, and so part of our work is to support that, support young people uh, to become uh, the voices of, of their generation. Um, and so, you know, that's why we're very mindful of how we recruit young people, uh, you know, make sure that they're from the neighborhoods and, 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 and give them these, these opportunities so that they can share their message of peace in their own way. Um, and this is why we document those trips. This is why we document their voices um, because they, they have great power. They're the biggest influencers are in our neighborhood, you know? Uh, 
whether it's in the community or in the jail, it's, it's young people who set the trends. It's young people who lead movements. And so how can we support them? How do we get their backs? Um, and another thing I will say to Eric is when we work with a young man in the prisons and in the county jail, sometimes they get caught up in conflicts that can be easily resolved. Sometimes they can get in conflicts with, sometimes, you know, somebody may commit a crime because of that short temper of that unaddressed trauma. And then now they've caught a, a long sentence. So this is why we're very uh, intentional in promoting skill building around conflict resolution, because we don't want our young people to get locked up over losing their temper and snapping at somebody, pulling a gun on somebody. You know what I'm saying? So, or a domestic battery, et cetera. So, yeah. Thanks, Henry. Um, Kazu, I, I was wondering, um, you know, if you had uh, thoughts on are there, if there are kind of particular groups or, or movements that you're seeing today that are already modeling kind of a trauma-informed direct action like you're advocating for, or have there been examples in recent months from the protests, you know, following the pandemic or um, the, the George Floyd protests where you've seen really inspiring examples of, of the kind of thing that you would like to see more of? Yeah, bits and pieces of it. Um, I'll just give a shameless plug for a project that I've been involved in helping to build called the Yet to Be Named Network, which is where a lot of the, the things that I shared is being put into practice. It's a national network of decentralized direct action teams meeting at the intersection of climate justice and racial healing. Um, I've also seen, you know, a lot more awareness around things like somatics and trauma healing, but they don't always intersect with people doing direct action work. Um, and to the extent that they do, it's like we need to do our trauma healing work over here so that we can engage in direct action work over here. And part of what I want to explore is, as I shared in my, in my presentation, like, what could direct action look like if we actually view direct action as a modality of collective trauma healing? Um, so that's something that I hope to explore more and more as we, as we develop the network. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Henry, there's a question, a really interesting question that came in for you from uh, Mary Danhauer. Um, she asks, you know, in your work in the prisons, uh, ha have you found that any, there are any kind of correctional officers that have been moved to nonviolence or impacted by the witness uh, of your students? Um, uh, I'm going to say that uh, particularly in the tougher divisions, um, it's very rough. It's very rough because I, I work with, with uh, in a particular division where it's, it's maximum security, my students are caught while they're, they're in class because they're perceived as a danger to themselves, to their, to their fellow inmates, and to the corrections officers. So it's a very rough environment. Um, have I, uh, when we do trainings, I'm very careful about the language I use because I can't talk too much about social justice and social change. <laughs> I don't want to get kicked out, but I will say that, uh, the, 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 the officers are listening and I, and I can tell that it's educate when I'm educating, when we're exploring nonviolence on the deck or in the tier outside of their cells, we're, we're educating the tier because the guards are listening and the other inmates are listening. So amidst all that chaos, um, I can tell, you can hear a pin drop sometimes in the workshops. And that's very rare for a prison deck to hear a pin drop. So yes. Henry, would you want to say real quickly anything? I know um, in uh, one of the articles you, you wrote for us, you mentioned that you've actually had a couple of your students have passed away from uh, COVID who, uh, I know the Cook County jail system has become a real hotspot of that. And I don't know if you just wanted to say anything about that or about those students in particular that you'd want to just mention. Yeah, uh, I'll just say this because I know we're short on time, but um, I wrote an essay about this in uh, uh, Waging Nonviolence about the impact COVID-19 has had incarcerated communities, particularly black and brown people. And so I invite everyone to take a look at that. Um, you know, and, and, and really kind of, we cannot forget about incarcerated people 
uh, you know, they're not disposable people. They're our greatest allies in the communities if we really want to advance peace and justice. So that's what I'll say. And we can share a link with folks. Uh, it's a story in waging nonviolence. So thanks, Eric. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Kazu, for sharing your experiences, uh, practical tools and resources for everyone watching. We really appreciate you and blessings with the continued good work that you're doing. We thank God for you. Okay, so everyone that um, is listening in, make sure in the chat box, we've put resource links for each organization represented here. So Peace Exchange, East Point Peace Academy, Waging Nonviolence, Please do uh, read further, and if you have any questions, further questions for the panelists, um, you can find their information on their websites, okay? So right now, we will watch a video about Pacha Bene trainings and speakers, um, where there are online resources, as well as practical tools for your organizations and communities. The Pacha Bene video. Thank you, Ryan. Right now, we will continue with nonviolent education and action. Our next guest is Robin Wildman. Robin is the director of Nonviolent Schools Rhode Island, a nonprofit where there are trainings of teachers, school staff, and administrators in Kingian nonviolence. Robin, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be a presenter at the Campaign Nonviolence National Conference. As we observe the 75th anniversary of the United States bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I reflect on what has changed since then 
and what I can do to not only embrace the nonviolent shift, but to integrate nonviolence into everyday life. In 1967, just one year before his assassination, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote the book entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? If you were asked to describe the state of our country today, which descriptor would you choose? Chaos or community? I suspect that many of you would say, of course we're in chaos. We're being attacked by a life-threatening virus, racism, a climate in peril, po poverty. Yep, we're in complete and utter chaos. But I offer you an alternative outlook today, one that fills me with hope and perhaps will change your view of the state of humankind and our planet. During this conference, you will hear about the spectacular nonviolence work that each presenter will share with you. Collectively, we can shift the conscious minds of all who inhabit this planet, starting with people like you who are tuning into this conference to learn more about the study and practice of nonviolence. I'm a recently retired public school teacher having taught in one Rhode Island suburban district for 28 years. Throughout my career, I was introduced to numerous programs that purported to improve students' social-emotional health and address conflicts. Peer mediation and anti-bullying are two that come to mind. What always surprised me was the gusto with which school districts train their teachers hoping they would go back to their classrooms and teach students all that they learned with the end result being a miraculous reduction in conflicts amongst students. Several problems emerged. As the programs came and went, I began to see that these efforts lacked buy-in from teachers and students, lacked sustainability, and lacked a change in the hearts and minds of those who were supposed to benefit from the programs. What we were left with were the same conflicts repeating themselves year after year. In the winter of 2001, about 10 years into my teaching career, I met someone who would change the way I viewed myself as an educator and a human being. Dr. Bernard Lafayette Jr., a freedom rider and strategist who worked closely with Dr. King, came to my classroom to talk to my fifth graders and me about his work during the American Civil Rights Movements of the 1960s. He visited with us regularly for several months, and our relationship with him culminated in a five-day civil rights tour to Alabama and Georgia, which included 20 students and their parents and a lot of fundraising. Bernard informed us that he was with Dr. King on the day he was assassinated, and Dr. King told him, Bernard, we must institutionalize and internationalize nonviolence. Since that day, Bernard has dedicated himself to what he calls his marching orders from Dr. King. Along with David Jensen, they wrote a Kingian nonviolence curriculum, which they gleaned from the work Bernard did with Dr. King. Could you please show slide one? Dr. King um, has a philosophy that we now refer to as Kingian nonviolence. It's a philosophy and strategies. For a more in-depth look at Kingian nonviolence, I recommend that you read Pilgrimage to Nonviolence in Dr. King's book, Stride Toward Freedom, and also Kazu Haga's book titled Healing Resistance. After I returned from the civil rights tour, I reflected on how my teaching practice did or did not reflect the Kingian philosophy. Mostly it did, but in some ways it didn't. That was about to change. The year after our trip with Bernard's blessing, I decided to write a Kingian nonviolence manual for educators, an adaptation of Bernard's curriculum. Then I set out to gather some teachers from various schools around the state to train in this nonviolence practice so that they too could reflect on their own practice and make changes that would lead to what Dr. King frequently referred to as the beloved community. The beloved community is our framework for the future. In the beloved community, people learn how to address conflict using nonviolent strategies and war, poverty, and racism do not exist. As stated on the King Center's website, in the beloved community, love and trust will triumph over fear and hatred. 
peace with justice will prevail over war and military conflict. Yes, Kingian nonviolence is what I knew could change the world, beginning in our schools with the beloved community as a goal to work towards that would give people hope for a better tomorrow. But how do I, one person in this infinite universe, go about doing this? The teacher training groups were small, and once training was over, every teacher went back to their own schools, and the best I could hope for was that they would teach their students what they had learned. Yet I knew that this method of training was not sustainable and wouldn't achieve the goals I was aiming for. I wanted to reach more students and teachers. I wanted to institutionalize Kingian nonviolence in our schools. One idea I came up with was that once I taught my fifth graders the Kingian curriculum I had written, they could teach these same lessons to the other students in our kindergarten through fifth grade elementary school. And that is just what happened. Every day during the first month of school, I taught my students one of the Kingian lessons, lessons that taught the six principles, how to address conflict using six steps, the reconciliation process, common values, and so much more. To begin their Kingian journey on the very first day of school, I explained to my students that they would be learning a philosophy and practice that Dr. King had devised and utilized and that these were the most important lessons they would learn this year. Kingian nonviolence was something that they could use forever, no matter what they chose to do in life. And I have evidence of this being true. Nearly two decades later, I still have former students tell me that the most important thing they ever learned in school was nonviolence and that it shaped who they are as people and how they view the world. In fact, one of the most beautiful moments occurred two summers ago at a summer nonviolence institute that I was conducting. A student I had in fifth grade about 14 years ago attended our summer institute and said this, my biggest takeaway from the institute is restoring a sense of nonviolence within myself and having a perspective that I want to share with others. I want to be an activist in the manifestation of the beloved community. Once my students learned the Kingian curriculum, it was time for them to prepare presentations that they would give to each class in our school. The presentations were effective and beautiful as my students led the way for about eight years. And over that time, Wakefield Elementary School became the very first Kingian nonviolent school in the whole country. And then after 19 years at my beloved school, all of the district's fifth grades from four elementary schools were moved to a different building in the district called Broad Rock Middle School. Now, before I talk about the transformation of Broad Rock School, I'd like to give you some sense of what the Kingian curriculum consists of. The foundation of Kingian nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. In order to work on this goal, we teach and practice a type of love called agape. Here's what Dr. King wrote about agape in Pil Pilgrimage to Nonviolence. Agape is a love in which the individual seeks not his own good, but the good of his neighbor. It begins by loving others for their sakes. Therefore, agape makes no distinction between friends and enemies. It is directed toward both. Agape is the willingness to go to any length to restore community. It is a willingness to forgive, not seven times, but 70 times seven to restore community. I can only close the gap in a broken community by meeting hate with love. Can you imagine what schools would be like if everyone in them was taught to practice agape? I can because I've witnessed this love in action. Our students learn that if someone is harming you, then one of the best things you can do for their sake is to get help for that person. Here's what one 10 year old student said about agape. I feel that agape is important because it represents what nonviolence is. No matter how unkind a person is to you, no matter how much you don't like them, you must be kind to them for the person they have the potential to be. There will always be people who don't like who you don't like and people who don't like you, which is why if everyone used agape, there would be less conflict. Next, Kingian nonviolence centers on a value system known as the six principles. Could you please show slide two? 
I'm going to read the principles to you. Please note that I reworded some of the principles with permission from Bernard Lafayette so that younger students could understand them. They're in bold print while Dr. King's wording is in italics, which we use for high school students. Principle one is nonviolence is a way of life for brave or courageous people. Principle two is the peaceful community is the goal for the future. Three is attack problems, not people. Four is know and do what is right, even if it is difficult. Five is avoid hurting the spirit and body of yourself and others. And six is the universe is on the side of justice. These principles are what sets the philosophy of Kingian nonviolence apart from social emotional programs and restorative justice. Learning and practicing the principles teaches students and the adults in a school why they should seek to address conflicts with the goal of restoring relationships and making the community whole again. Can you show slide three, please? In addition to the six principles, the other foundational aspect of Kingian nonviolence are the six steps to reconcile conflict that you see here. Notice I said reconcile and not resolve. If you simply strive to resolve a conflict, that does not guarantee that those involved can learn to live and function together again in the community. Negative feelings may still be harbored, which will inhibit the ability of that community to experience positive peace. The uniqueness of Kingian nonviolence is that reconciliation is always the goal after a collaborative win-win solution is created by all who have been involved in the conflict. As we tell students and teachers, this does not mean that you have to be friends. Returning to a civil relationship is the ultimate goal. So let me return to talking about the transformation of Broad Rock School. It was September in my new school and I continued to teach my students the Kingian curriculum as I always had. Kingian nonviolence gives students strategies to address conflict and it also boosts their self-esteem. One of my fifth grade students reported that learning about nonviolence, quote, made her feel proud inside. Some of my colleagues at Broad Rock began to take notice as I shared stories about how my students were addressing conflicts. They learned that in a Kingian classroom, teachers gain teaching time because conflicts decrease in number, so less time is spent on recurring conflicts. The teachers asked me if I could teach them about Kingian nonviolence and thus began the transformation of Broad Rock School. In 2013, I began to train teachers at Broad Rock during a 20 hour training course that took place after school with voluntary participation, which is key. Since Kingian nonviolence is a practice and not a program, I knew that forcing teachers to attend would not create the natural buy-in that was integral to, integral to its success. By teaching the curriculum as a way of life, a way to transform ourselves, and a way to create the beloved community, I could circumvent the failures of the many programs mandated by districts across our country. The members of the first training cohort came up with the idea of turning Broad Rock into a Kingian nonviolent school. In order to do that, we decided that we needed a critical mass of trained adults. So I conducted training for four cohorts attended by 36 people, including both of the school's administrators, classroom teachers, the nurse, music art and library teachers, and teaching assistants. The following school year, I gathered a group of about 20 trained teachers who made up our nonviolence team. We met after school to create an action plan for institutionalizing Kingian nonviolence in our school. We drafted a three-year plan with year one reflecting the training that had already taken place that previous year. Could you show slide four, please? In this slide, you see two um, murals that are painted in the main hallway of our school, um, one for each of the six principals, and that is Bernard Lafayette standing in front of principle six, which says the universe is on the side of justice. In year two, we focused on policies and practices that did not reflect the Kingian philosophy and the nonviolence team made changes. We also looked for ways that we could educate the entire school community about the practice of Kingian nonviolence, such as in all school nonviolence assemblies. Teachers were teaching the curriculum in their classrooms and even the nurse created a Kingian relaxation corner in her office. 
In year three, we focused on parent engagement by creating an informational pamphlet and having trained teachers conduct parent workshops about the Kingian philosophy. In the following years, we continued to teach the curriculum and found other ways to make sure that everyone in the school was exposed to the philosophy and was using the common language. I'd been thinking for a while about how to transform the discipline system in a school to one that reflected the Kingian philosophy. And I knew that my administrators who both attended the 20 hour training were ready to discuss my plan. In year three, we completely reinvented the way that conflicts were addressed at Broad Rock, focusing on principle two, the beloved community is the goal for the future. The assistant principal who handled most of the conflicts that occurred has stated that her whole demeanor with students who were the perpetrators in conflicts changed once she attended the training. Kingian nonviolence conflict reconciliation is based on uncovering each person's truth and working on a negotiated plan based on those truths, a solution that is satisfactory to all. This is how our new rehabilitative model to address conflict worked. All students involved in a conflict were given a think about it sheet to fill out. Slide five, please. Keep in mind that we wait for students to deescalate before asking them to fill out this sheet. Students are asked to reflect on what happened. Slide six, please. These are the questions on the think about it sheet. This is a change because typically in a school and particularly with most anti-bullying programs, the person who was harmed is the one who was asked the questions and the person who is labeled as the perpetrator has their perspective left out of the conversation or is asked questions but is still punished without any type of reteaching to help change the behavior. Once the sheets are filled out, the adult who handles conflicts reads the sheets and begin using, begins using the six steps to address the conflict. Sometimes there are other students involved that we need to gather information from, such as bystanders and upstanders. Then I took a master schedule of each school day and asked teachers if they would like to volunteer 10 to 15 minutes of their lunch or planning periods to be peace coaches. Let me give you an example of what would happen when a conflict occurred. Let's say the conflict occurred on a Tuesday. The secretary at the school would take out the peace coaches schedule and call the teachers who signed up for Tuesday. Usually we had two to four coaches who signed up for each day of the week. The secretary would give the peace coaches a brief summary of the conflict and the name of the student or students they would be speaking to. Meanwhile, the student who had caused harm was in what we call the reconciliation room with an adult working on schoolwork and waiting for the peace coaches to come. Peace coaches would go into the room to talk to the student. Oftentimes, the conversation would focus on one of the principals or a new strategy for them to try next time. One strategy that we used to use and still is in, in use today is called get space, get help. Peace coaches would record notes of the conversation on a form so that the next peace coach didn't repeat the same conversation. Slide seven, please. The final step for the student is to fill out this reconciliation plan that the vice principal would help them implement. What happens in this process is that the student realizes that their actions do not permanently define their place in the school community, that change is prudent, and that no matter how they act, their beloved school community cares about them and their well being and believes that they can change and positively contribute to the community. By the second year of the peace, peace coaching's inception, we had no repeat offenders. In other words, students were practicing the nonviolent strategies we were teaching them. So there we were at Broad Rock six years later, institutionalizing Kingian nonviolence. You'd think I would be super satisfied that I could end my teaching career pleased with the knowledge that Kingian nonviolence was alive and thriving in my school, but my brain had been churning for years. How do I reach more students and teachers? How do I institutionalize this model of school transformation? I know, why don't I form an organization that can train teachers around Rhode Island, thus institutionalizing Kingian nonviolence statewide? With the help of other trainers and like-minded people, that is exactly what happened. Three years ago, my vision became a reality as Nonviolent Schools Rhode Island was formed. 
Our nonprofit is dedicated to training teachers, school staff, administrators, and high school students in Kingian nonviolence. Our training illustrates the ways that the Broad Rock model can be replicated in any classroom and in any school, as long as there are dedicated professionals ready to do the work and lead the way. Next slide, please. We've been invited to train teachers at all levels in quite a few schools, but training is not where we stop. Nonviolent Schools Rhode Island's model also consists of assigning one of our mentors to the school post-training so that the mentor and a team of teachers can begin the work of creating an action plan just like we did at Broad Rock. Most recently, Nonviolent Schools Rhode Island has been asked by my school district to lead the way in the anti-racist work that I proposed to them after the death of George Floyd. We will be working on a two-tiered model. The first part will consist of forming a BIPOC advisory board. For those of you who are new to the term BIPOC, it stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. BIPOC students, teachers, staff, family, and community members will be asked to participate on the board to lend their experience and expertise to the creation of a work plan that will lead to the dismantling of any forms of racism that exist in our school system from examining the curriculum to discipline to policies and procedures. This work has been unanimous, unanimously supported by the superintendent and members of the school board. In addition, we will be training the principals, the superintendent, the teachers and staff in Kingian and nonviolence, and the leadership will model what they expect the school district to embrace which is the study and practice of Kingian and nonviolence in all classrooms, in all seven schools. We hope that this will be a model for the rest of the state to follow. In closing, I hope that I was able to illustrate for you the work that can be done and is being done to create a climate and culture of nonviolence in our schools. As I said in the beginning of my speech, when I asked about chaos or community, I know as this campaign nonviolence conference proves, that worldwide there are people working to create the beloved community and that collectively we are undoing the chaos and transforming our world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. And thank you for your uh, relentless pursuit of um, really working and, and, and spreading King and nonviolence, not just in your school, but throughout schools in Rhode Island. Um, thank you so much. I know um, just 20 years ago, many years ago, uh, when I was in high school, it was a program not grounded in Kenya nonviolence, but that incorporated conflict resolution and other things that literally helped to save my life as a teenager growing up in the midst of violence. So thank you so much uh, for the good work that you do. Uh, Robin, there have been quite a few questions about resources. Um, someone had asked about the three books that you recommended, and then also if the uh, if there's a copy of Lafayette's manual available for people to be able to have as a resource for the young people they work with. Um, so in order to get Dr. Lafayette's manual, you actually have to attend the training. Okay. Can you um, tell I'm, us more about that? Oh, your training. Um, so the train, so that training takes place at the University of Rhode Island. Okay. Um, they had to cancel this summer, but they can be reached on um, Facebook and also there's a website for the University of Rhode Island Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies. Um, my manual is available. That's this one, and that's the one that we use for youth. Um, Doc. Lafayette's manual is for training trainers. So if you were interested to be in becoming a trainer. The other, the other books are Dr. King's book, Stride Toward Freedom, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, and Kazoo's book, which is Healing Resistance. Okay, wonderful, Robin. Um, well, you know, we have one minute left. Uh, we posted the resources. I guess my question to you is if there's someone that's watching and um, they're interested, they know that there's a need in their schools or in their communities, um, you know, to really incorporate Kenyan nonviolence as a, as a resource for their community and healing, what would you recommend the first step be for them moving forward in that effort? 
Um, I would say that first, the first and most important thing is to be trained yourself. And we always say in our training, this is for nobody but you. So we need to look at our own self and our practice and our belief system and start practicing the principles and skills of nonviolence before we can teach it to others. Um, as I said, I'm available as a resource and can point people in the next direction if they're interested to um, email me at nonviolentschools at gmail.com. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Robin, for your time. We'll make sure we put your information in the chat, book, chat box as well and um, continue the good work. God be with you and thank you again. Thank you. Okay, all right, we'll talk to you later. Okay, next up everyone, we'll continue um, in the efforts for nonviolent education and action. And next we have Revere Sun. Author activist Revere Sun is the editor of Nonviolence News, a nationwide trainer in strategies for nonviolent movements, and the author of many books and novels, including The Dandelion Insurrection and The Way Between. She serves on the advisory board of World Beyond War, and Backbone Campaign. Rivera was the program's coordinator and social media coordinator for Pacha Bene Campaign on Violence for three years, and she currently co-facilitates Pacha Bene online courses with Veronica Pelicaric. You can find more about um, Rivera at RiveraSign.com, and we'll post in the chat box as well. Rivera, we're so glad you're here. Welcome. Thank you, Kid. It's so great to be in conversation with you and everyone else. It's really clear at this point in the Campaign Nonviolence Conference, what a movement of nonviolence is rising up, structural, systemic, uh, nonviolent action, cultural, um, inner work, outer work. And today I've been asked to actually share a little bit of what's going on in nonviolent action. And I just wanna preface that by saying, people always ask me as a novelist, where do you get your ideas? And I always tell them from following stories of real people who are doing this kind of work in the world. And part of that is learning about what people like Kazu and Henry are doing and Robin is doing. And part of it is following the actual stories. So I'm gonna share my screen and take you into uh, a little recap of the amazing things that are happening in nonviolence in our world. There we go. Hope you all can see this. This is me holding a campaign on violence action in our local community. I also edit nonviolence news. And before I tell you how many stories each week I collect of nonviolence, I want you to imagine just for a moment from January 1st, 2020 until today, how many stories do you think I have collected for this weekly news service? Just imagine that in your mind, get, get a number in there. All right, hope you have your number. This is a little bit like a jelly bean jar. The answer is 2,032 stories of nonviolence in action. Just check for a moment if your number was higher or lower and reflect for yourself what that, what that might mean. Sometimes we underestimate what's going on in nonviolence and sometimes we overestimate it. Most of us I've found actually underestimate it. So each week Nonviolence News collects 30 to 50 stories of nonviolence in action every single week. Now the other thing we often underestimate is how successful nonviolent action is. So I want you to think how many success stories, things gone right, campaigns that have achieved goals or projects like Robin's that are working or Henry's or the stuff Kazu is doing, how many practices and policies gone right do you think I've found in Nonviolence News just in 2020? Got that number? Here we go. 230 success stories. These include things like um, fossil fuel pipeline cancellations. There's been four major pipeline cancellations uh, connected to nonviolent action campaigns in the past week. Divestments from fossil fuels, 
racial justice victories like defunding police departments, taking cops out of schools, renaming sports teams, the banning of facial recognition story, software in major cities or companies, all the major tech companies refusing to cooperate with that. Stopping airport expansions like the one at Heathrow because of climate change, stopping giant nines. I could go on. This list obviously is 230 stories long. As I mentioned before, when I say nonviolence, what I'm discussing is the 300 plus methods of nonviolent action that we know of to date, but also constructive programs, things that build up nonviolent solutions, alternative institutions that are things like restorative justice that are, um, you know, doing rewiring a punitive system, practices and policies, structural and systemic nonviolence versus the violence as usual, and then things that may be nonviolence towards the earth, including pipelines, but also including things like wildlife rehabilitation or restoration practices um, on former coal mines, for example. Nonviolence is very old. The first recorded strike happened right here at this particular spot you're looking at, which is the tomb of Ramesses III in 1170 BC when tomb workers went on strike. Now, nonviolence is actually older than this, but this is the first time we have a written record of it. And it continues all the way up until today. This is Sudan's uprising, a nonviolent revolution against their dictator. They successfully got him to uh, resign from power. They also protected against um, the, a military coup and maintained a civilian participation or citizen participation in the, um, in the transitional government. So to understand what happened in 2020, you need to look briefly at what happened in 2019. Because 2019 was the year of the protest, the mass protest. We saw protests in Lebanon, in our, uh, Iran, Iraq, Hong Kong, Colombia, Puerto Rico, so many more, including in Chile, where they rose up to overturn their constitution they had inherited from a di their dictator. So non 2000, uh, in 2020, on January 1st, the world's largest strike happened. 250 million people in India went on strike against um, plans of the Modi government. There were a wide variety of demands. Just to get a sense in your mind of what was going on in 2019, we had women's uprisings happening in Chile and Mexico, all throughout Latin America. We had student climate strikes going on all over the world. We had this incredible campaign of Wet'suwet'en solidarity with their sovereignty when they tried to stop a pipeline. The Mohawk Nation in Canada uh, blockaded all the rail lines in Canada to stop freight from moving until the sovereignty of the Wet'suwet'en was recognized. Then, of course, in 2020, this happened. <laughs> coronavirus hit. And many people thought, oh no, that is the end of nonviolent action. What can we possibly do besides protests? Well, actually, nonviolent action didn't end. It actually just took another form. And that's one of the beauties of nonviolent action. It is so versatile, so creative, includes so many approaches, practices, and tactics. People made masks by the thousands. They um, reverse engineered the school department bus systems to instead of delivering children to the school, they delivered food and lunches and um, schooling supplies to the children. They created mutual aid networks, which not only help people uh, have food to survive and resources that they needed, but also dismantled classism that is typical in charity networks. Uh, mutual aid is founded on people helping people and is a profound act of nonviolence. People also boosted each other's spirits with outdoor concerts. They also used cult their culturally significant uh, practices to heal and to 
restore their hearts and their souls through coronavirus. Uh, at the bottom right, you will see a picture of Native American jingle dancing, uh, which was used during the coronavirus uh, in drawing on older traditional practices. One thing that happened in coronavirus is we tapped into the types of nonviolent action that are called dispersed action. Rather than concentrating our bodies in the streets, we used methods of nonviolent action that took us away from the danger, including online protests like this wet sweat and solidarity uh, sign that was made, uh, or visual art, as in posters or paintings, or as we've said, pick up spots for mutual aid. And even uh, in the bottom right hand corner, uh, different groups of people removing themselves from the hot spots. This is indigenous tribes in the Amazon going deeper into the Amazon to avoid a repetition of colonized, colonial um, genocide through disease which turned out to be actually extremely important for the way Brazil did not handle coronavirus well. But even when we went into the streets, these are scenes from around the world, people are using socially, social distancing in protest to continue the struggle for justice. Uh, the top left is the car caravan, and uh, this is a uh, car caravan against the shutdown. And then you have a man who is dressed as a nurse stopping the car caravan to stop their protest. In the top right, you have the Grim Reaper stalking the Florida beaches to warn people about the dangers. In the middle, you see uh, people rising up against Netanyahu in Israel. In the bottom left, you can see uh, actually these are shop owners in China protesting lack of uh, relief. And in the bottom right, you have Lebanon protesters uh, using a car caravan to protest. Workers in coronavirus have actually increased their rate of nonviolent action, going on over 600 strikes and walkouts and shutdowns in support of hazard pay, in support of uh, closing non-essential businesses, demanding economic relief, and getting personal protective devices. They've taken these protests right to the doorsteps of the CEOs, as you see in this picture for Amazon. This is not just a US thing, this is happening around the world and uh, people are demanding uh, both that nurses are treated with respect, uh, that the coronavirus is dealt with safely to protect our frontline workers, that renters don't get kicked out. And that um, in the bottom right, I wanna call attention to this image from Colombia, where in Colombia, their mutual aid networks had a system of, hey, if you were, if you needed aid or if you, um, were hungry, or if you needed help, you would hang a red banner out your window and people would know to go and check on you. In this protest, they're using red banners to say our whole country is in danger. We need economic relief now. So as you can see, people were incredibly um, creative in continuing the use of nonviolent action to promote social justice and demand change. One of the big areas of this was actually around housing, to go on rent strike, to hold eviction freezes, uh, and to occupy vacant homes that were uh, not being used as they should be for public um, housing people. This is a campaign that continues on to today and is actually escalating in the US. So I want to mention something that happened uh, just to remind you, we actually had armed protesters campaigning to reopen during the lockdown in coronavirus. And the reason I want to mention this is because these protests got undue amounts of um, news coverage and play by the media cycle and the politicians. They were really made to look much, much bigger than they were, and they were used to uh, stop the lockdown in the US too quickly. Um, and I just wanna call attention to this because it really shows how the media bias really spins towards overcovering violence and undercovering the sheer volume of nonviolent action that is happening in the world. 
So of course, the other big thing we need to talk about in nonviolent action in 2020 is the George Floyd protests. The reason we need to talk about this is so large, but I just want to call your attention to the fact that these are the largest protests that have happened in the US. There are 20 million people, there were 10,000 arrests, and there were three demonstrations that happened in 3,000 towns and cities. This is the largest protest in US history, just to give this movement its due, to honor and recognize what is rising up right now. It also had immense global solidarity protests that happened. This happens to be in Germany, but there are protests in, all, in many countries around the world. This is part, part of what happened with the George Floyd protests is not just protests, but actually organizing strikes and walkouts and shutdowns and boycotts. These are how we take nonviolent action out of just the realm of lifting our voices and saying what's wrong, and we put it into the realm of withdrawing our cooperation and support from business as usual until demands are met. I'm going to bring this up because, uh, as Kazu mentioned earlier, um, this is a the Wall of Moms in Portland, Oregon, and. This is a remarkable uh, effort that's happening, and we do need to mention that that Portland has been struggling to recenter Black lives in the context of this uprising, and to make sure that that is not lost as we want to resist uh, federal agents doing actually very shady types of repressive maneuvers. Key points: In 2019, nonviolent action hasn't stopped. In fact, action has actually escalated and participation has grown. New people are on the scene with new tactics. People who are not involved in movements before, particularly poor people, are increasingly finding ways to be a part of movements, leading movements, organizing movements, and they're using new tactics, tactics that are actually immediately effective, rooted in direct action, and designed to be dis both disruptive and non-cooperative in nature. Some movements are still in a lull. Constructive program is on the rise in forms of mutual aid in particular. And we're getting more creative. I just want to uh, share a few slides that show and illustrate a bit of this creativity. Online rallies have become a thing. This is the largest online rally that we know of for a movement and it is the Poor People's uh, Campaign. Had two million people participating. This was in June. K-pop has really gotten a lot of attention for its Tulsa rally shutdown where they bought the tickets for Trump's rally and actually emptied the stadium by not showing up. This was in collaboration with TikTok um, and, or people on TikTok. But people also don't know that K-pop also flooded Dallas Police System's um, citizen reporting system where they wanted citizens to spy on other citizens, particularly uh, with a racial profiling kind of angle. So K-pop actually sent in all kinds of bogus reports, uh, which was awesome. There have also been video, virtual game protests. This is on Animal Crossing, uh, protests that happened for Black Lives Matter on a video game. This is an amazing protest uh, that is still going on. These are the Freedom Rides in uh, New York City. They are bicycle protests, like critical mass is another word you might have heard of it. But think about this size. There are 10,000 people in this ride. It is four miles long. If you had never heard of this story before now, consider that that's because our media would rather show you about uh, people with guns uh, countering public health instead of showing how these amazing citizens are standing up for racial justice with creativity and enormous numbers. Another for other forms of nonviolent action are less flashy. It's hard to take pictures of them, but this includes things like providing sanctuary for protests. Uh, this man uh, opened his door to protesters in DC while they were being repressed by the police and refused entry to the police when they tried to actually enter his home and take the protesters. So nonviolent action is not only what we do in the streets, it's what we do in support of movements. And it may be something that is never actually seen by anyone. 
Another story to mention is reclaiming spaces. This is Trump's uh, first wall around the White House that Black Lives Matter used as a very convenient board to spread their message. And when police tore down those signs, they put them back up. Solidarity is crucial. Intersectional solidarity, solidarity across sectors of the um, types of identities we inhabit, including our workplaces. These, of course, are frontline medical workers standing up or actually taking a knee for Black Lives. This photo has been getting a lot of attention. Uh, this is a woman using her naked body doing dance and yoga uh, in front of police in Portland, Oregon, to really shift how we think about um, countering repressive police. But you can also empty the street. These are shoes being used as protests in the UK for, to tie together COVID and climate. This is by Extinction Rebellion. In Thailand just recently, this is one of the most creative protests I've seen in nonviolence news in the past three weeks. They're banned from protesting against the government. So they held a Harry Potter protest against the government that shall not be named and actually cast spells against the government. This is a living statue protest where people, uh, these are people, and they are um, holding this shape as a form of protest. And just to conclude uh, with one last slide, it's my last slide, but um, Chile, remember they were having a constitutional uprising and they got shut down in many ways, but they revived a tradition of these arpilleras, which are political embroideries. And they use these during the Pinochet dictatorial regime to protest the dictator. Uh, I am just going to skip to this slide, which is to show a recent protest that nobody heard about, but was amazing, that biplanes flew over the sky to point out in 80, lo 80 locations of immigrant detention centers by writing in the air. Uh, they had a variety of messages and it was called X map and it would direct people to find out more about where the detention centers are. So what's next? I think we can look forward to more massive strikes. Uh, it's certainly eviction resistance. We're already seeing teacher strikes against unsafe school re reopenings more creative distance protests, uh, and mutual aid is on the rise. And I just want us to remember our successes. You'll see a few listed here, but it's very easy in nonviolent uh, struggle to get disheartened, to forget what's possible, uh, and to forget how much we're doing. We kind of let it go by in a flash without recognizing how much we're achieving. These are successes that have happened largely in the last four months. So thank you so much. We'll make sure we put the, the link to Nonviolence News in the chat box. I hope you feel heartened. I hope you feel encouraged. I hope you have ideas for actions. And um, I hope you make sure you follow these stories because this is our collective work together and it's coming from all races, all genders, all backgrounds, all classes and from around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rivera. Thank you so much. I think this was, um, well, I know this was very helpful, informative, especially in the midst of COVID-19. It's empowering, actually, to see everything that is being done um, on so many levels in so many different places as it relates to creative nonviolent action. Um, we have uh, time for one question, and I know you had mentioned the um, teacher strikes, and I know that's a lot of kind of heaviness on so many around the world as it relates to our kids and teachers having to go back to school. Uh, Tracy Campbell asks, teachers have been organizing refuse to return actions for the unsafe return to schools, but a lot of teachers are being forced back. What tools can we give our despairing teachers who are being told they don't want to work, which is the opposite of truth? Um, she follows up and says, um, what can teachers do now since unions didn't plan strikes or sick outs? What can they do? Yeah, so the, this is where nonviolent action actually has power and strength in history. Um, one of the things that we must do is to make sure that our teachers and our parents and our students do not feel isolated. 
So speak up, no matter who you are, ask others to speak up and, you know, find out what's being organized in your community to resource your community in doing collective resistance. We have far too much individualism in our society. It's a great thing, but it really holds us back in terms of movement building. Um, so think of alternatives for getting students their education. Talk to teachers and make sure teachers know how many of their other teachers in their school are upset about this. Make sure parents are working across the privilege spectrum in not just their school district, but their regional school district, because it does nothing to have a wealthy area homeschool all their kids in little pods, while a poorer neighborhood is feeling the pressure to return their kids to school because they're not resourced and their parents are frontline workers and essential workers. So we need to build that cross movement solidarity. And most of all, don't uh, counter your despair with action, right? If you feel despair, find one more thing to do today and reach out to one more person. And that is critical for transforming. And we, I see it in the stories in Nonviolence News all the time. Thank you so much, Revere, for your time, for your research, um, and for that uh, practical wisdom for, for teachers and even parents you know, moving forward um, in the midst of COVID-19 and schools and action. Um, so there were several other questions. Uh, Revere, if, if you're willing, if you would please um, post back to them on the chat box because there were quite a few questions that we aren't able to get to here. Um, also, we've put Revere's information in the chat box as well if you want to send her an email. Um, but thank you for your time, Revere. We appreciate you. We thank God for you. And we'll talk to you later, okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone. So we're going to uh, go ahead and move forward with nonviolent strategies. Um, Sherry Mitchell is our first um, speaker in this particular section. Sherry is the executive director of the Land Peace Foundation. She was born and raised on a Penawaski Indian reservation. She speaks and teaches around the world on issues of indigenous rights, environmental justice, and spiritual change. Sherry, thank you so much for being here, and we look forward to journeying you for, with you for the next few minutes. Welcome, Sherry. Uh, thank you, Kit, and that's, uh, I come from uh, Penobscot Nation, Bunawapskewi. Uh, it was a very nice attempt. Thank you for trying. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I just want to say thank you for having me here. I want to thank all of the other panelists um, who are contributing to this important discussion, uh, and also all those who are on the call and all those who are not on the call but are heeding the call around the globe right now. It's a, it's a very interesting time to be alive and to be doing this work. And so I just want to uh, thank everybody who is joining us. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my own ancestors uh, without whom I would not be here and uh, all of the ancestors uh, who have struggled together for this common cause of upholding our humanity, essentially. Um, maintaining the connection to our heart and our spirit and keeping us on this path um, that keeps us striving toward uh, things that we call social justice, right? Equity, uh, all of these things that we have devised, all of these clever labels for that really are just a measure of us maintaining um, our humanity, maintaining our connection to our heart and our spirit, uh, maintaining our basic goodness, our basic kindness. Um, and it's a shame that we have to go to such extreme lengths to uh, bring those things to the forefront, but here we are together doing this work. And so um, I want to say, uh, my name is Sherry Mitchell. My name in my language is Wanahamukwasit. I am from the Penobscot Nation. My family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy tribe at Zibayak. And so I got a, a message um, saying that you're going to be talking about um, indigenous movement towards change or something that was really vague um, and uh, hard to define. And so 
uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the realities that we're facing within indigenous populations. I, um, I work for a couple of different organizations. I'm on the board of some organizations and uh, advisory council of others that deal specifically with indigenous rights issues around the globe. And the, the challenges that we're facing as uh, indigenous peoples on every front are cyclical. And so uh, we are, uh, if we look at the history, we have you know, this 500 plus years of history where every 25 years, there's a set of unique challenges being faced by an indigenous population in some part of the world. And so uh, you know, we have dealt with military conquest, land loss, um, the stealing of our children, the killing of our women, which continues to go on, colonial encroachment, environmental racism, uh, you know, in the form of uranium mining, nuclear power plants, the contamination of our waterways. Uh, there, there are millions of indigenous peoples in the United States who have been without water for decades. Um, and you hardly ever hear anything about that. Um, and so looking at the fact that there's been an entire body of law that's been created to control our every action, uh, you know, here in the United States, there's an international body of law on uh, what's labeled as indigenous rights, but most often that's used as a mechanism for denying indigenous people's rights, uh, for saying, no, only within these very narrow parameters are we going to acknowledge the rights that you have. And so those mechanisms actually become weaponized against us. And, um, you know, I think that that's uh, something that's a great challenge uh, because you know, people say, well, at least you have your own own body of rights that's, you know, specifically for indigenous peoples, but that's that's not truly the case. Um, also, you know, looking at the fact that we have uh, these huge movements that have risen up around the world that are incredibly inspiring and that have um, brought people forward in their uh, common cause of upholding and maintaining our humanity. Uh, but we have never seen the likes of this for indigenous peoples. And uh, there has been this form of unified um, discrimination, a form of unified um, invisibility that's surrounded indigenous issues. Uh, if you look at what happened at Standing Rock, I still go uh, everywhere I go groups that I talk to all over the world. Uh, and certainly, you know, even in the Western United States, uh, there are people who don't have any idea what happened at Standing Rock. They never heard of the rise at Standing Rock. They had no idea that indigenous people were standing for months and months and months um, to protect their waterways. And so when we start thinking about some of these issues that are facing indigenous peoples and we start looking at what the history has been, the common theme um, has really been invisibility. Invisibility there uh, relating to the issues that we're facing, but also in relation to our humanity, being seen as human beings. I think that the most encouraging thing for me about the Black Lives Matter movement is that you have members of the population who have never joined the movement of movements before, who are coming forward in support of Black Lives Matter because they recognize that they are human beings. And a lot of us as indigenous peoples are still waiting for that recognition. And so when we think about mascot issues and other dehumanizing, uh, shaming and ridiculing, caricaturization of some of our most central and important values and beliefs, then you start to understand that there's still a continued dehumanization that's going on in relation to indigenous peoples. Uh, there are no other peoples really uh, in, in uh, the world who have to deal with some of the types of the things that we're dealing with uh, in regard to still arguing over the fact that uh, it's not appropriate to use Native American imagery as a mascot. Uh, to me, that seems uh, so, so common, so, um, so debasing, so clearly debasing, that it seems like it shouldn't even be a discussion, but yet here we are still debating that in 2020. Um, and so uh, we have had, uh, you know, uh, all of these challenges for a very, very long time. And 
uh, one of the things that I think is has inspired me in my work is the knowledge of um, this history that we have built into our language of nonviolent action. And so we don't have one word in our, for our people, where I come from, in our uh, warrior language that talks about violence or fighting. Not one word. It's about help. It's about support. It's about protection. It's about uplifting, right? Um, and so all of, all of this uh, nonviolent uh, action that, that um, is central to all of the successful movements throughout history is actually embedded within our language. And so uh, I, I have this natural, I guess, inclination toward um, nonviolence. Uh, Revere and I met each other several years ago uh, because she interviewed me on, um, what was it? Now oh, I can't remember. She interviewed me for, tell me Rivera. Uh, uh, I think you're thinking Occupy about Occupy Radio. Radio. Yeah. Yep. yeah. She, um, she interviewed me for Occupy Radio and I called her a conquest activist. And uh, that began a very long discussion that led to a beautiful friendship that uh, remains strong today. And so I'm, I'm just so thankful that I had that opportunity to have uh, that initial conversation that brought uh, you know, Rivera and this work of nonviolence in a more formal structure uh, into, my, into my purview. And so one of the things that I know that uh, Rivera had hoped that I would talk about was this, this whole concept of conquest activism. And so one of the things that I think is really important for us to think about is um, this, to acknowledge that we have 21 centuries going back, um, you know, millennia, really, uh, and certainly uh, 17 centuries that we can point to um, going back to the fourth century AD when um, Augustine of Hippo resurrected the just war theory and said that if you kill in the name of God, then you're not actually breaking one of the 10 commandments, uh, specifically the commandment thou shalt not kill um, because you, you would be forgiven for it, which um, created this whole religious fervor around uh, warfare for God, that um, we have this, this deeply embedded mindset um, relating to conquest, uh, relating to, um, holy war as a noble thing. And so, um, you know, when we look at the ways that we tend to address challenges, it's with a conquest mindset. Even if we uh, say that we're not engaging in violence, our goal is still to conquer some other uh, and overtake the position that they are holding. And so if we're going to be thinking about how do we engage this work of nonviolent, it has to be more than nonviolent in word and form. It has to be nonviolent at the core of your being. And that's a harder sell for a lot of people because it's easier for us to want to eliminate those who stand in our way than to transcend our differences with them and integrate them into our movement forward. And so right now, I think that the biggest challenge for us is to be able to uh, move beyond the toxicity of uh, the stay in your lane call out culture that has really morphed into, uh, I think, uh, another form of division within many of our movements and to be able to really have conversation where we're looking each other in the eye, uh, you know, we're eye to eye, breath to breath, heart to heart, maybe not breath to breath in the time of COVID, uh, but certainly eye to eye and heart to heart. Um, where we can actually engage the humanity that exists within one another so that we can transcend our differences and cycle forward as an integrated whole. That's the only way that we're going to overcome the challenges that we face because we see that passing laws has never been effective. It's never actually resulted in a long-term change. The only thing that really changes, um, uh, you know, people, societies, uh, systems and structures for the long term is a change in the hearts and minds of those who are um, 
running those systems, living in those societies, um, part of those communities. Because right now we're seeing all that has been hidden in the shadows seeping up into the streets of this country uh, in the form of uh, new wave fascism uh, and racial antagonism and violence. Uh, those things weren't eradicated because we passed laws against them. Uh, they only went into hiding. And now that they've been given just the slightest opening where they, they believe that somebody in a position of power supports their position, uh, it has come flooding out into our streets. And so we have to actually work harder if we are going to be able to create lasting change. Um, and, and what we usually do is we, we face the immediacy of the challenge that's in front of us. Um, and we actually have a word for that in our terminology. We call that samognus. And so what that, that word in our terminology means is stopping the flow of harm that's coming towards you without harming the other. It's a recognition of the sacredness of life. And so uh, that's what we tend to do. There's harm coming toward us. We stand up and we stop it. Uh, but we don't then do the follow-up work of actually coming together trying to find a common point of interest. Uh, back during the civil rights movement, Derek Bell talked about, uh, you know, interest convergence points. And, uh, you know, we still need to be looking for interest convergence points where we can begin to come together on some of these issues. Uh, because what we've, what we've actually been very good at, I think, in the last 10 years is we've been very good at being trendy with our language. We've been very good at performative action. We've been very good at mastering the art of the symbolic gesture. And now we're being called to do a deeper level of work that requires us to bring all of ourselves to the process. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge for those who are uh, finding a family within the protest community, within the activist community, uh, who aren't really there to do the deep transformative work of change. Uh, it's a challenge. And so uh, people are called to, uh, to, to the struggle uh, for many different reasons. They're called from many different corners. They bring with them all of their own trauma. They bring with them all of their own conditioning, their own biases. And uh, if we're not willing to do the work of healing that trauma, acknowledging our own biases, dealing with and uh, uh, in a healthy conflict uh, resolution minded way, the biases that are held by others uh, without being willing to say, hey, you know, uh, do you realize uh, this, this and this? And that when you say things like this, this is how it impacts other people. Uh, because sometimes it's just a simple conversation. I had a conversation with a friend of mine uh, who had absolutely no idea. Uh, and this is, this is someone who has been taught her whole life that you never uh, use disparaging language. Uh, and we were having a conversation last week and she had no idea why the N word was a bad word. Like she, she just had no idea. And she said, do you think that, you know, maybe I could sit down with somebody and they could explain it to me? And if this was somebody who was very, very sincere. And so when we're dealing with a, a spectrum of awareness that goes from uh, completely unaware to uh, completely woke, uh, what we're really dealing with there are different times of day. And we have to recognize that we are not all operating at the same time of day. And so there are some people who are, you know, it's barely dawn for them. Uh, but, you know, for us, it's two minutes to midnight. and We've been awake for a long time, right? Uh, for others, uh, you know, they're on the opposite side of dawn. You know, dawn is getting ready to crack on a new day because they've been awake for 20, 23 hours. And so uh, when we start thinking about uh, where people are in the movement, how can we show up? Can we make space for them? Or is it only our job to conquer them? Do we conquer them with our words? Do we conquer them with our witty repertoire, right? Do we uh, repartee? Do we, um, you know, do we uh, slash them, right? Uh, with the sword of our truth. 
if we do that, then we're engaging in conquest activism. And, uh, you know, we are being a part of um, the repetition of cycles of conquest that we are actively claiming to want to move beyond. Uh, Aaron is telling me that I have five minutes left and I just barely introduced myself. So um, uh, one of the other things that I, I just want to mention, uh, and, and then I'll stop and I'll take some, some questions, is that, you know, we have this whole, um, this whole illusion of uh, oneness that people often talk about. Um, and, and I want to mention, because I think it's important to the nonviolent movement, because violence comes in many forms. Um, and when people uh, talk about oneness in, in a way that uh, eliminates diversity, uh, and they equate oneness to sameness, that that is actually committing violence against a number of people. Um, that when we, when we fail to recognize the distinct and unique characteristics that uh, different peoples have, then we eliminate the possibility of creating a healthy, thriving society. Uh, because every healthy, functioning, thriving system within the universe is comprised of immense diversity. Our biodiversity within our ecosystem shows us what it takes to have a healthy, thriving society. And it's not sameness. Uh, sameness and homogenization are violence um, that are connected to colonization. And so, you know, just recognizing um, that aspect of, of, of really integrating difference, that we're not moving towards sameness, we're moving toward the transcendence of difference, the integration of our unique diversity, and then the transcendent movement forward as a whole, uh, fully intact. And so um, there's a ton of work to be done there. Uh, and I'm going to, Aaron, I'm going to stop now so that I can take uh, a couple of questions from the audience. So thank you. Okay. That was fast. Yeah, thank you so much, Jerry, uh, for, for your wisdom sharing. We, we appreciate you and, and we have some, we do have some questions coming in and Stephanie is going to um, ask the questions. Um, Reverend Yearwood um, was going to also join. He hasn't arrived yet. Um, but I wanted to wish him well, wherever, whatever's happening, um, and also put his information on the chat box for anyone who would like more information about the Hip Hop Caucus and Reverend Lennox Yearwood. Um, so have, Sherry, you from, have you heard from uh, Reverend Yearwood? Um, I think we are on the phone now, um, okay. working to call him on the other end. Um, so, yep, yeah, so if he joins, we'll go ahead and uh, he'll join the conversation with the question and answer, okay? Does that work for you, Sherry? Okay. Uh, sure, sure. Okay, sweet. So, um, Stephanie, so what, what'll happen um, is Stephanie, I'll introduce Stephanie, then there'll be a, a Q&A with Sherry for 25, 20 to 25 minutes, so you have a little time, doesn't have to be rushed, um, and then uh, we'll go into a video with, which Stephanie will share on the Meta Center, um, another song by Brother M, and we'll take a short break until 3.45, okay? All right, so Stephanie Van Hook, Executive Director of Meta Center of Nonviolence Education, co-author of Nonviolence Daily, 365 Days of Inspiration from Gandhi with Michael Nagler, and author of Gandhi Searches for Truth, a practical biography for children. She also created a cooperative board game called Cosmic Peace Force, Mission Harmony 3. Welcome, Stephanie. We're so glad you're here. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very honored to be here with Sherry and um, especially on this panel. Thank you so much, Kit. Absolutely. So we'll just jump right in into questions with Sherry. Excellent. Well, Sherry, thank you so much for just starting to introduce yourself a little bit. I mean, this is you really uh, created a nice deep pool that we can jump into uh, and explore together. It's good to see you, Stephanie. <laughs> I haven't seen you for a few years. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> uh, I was wondering about, you know, what, what really brought you to activism in a way that there's this path that people take and they decide to become activists and there's a path that people take and it, it, which 
I, I don't quite understand, but why, why would some people choose not to go down the path of activism and sort of what, what that spiritual work was for you that um, is leading you down this path? Well, I, I think that this is always an interesting question. I think that some people come to activism and I think that others have um, the issues uh, come to them in undeniable ways. And so I'll just give you a brief synopsis of a handful of many, many factors that led to me um, doing the work that I do in the world. I, you know, I, I don't know if I define myself as an activist uh, so much as a human being working on being human, right? Um, and uh, encouraging others to do the same. And um, so when I was a very small girl, probably about seven years old, uh, I was sleeping and I, I woke up to the sound of my mother crying and uh, listened to what was being said. And uh, she was talking to another family member and uh, a young a young man from um, our community had been uh, shot in the back by the local police and, and killed. And uh, you know this this young fella who uh, you know, at this point in my life is now younger than both of my kids. Uh, he was in his early twenties. He was walking home, and the police had a terrible reputation of. Um, harassing and um, attacking oftentimes native people uh, uh, for no reason whatsoever. And he was afraid. And so he started to run away from the police and they started to chase him. And uh, the community that I grew up on was an island and he didn't think that he could get to the bridge. So he jumped into the river and he was gonna swim, swim across the island and they shot him in the back and killed him. He, had committed no crime. He was not in any way imposing any threat to them. Uh, he had no weapons and um, he was shot in the back and killed because he was afraid. Uh, this is a far too common story uh, that continues to resonate to this day. So that was one incident. Uh, another incident is uh, a few years later, me and my first cousin, John Bear, who I, I hung out with all the time. We were like peas and carrots growing up. Uh, we were, and we're still like that. We're together, you know, quite, a, we're really, really close. Um, and, um, and we were riding our, our bikes uh, and uh, we were forbidden from doing two things. We were forbidden from swimming in the river because we couldn't, uh, you know, be guaranteed safety if we chose to do that. Uh, and we were forbidden from crossing the bridge that led from our community to the mainland because we couldn't be guaranteed safety if we did that. So those were the two things that we were absolutely forbidden to do. Like those were the worst things that we could do we'd get in the most trouble for. And so we were at that age when we were really questioning our boundaries and, and uh, John said, well, let's go cross the bridge on our bikes. We'll just cross the bridge and we'll turn around and we'll come right back. And I was all for it. And then I remember that the, um, there was going to be a carnival coming into town on the weekend and I wanted to go to it. And I knew that if I crossed the bridge, I'd get in such bad trouble that I wouldn't be able to, I'd be punished. And so I said, well, let's go next week. <laughs> and John's like, no, I'm going now. So I said, okay, I'm going to wait here for you. And he went and 10 minutes later, he came back. And as he's coming back, he had on these tan pants and the inside of one of his legs was covered in blood. It was just flowing down the inside of his leg. And so I started hollering immediately for my grandparents and for our mothers who were sisters who were uh, up on top of the hill um, in the house that I grew up in. And uh, they all came running out and my grandfather came out and just you know, hauled his pants off from him and said, what happened? And he had stopped when he got to the other side of the bridge because his shoe was untied and he bent over to tie it. And just as he was lifting his head, he said he could feel it going by his face. He was shot with a shotgun, with bird shot. Um, and he rode home with that bird shot in his leg and still has some there today. Um, and the third thing was a couple years later when a group of four young men from our community were praying in ceremony on a mountain near uh, where we live, a mountain that is sacred to our people. And uh, they were um, attacked by members of the local KKK group out of a, a neighboring town called Lincoln, Lincoln, Maine. 
um, and beaten so badly that they ended up in the hospital. And so when people ask me, why did you become an activist? I didn't become an activist, right? I mean, I became a human being who was shaped by the reality of my um, existence and uh, who felt that there was absolutely no choice but to address the wrongs that were existing. Uh, and, you know, it continued in, in the school that I had to be sent away to school because the, the local school refused to allow any Native students to enter into any college placement courses because the principal believed that Native people weren't smart enough to go to college, you know, and so the deep, deep levels of racism um, that we had to deal with growing up impacted me in such a way that I felt compelled to work on the injustice that I saw in the world that resulted from it. Long answer to your question. It's a, it's a, it's a good, it's, it's such a good start to the question because this idea of being human, a human being striving to, as you said, a human being waking to being human and encouraging others to do the same. Yeah. Can, you, can you speak to that dynamic as well of when one wakes to one's own humanity, how that in itself generates a force? That's what I hear in that definition too. Um, I mean, it, when, we, when I think about my upbringing, um, one of the things that was consistently true is that I was always taught to honor the sacredness of life. And so um, we're taught that uh, the, uh, our very first agreement, Kachila Gudawagan, was our first treaty to say with the rest of creation that we had to live in balance and harmony and respect um, with the rest of life. And so uh, I feel like I was blessed with a cultural reality that was steeped in that type of honor for life. And I recognize that as a privilege, right? Uh, somebody told me one time, oh, you have connection privilege. And I said, well, you know, the type of privilege that I hold doesn't harm anyone else and it will only benefit them if they uh, choose to engage in the path toward that same type of connection. And so uh, when we think about um, humanity, what does humanity mean? It's recognizing the value and the sacredness of life in my, in my uh, understanding. It's, it's recognizing what we call as um, alabizu and mamabizu, which translates to the value of enough, things I talked about in the book. Recognizing that every living being, whether human or not, has the right to live their lives um, unmolested, has the right to live their lives with a sense of dignity, uh, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. Uh, and with the capacity to be able to allow for the inherent gifts that they have within them to rise up and to become fully embodied for the benefit of the rest of life. And so uh, all of those things are tied to what it means to be human to me. And so, uh, you know, I, I think that for me that happened probably around the age of 14, uh, 15. And uh, then me and, me and John started uh, taking off and sneaking across the border into Canada and going into ceremony because uh, we were small children uh, when the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed. Uh, in our lifetime, when we, were, when we were born, it was still against the law for our ceremonies to be practiced in the United States or our languages to be spoken in the United States. And so our families had always gone into Canada to do ceremony um, with our relatives there because the, the border splits uh, Wabanaki territory. And so um, I think that uh, embodying that as a conscious choice, not just as a theoretical uh, understanding, right? To, to really have that, um, that awareness of those deeper truths sink into your body. Uh, that happened for me uh, right around 14 or 15. And then there was another, another uh, um, experience that I had in my early 20s, which I talk about in the book that um, just profoundly had me recognize that all of our interrelatedness and interconnectedness stories were not just stories, that they were, they were true. And so um, there was an elder whose name was um, uh, Teresa Sapir from uh, Willis-Degawi, which is a neighboring community of ours to the north. And every time she told one of our stories, she used to say, 
uh, this isn't a story, this really happened. And so, uh, you know, more and more I'm finding that, that that's true because we actually have a story about the first illness that uh, is, is a precise outline of what we're experiencing now with COVID, so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, there's, there are so many uh, comments coming in for you and, and questions. Um, and we are, definitely want to honor them, honor your voice and also those questions. Rev did just join the call, so I wanted to see if we could get him in on the conversation as well. Is that okay with you? Is that okay with me? Yeah. I think that's fantastic. Awesome. Yeah, love that. that's, that's good news. Okay, so what I'll do is I will, um, and thank you also, Stephanie, um, for, for being here to help facilitate. Um, so what I'll do, I'll introduce Reverend uh, Yearwood. Everyone will go back to our regular schedule. Um, so thank you so much for your patience with us. Um, so Reverend Yearwood will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have some time to continue those questions with Sherry and also with Reverend Yearwood. Um, so I'll jump right in. Uh, Reverend Leonard Yearwood, Jr., President and CEO of Hip Hop Caucus, a national award-winning organization that engages young people in elections, policymaking, and service. Reverend Yearwood is a minister, community activist, and organizer. One of the most influential people in hip hop political life, he was named one of Utney Magazine's 50 visionaries. He lives in Washington, D.C. with his family. Welcome, Rev. It's so good to have you here. Welcome. It's, it's so good to, to be here. And, and let me just say that it's, it's an honor to be with and see my sister, Sherry. I hope that she is well. Um, hope she's holding down there in Maine or wherever she is uh, and fighting, fighting a good fight. I know she is. Um, she's, she, like many of our warriors, are so important to this conversation, not only because of what she does and how she fights consistently for all of us, but definitely for our indigenous sisters and brothers, but the other part that of the legal aspect that we, I always say that sometimes our movement is infatuated with the streets and we are infatuated with the struggle and we don't understand the importance of the other parts of the movement. Um, particularly like litigation. I say that demonstration without litigation leads to frustration. And so it is so good to have my folks on here like Sherry and, and the rest of you. But thank you um, for having me. Um, thank you for Pache Bene for honoring um, this important sacred space um, as we uh, look back on what we don't want to happen moving forward in regards to um, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And our prayers still linger with those. I was watching um, those who are still old enough to remember that. That is one of the interesting things. My mother was four years old um, when that happened. She was in uh, Trinidad and Tobago where she was obviously born but she remembers something um, about that and the end of war war of the war wars that were happening across our land and and Hitler I guess who would uh, himself would commit suicide and Roosevelt who would die of a stroke and so much going on and and she don't know what was happening but she remembered just the angst in the world which is very similar to right now um, and where we have an angst in the world and which our entire world is dealing with the, the coronavirus um, and the pandemic. So before I even just move further, let me just say to all of you and definitely to our, our black and our indigenous people of color who have been ravaged by the coronavirus, uh, you are in my thoughts, um, you are definitely in my prayers and I know that this has been a tough time um, for what we have been dealing with. Um, so let me just kind of get into what I was asked to talk about, which was how do we break the silos in our movement? Um, I was a former U.S. Air Force officer. Um, so I was trained by this military and understand kind of how they respond to things. 
and what their mission is. And it's so dangerous to have an out of control military or even more dangerous to have an out of control government in charge of a military as powerful as the American government. And it's in that, that we have to continue our work um, as uh, the peacemakers to ensure that the hands of this power is in good hands um, because we see that um, when it is in the wrong hands, it can cause devastating effects and catastrophic effects that can linger for centuries. And so my, my, my job here was to discuss literally the, the issues regarding us today in regards to the pandemic, the issue of poverty, the issue of militarism, and the issue of racism, and how all of those things are connected. Um, and why our movement, for some reason, continues to operate in silos when it deals with these issues why it somehow puts these things in separate buckets um, as we are trying to combat them when many times they are literally related to the exact same thing and come from the same adversaries who are promoting poverty and racism and militarism and capitalism within our, within our communities. And so our job for me is simply to say that we must break the silos within our own movement to be successful, to take on these isms that affect our world. Our movement has for too long operated as not only a siloed progressive movement, but a segregated siloed progressive movement. A movement that somehow believes that if we attack these things piece by piece, we can be successful. But in the long run, we've seen over and over again that our enemy does not operate that way, neither should we. The thing I just want to use kind of as an example to this is what is dear to me um, is the issue of climate change. As some of you may or may not know, I am originally from Louisiana. And in a few weeks, uh, we will commemorate the 15th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina, where nearly 1,900 beautiful Americans, predominantly people of color, predominantly black and indigenous people, died in the richest, wealthiest country in the world and were left behind. In that, we also saw that that was a moment that predominantly our movement saw the failures of our military, which was putting forth false levies, poverty, which was extreme throughout the Gulf Coast, and definitely in New Orleans, and as well as the issue of climate change ravaged. What we also saw was the beginnings of what would be the movement for Black lives in the 21st century. It's interesting because on August 28th, um, the day when Hurricane Katrina hits the shores of New Orleans. That is the exact same day when Emmett Till is killed in 1955. It's even further than that exact same day in August 28th. Um, that's the same day that Dr. King would give his I Have a Dream speech. It would be the same day on August 28th when Barack Obama would accept uh, the nomination to become president, and it would be the same day on August 28th when the United Kingdom would end slavery. There is something about that time that is magical, and Black people have even used that time looking at the Haitian Revolution of calling August Black August because of the importance of that to Black people. And so it's funny that the climate movement and the progressive movement would not understand the importance of that time frame, and would miss that, would miss that moment. And even though year after year, they would stumble along to the point where literally 15 years later, they are now still wondering what we can do to connect the dots between racial justice and climate justice. And so it is this. 
it is simply the knowing that all of these issues that we have put in silos all are the same issues. And we must break down the silos within our own movement to find peace. We must break down the silos within our own movement to overcome racism. We must break down the silos within our own movement to fight for humanity. And if the stakes were not high enough, if it wasn't a matter of just fighting for equality, we are now fighting for existence in the 21st century. So we must break down the silos so that the next generation coming behind us can live. The stakes are high and the, and, and the, the amount of responsibility on us is tremendous and the weight can weigh down on us in a way that it can be overwhelming, but we cannot look at that and give up. We must now come together in the spirit of those who fought against abolition, the, for, for the abolition movement, in the spirit of those who fought for gay rights, in the spirit of those who fought for women's rights, in the spirit of those who fought against Jim Crow and slavery, we must now rise up in the 21st century and say enough is enough. We must break down the silos. We must come together, do everything we can in our being and in our power, and so that we will fight not only for ourselves, but for those who will come behind us. And if we do that, then the next generation will rise up and say thank you in the spirit of Harriet Tubman, in the spirit of Sojourner Truth, in the spirit of Ellen Baker, in the spirit of Fennel Hamer, they will look upon all those who I see before me right now and they will say, thank you, because I live and we have peace and we have justice in this world. The stakes are high, but we must fight it to do everything we can. And we must do it in the spirit of our fallen ancestor, John Lewis, and do it in good trouble. No matter what it brings to us, we must do it in good trouble. And if we do that, we can win. And memories of the injustice of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and lynchings and oppression will one day, will one day be overcome. Thank you all so much. I look forward to talking to you all and, and having a conversation and one of my dear sister Sherry as we just figure this thing out in good trouble. Reverend Yearwood, I'm Stephanie. I'm the uh, facilitator of the panel. It's very, very nice to meet you and thank you so much for being thank here. You. Thank you and again, thank to my family at Pache Bene from Ken Buttigan and John Deere and all of my family there. And it's, I'm glad to be with you today. So I'm going to be bringing some questions from the audience. So I'm waiting for uh, questions to be sent to me in my chat box here. And uh, in the meantime, I was wondering if you can talk more about that, that beautiful spirit that you were invoking and uh, the role of creativity in bringing that spirit out and bringing that spirit to life. Um, yeah, what, what role does creativity and art and music play? It plays a big part. It's important to note that our movement has a culture. Sometimes we, 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 we are asking for others to bring their culture, which is important, but we should acknowledge that we have a culture. And in, and in, in having our own culture, um, we, we do things and say things, operate the way that our movement can. And that's fine, but the importance of that is just to know that we, we need diverse culture to, to be successful. And so I believe that you must use your cultural expression to shape your political experience. It is critical. I believe that in the spirit of our indigenous sisters and brothers and our black uh, brothers and sisters and our brown brothers and sisters and all our people of color, they bring a uniqueness in their spirituality that is so important that is infused not only in their culture and in their politics, but even in their food and their dance and how they and, and how they both marry and how they bury. And so I think that we we need that as a movement. We need to infuse that that culture. Um, and it's so important. Um, you know, I think that we we miss that 
And for me, with the Hip Hop Caucus, you know, I'm very blessed to have an, be an organization that uses a culture for young people, mostly between the ages now <laughs> of their late 40s to their teens, but they, they, they're black, white, brown, red. They're queer, they're trans, they're straight, they're atheists, they're theists. Um, they're humans, and I think but the, the thing that, you, that makes them unique is their culture. I was just talking with a young conservative Republican earlier today um, on, a, on one of the right-wing shows, uh, The Patriot, and they wanted me to talk about, and their conversation was about culture, because they themselves see their, a lot of them, this is particularly Black conservatives, they, saw, they, they see themselves linked within the culture. And that's an important piece because we begin to move forward as humans, as we overcome what we now have with this current administration, there's gonna be a need to share uh, humanity. It's gonna be, a, and we, I think spirituality would do that. Obviously we did with our folks who are Catholics and Protestants and Jews and Muslims. We'll need a shared spirituality, but we're also gonna need a shared humanity. And I think culture will allow us to, to sit the table and break bread. We're gonna to need to be together. We cannot continue to fight um, consistently. We do have someone who is in office now who is very much toxic and, and very much trying to divide, and that's real. You have to remove that cancer as you would any kind of cancer. But we need to then, once that cancer removed, begin the healing process. And there's a need for us to heal. There's a lot of hurt on all sides. There are folks who are hurting in the mountains in North Carolina, and those are the people who are hurting in Detroit, Michigan. And we need to heal that. And we're going to need to prepare for that next phase of this. And our movement we'll need to continue to put forward policies to make changes, but also figure out how we can heal um, this country and the world. And I, I hear what, in, in what you're saying as well, that culture then and reclaiming culture is also a way of helping to make that healing happen. It's, it's critical. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the one thing that allows, you know, I, I'm so glad to see my, my brother, John D. I, I, I saw him earlier on the screen, but, but one of the things, you know, we talk about a lot of times is how we can laugh and cry at the same time, right? And people would think, well, that's a sign of insanity. Maybe it, maybe it is. But the reality also is that it's also part of our culture, our belief, our faith, to know that we are not in control and that there's something bigger than us who is guiding this ship. And that is a part of our culture and who we are. And I think obviously there's a different types of culture. And we need culture to help broaden this movement as well. I think our movement can be, unfortunately, can be very sometimes academic, it can be very white, it can be very thoughtful, and very, and, but it can also be sometimes robotic. And I think culture will allow us to kind of be, have fun. I believe if it's not fun, you're done, to be honest. And I think that you have to have culture as a mechanism to, to loosen up, to allow you to live, to be human. And I think and it's one thing about it. We in our movement sometimes feel that to be in a movement, you can't be human. And that's so far from the truth. To be in a, and to be in a movement is to be everything about what it means to be human. It means you have successes. It means you have failures. It means your children are good some days, your children are bad some days. It means some days you love your partner, some days you can't stand your partner. It means that you have bills. It means you have obstacles. It means all of those things. It means you're human. It means you're human. And in that culture allows you to enjoy this humanity. It allows you to enjoy art. It allows you to enjoy music. It allows you to enjoy the things that allow us to live. And then you want to protect that. And when you understand that, what is so beautiful, it is in that beauty. And then you want to fight for that beauty. You want to protect that beauty. And so I think that we're missing that sometimes. I think we get so caught up in the, into the data and into the numbers and to being right. And we are right a lot of times, but sometimes we're right, but we're wrong in how we're approaching it because love is not infused in how we're doing our work. Mm -hmm. and, and then, so how does that tie into how nonviolence and its critical role? Well, nonviolence is, is very important in, and so, so critical. I think that as we are, unfortunately, we deal with the reality that there are those who literally don't share that. And there are those who, um, they, their eyes is focused on greed, their eyes is focused on extraction. 
the eyes is focused on devouring and hurting others. And so in that, you know, it would be, it'd be wonderful if we all could just be in this Garden of Eden in a very beautiful place. But unfortunately, there are those who don't share that and they have shown their want and their desire to hurt others just to benefit themselves. And that isn't a just society, right? So I think that what we're talking about here then is that we then have to then speak up um, and stand up and sometimes put our bodies against the gear of the machine um, and bring it to a halt. And that requires, there are times because we are human, the flesh will rather be like, man, I just wanna fight back. And that's a normal response. So there's something very powerful about fighting back what is normal and saying that despite my want and desire to physically hurt you or, 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 or emotionally say things to you, I'm going to use nonviolent. I'm going to use a spirit of love that is so important that one will not only will it confuse you, but it will it will garner me allies. It will they will see that I am not here just for myself. I am not here just for my own uh, upliftment. I am here literally putting myself against the gift machine because I am believing that is the best thing to do. And so the nonviolent way has been has shown us throughout history um, that 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 is an important mechanism. Now we're at a time where it's very hard because again, we're human and we're seeing governors and mayors and presidents who literally are so derogatory, so infantile, so childish, so just immature and not even benefiting the standing of their position of governor or president or mayor, and they're literally calling names, they're doing things to attack. And so that makes it very difficult, particularly for young people I work with, who literally are infuriated by what they see, and just the, just the attack on their humanity, the attack on who they are, particularly for those who are Black and Indigenous, people of color, and they, and they and it's literally a matter of life and death, and they see themselves being persecuted and hunted and killed, and they want to fight back. And so it's much, if we have to be make a stronger case about nonviolence and not just showing that, well, it was done before with Gandhi or done before with Martin or done before with John Lewis. Um, we, we, have, we can now have a 21st century nonviolence. That's why I, I love Pache Bene, because they have been trying to literally figure out ways to engage with cities on the local level, um, which is such an important piece, Cities for Peace, and engage with the faith community and engage with young people and, again, break the silos down. I discussed earlier as a, as a way of looking at this differently, but more importantly, not giving up on the spirit of nonviolence, not giving up on that. Because honestly, once you give up on nonviolence, then the only thing you have left is violence. That's all you have left is blood. All you have left is tears. All you have left is pain. And so this is the, this is the red line that's saying, you, if you go past this line, that means that you have gone past a line that all you have then is destruction. And as human beings, for us and for the next generation, we can't have that. Can you imagine a world? And nothing but we have so much violence now. Can you imagine if, if all we all was fighting every day? So nonviolence is definitely the key thing and a key mechanism for us to use that. Um, even sometimes, as the Bible says, that we, we had to use the foolish things to confound the wise, even though it doesn't make sense sometimes. And I'll tell you, sitting in the jail cell, I'll be wondering myself <laughs> if this makes sense. And my goodness, but you, it, it makes sense from the standpoint of the long game, um, the long arc for justice. It makes sense in that regard because now that I've gotten older and my children are now using nonviolence tactics for the movement of Black Lives, I now realize that if I had been about violence, then I would be gone and they would be following suit. But now they believe in, in, a, in a just society that is one that is peaceful and loving. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to break the silo in our, in our uh, panel here and bring Sherry back in too. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and thinking about, for this question is for both of you though, uh, you know, breaking silos, there, I imagine there can be a respectful and a disrespectful way of, of making that real and um, how do we create a unified movement that 
has our silos broken down without forcing people uh, to who aren't quite ready to to break a silo or what would cause how do we urge people to break out of the silos in a respectful way maybe sherry yeah please um uh thank you brother for those amazing words and uh for your presence and uh not just here but in the world i appreciate you so much and all that you share and how well you articulate and uh you know one of the things i just uh stephanie asked you the question about you know art and music everything has a rhythm everything has a rhythm and so our our own lives have a rhythm you know the beat of our heart our movements have rhythm um and when we think about you know coming together in a symphony it's about bringing all those disparate rhythms together into uh, something that is resonant throughout. Um, and it, I like to think of it because, you know, I come from a, a riverine culture where uh, we're water people that um, it's like paddling a canoe. If everybody's paddling in, the different, in a different direction, we're never going to get anywhere. Uh, we all have to be paddling in the same direction. We have to be moving in that rhythm uh, with one another together to get us uh, to the place that we want to be. So, um, you know, when we, when we think about our movements, our, our movements are like music, our movements are like dance, our movements are a form of art um, that are about movement and rhythm. So, um, in regard to our bringing our silos together, I think that, you know, what I said earlier, and I, I loved how uh, uh, Reverend Yearwood wasn't present when I was speaking, but we talked about almost the same exact things. We talked about our humanity, we talked about uh, breaking down uh, silos, we use different language for it, and um, and we have to be willing to talk to one another. We have to be willing to look at the game that has been imposed upon us uh, that is uh, results in competition, where uh, you know crumbs have been thrown to all of these different groups, and then they're fighting over those crumbs and they're staying in competition. But we've also been led to believe that. Uh, you know, the squeakiest wheel gets the grease. So if we can be louder, if we can be more boisterous than the others, if we can silence someone else so that our voice gets amplified, uh, then we're going to advance ourselves. Uh, we don't realize that we've been put into uh, competition with one another uh, very strategically, purposefully, so that we can remain divided and so that we don't have the kind of momentum that we need to be able to move this whole thing forward. Uh, and so we have to go back to the go back to the beginning because there's power within each movement right there's power within each silo and it doesn't matter who's holding that power power does not concede anything without some benefit to itself and so that brings us back to what i was talking about earlier in the wisdom of, of derek bell in that we have to be able to have conversations with one another and we have to be able to find the interest convergence points uh, so some of the work that i've done one of the most beautiful stories that i have is of uh, a group of uh, frontline activists who are trying to protect their water um, and a group of uh, exploratory um, hydro fracking workers from Dallas, Texas. And uh, they were clashing for months and months and months. Things were getting violent. There was hired militia uh, in the trees and in the woods and all around. There were uh, cars being burned, people getting hurt, and uh, we shifted the whole thing and shifted the language to one of, uh, you know, what, do, what is it something we have in common? And, you know, the one thing that we found that we have in common is everybody loves their children. And so to shift the conversation, I'm standing here because I love your children as much as I love my own. I don't want your children to be poisoned any more, more than I want my children to be poisoned. I don't want your children to have aggressive and rare forms of cancer crop up in their bodies any more than I want that in the body of my own child. And, uh, you know, there were drivers of these thumper trucks that were running into people and it was really antagonistic and, uh, and awful. And then one day, this man parks his thumper truck across from the sacred fire area where the indigenous people um, have a, a gathering space where, you know, people can go there to get warm, to get food because it's in the wintertime, uh, or to pray. And everybody's nervous, but then the grandmothers remembered what we talked about and they walked up and they talked to this man like a human being. 
They said, come in and have some uh, coffee, you know, get warm. Can we give you some food? Come stand by our fire. And he fell to his knees before that fire. And he said, I don't want to hurt your children. I just, I'm trying to do a job, right? And so when we can find an interest convergence point, even across the, you know, uh, seemingly disparate groups, we can find a pathway towards moving forward together because what that taught us is that uh, even when we have very radically different goals, uh, we can find a common goal that can move us all in the same direction. Uh, what that man needed was he needed a way to support his family that didn't harm others. Uh, and so if we rise up and we say, I see your humanity and your need, rather than calling him the devil because he's working for this oil company, right, this oil and gas company, uh, if we can see his humanity and his need and say, let us help you to create something that allows you to use your skill set in a way that's not harmful to any, right? And then we move all of us forward. And so that's really the key, I think, is, is being able to communicate with one another in a way that allows us to find those interest convergent points. Mm. Thank you. And this it, one thing I'm coming away from this panel with is the, is the, how pervasive divide and conquer is and that in what we want to do is always keep that in mind that that's a tactic being used against um, justice in the world is divide and conquer so it's a primary a primary support for doing something different to to counter divide and conquer with what what would you call it reverend yearwood uh, counter, I mean, it could counter, divide, and conquer. <laughs> I, <Yeah>. think, <laughs> I think that's what I would, what I would call it. Yeah. Uh, let me just say this also just quickly. I think it's also important for us to, as we come out of this moment, 2020 is the year of truth, as we come out of this moment and go into the reign of this year in 2021, we, to break down those silos, we, we also need to just change some things in our, in our movement. And I'm hopeful that the funding process um, will allow for us to do that, that we need to change how we're funding um, within our movement that creates silos. Could we, we actually fund within these buckets if you're anti-war, if you're indigenous, if you're black lives, if you're a climate. And so we, we fund that way. And I think that we could, we could change that. And I think the last thing, again, I, I said this earlier, but I think that the work that Pate Bene is doing in regards to the cities I think that we have to look forward to connecting us so that one city can see what another city is doing and can compare. Because I think there's also those geographic silos as well. And the more that we can know what's happening in, in Louisville, what's happening in Detroit, what's happening in, in Bethesda, Maryland, then I think that that also will help the process. And I wonder for both of you, if there's a question as an, a, you know, final question that you want to pose to everybody as well, um, or a question that you're asking yourself right now as well in, in your work and um, love to hear it. For me, uh, for me, I, I mean, I think that, you know, I'm looking at this time as not only the year of truth, right? It's the exposing of deep truths, the exposing of dark truths. Uh, but it's, an also, it's also an opportunity for us to find out what's true for us, right? Because we, we challenge the things that are just most outrageous out there. Um, but very rarely do we challenge the simple little tiny micro movements within our own lives that allow for the repetition of some of the more outrageous things. So, uh, you know, my challenge or my question to everyone is how do we get to that uh, deeper understanding of our own movement within the world that's supporting uh, the, the maintenance of the system that's leading to all of this decay? I guess my thing is just to take care of yourselves. Um, Self-care, is a revolutionary act, has been, has been said. And so for all of those and to myself, take care of yourself, love yourself, make sure that you are doing all you can to be prepared um, and to be safe. And that will help us to be victorious because if you love yourself, then the folks you want to be part of this movement will love you and you will love them as well. 
And so I think if we do that, then we can be successful. Thank you for having me. Thank you both so very, very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Yearwood, again, Sherry, and also Stephanie for facilitating the discussion. Uh, we really appreciate all of the words of, of wisdom um, as we move forward on the nonviolent journey. Uh, Stephanie, you now we'll invite you back um, to share a Meta Center film clip. Hi, thanks so much. Well, uh, the Meta Center has been working for several years, uh, maybe close to three times that amount uh, on a documentary film on nonviolence that really goes into the core of this idea of nonviolence being a force for change that we can all harness both within ourselves and within the larger social sphere. There's many people that are on the, on the various panels who are in the film, Sherry Mitchell, Rivera Sun, uh, Ken Buttigan, and we have created a viewing link for 24 hours for participants of Campaign Nonviolence to be able to have a very, very sneak, very sneak preview of this documentary. And you'll see it's something like version 148. And uh, what we're going to show now is uh, a very early trailer of the film. Um, this is definitely not the most updated trailer, but it has some great stories and it gives you a sense of what's going to be in the film and we're going to be in three film festivals coming up um, with the next within the next few months and so all is looking for a great rollout sometimes later this month of august it seems like every one of us has this big library of humanity and nonviolence inside him. To be able to meet the human being inside you and to discuss with him about yourself. Nonviolence is to be an artist of your humanity, to bring the best of you, not just by solving problems, but also by, by living, by experiencing, by practicing. It's about your humanity is my weapon. And I have to be able to bring you to that place. How to put love into action in a way that you maintain your self-respect, but at the same time, you solicit in a very forceful way with love, the respect from others. If you look at the world right now, we've got more people who are displaced from their homes because they are seeking safety and security elsewhere because of violent conflict or intimidation or harassment than there has been since World War II. The status quo is just not working. And the status quo is sitting on the idea that protection, violence reduction, ending war requires more weapons. Governments have spent billions and billions of dollars getting violent science right in the past 400 years and I think that it's time that we invest some time and energy into alternatives. Our evolutionary mandate is to move into the peaceful cooperation because we see now that we're destroying our own infrastructure, we're destroying the planet we depend on. So I think if you start from the assumption that everybody has a good core in their nature, that we're all deeply interconnected, that there is no problem which cannot be resolved to the benefit of all parties. If you start with those assumptions, and even if you don't believe them, you take them on as a hypothesis, as assumptions, and you test them, and you find out that it works. He says, you, what are you doing in this prison? And I said, oh, um, I was uh, protesting the killing of my sisters and brothers in Central America. He got the meanest look on his face. And I'm thinking, this is it. I mean, you know, anything could... And then his face melted. And he looked this way, and he looked this way. And he said, they sent me to Vietnam. I killed a lot of people. I don't sleep at night. What you did probably made no difference 
but I'm glad you did it. It was the first time I'd ever heard a prison guard uh, share his truth. Cooperation is just as much a part of us as competition. And every disaster proves that. Often in evolution, the cooperative mode was driven by disasters. We have to think big. Sojourner Truth didn't think small. Martin Luther King didn't. Gandhi didn't. They had big, bold ideas. It's actually patriotic to fight for peace. The goal was not changing the lunch counters or changing segregation. It was changing the hearts of the people who were sustaining and maintaining segregation. That's when change comes. Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing um, such powerful love and action. Uh, we look forward to uh, staying updated with the Meta Center uh, and seeing when the full version comes out. Thank you for sharing such a special treat. Thanks so much. Okay. So right now, everyone, um, if you need to, um, and I should have been encouraging throughout, but please do if you need to get something to drink or have a, a rest break, it's totally, totally, we encourage that. I know Rev talked about self-care as part of active nonviolence toward ourselves. So please do take care of yourself as we journey forward. Um, we'll continue now with nonviolent strategies um, and specifically the nonviolent strategy portion of our uh, conference today. Um, so we invite now to the conference, Father John Deere and also nonviolent woman in Delaware's LaVeda Owens-White as they have a conversation about nonviolent cities and also the Campaign Nonviolence Week of Action. Father John Deere is a priest, activist, and author of 35 books, including The Nonviolent Life, The Beatitudes of Peace, They Will Inherit the Earth, and Radical Prayers. He is on the staff of Pache Bene Nonviolent Service, and he lives in Big Sur, California. Welcome, welcome, John. We're so glad you're here. Leveda Owens-White serves as faith community nurse for the Ninth Ward Interfaith Clergy Coalition in the city of Wilmington and coordinates the Delaware Region Health Ministries Network. Ms. Owens White is an advocate for health and social justice policies at the national, state, and local levels as a consultant, mentor, and community activist. Laveda is a member of the Movement for a Culture of Peace, which is a broad based coalition of faith, nonprofit, and community groups, and founders of Peace Week Delaware and the Nonviolent City Wilmington Project. Welcome, Reverend John Deere, and also LaVeda Owens-White to the conference. Welcome, we're so glad you're here. Thank you, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we invite you and John to share in conversation with each other. Um, John, are you here on the call as well? Yes, can you hear me, Sarah Kitts? Yes, yes, okay, we can great. hear thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm John, Father uh, John Deere. Uh, here in San Francisco actually today and I want to say first of all a big round of applause to our fearless host Kit so let's give a big round of applause to Kit thank you and I want to thank everybody Apache Benny for putting this on today uh, but especially want to call out uh, our leader our executive director who works this morning noon and night totally behind the scenes he's made today possible so a big round of applause for Ryan Hall wherever you are, Ryan. Thanks for all the great work you've done. And thanks to all the speakers. And there's, I see over 400 of us on right now. And uh, thank you for all the great work you do. And so I'm happy to be here with my friend Leveda from Wilmington. And Leveda, if it's okay, I'd like to talk for a bit about the Nonviolent Cities idea. And then after like 10 minutes or so, I'll turn it over to Leveda, who will talk specifically about her project there for about 10 minutes. That sound like a plan, Levita? Um, Please do. Uh, yeah. So uh, we we're talking to nonviolence, and um, you know I often think about contemplative nonviolence and active nonviolence and prophetic nonviolence, and I'm still thinking about what Richard Rohr said this morning, Kit. You know about 
his last words to us about, in effect, standing in infinite love. If you can stand in infinite love, all this nonviolence work is doable. I love that. Uh, we're shifting now to talk about real active nonviolence and organizing, and how do we do that? We're, we've been talking all day about personal nonviolence, interpersonal nonviolence, now organizing grassroots movements and structural violence and create a new culture of nonviolence. And thinking about that, what I want to say is, uh, you know, nonviolence works. It's good work, but it's hard work. And we don't like to admit that. And things are so bad, as I heard Reb say again, you know, we have to up our game, up our ante, and wh whatever we're doing, dig deeper, do more. He said, think bigger, be bolder, and spread nonviolence farther and wider, as Rev's friend and my friend John Lewis would say, to keep at it and do more than we can expect from ourselves. That's been a challenge for me personally. I think later Ken's going to talk about our project, the National Week of Action Campaign on Violence in September. So I want to talk about, with Leveda here, a very specific example of what we can do. That's the question. What can we do specifically? Here's a tool called the Nonviolent Cities Project. So I'm going to speak about it generally. Levada is going to talk about it practically in Wilmington, Delaware. So uh, here's my story. A couple of years ago, I was speaking in Carbondale, Illinois. And beforehand, we were having dinner, and I asked the local activists, so what are you working on? And they said, Carbondale, uh, they said, nonviolent Carbondale. And I said, excuse me? What? I never heard such a thing. And they said, well, we were just dreaming about what would Carbondale look like if Dr. King were here. And he said, it's supposed to be a city on the hill and totally nonviolent. And we started to work on that. So we said, we can't meet with ourselves. Let's start meeting with the city council. And they started to, the police department, school systems, the hospital, the healthcare workers, every sector of society to work at everything at once. Racism, police brutality, poverty, but the involvement with the Iraq war and environment this is getting right at Reb's challenge about breaking down silence. I had never heard such a thing. And right then and there, I thought this was brilliant. I actually think this is like postdoctoral kingy and nonviolence. Can I say that, Kit? Um, so with their permission, we at Pache Bene launched the Nonviolent Cities Project. We've had hundreds of inquiries around the country and the world. But I think right now we really have 20 cities really working at this pursuing a vision of their city as nonviolent, um, including places like Memphis, uh, Cincinnati, Owensboro, Kentucky, Tiffin, Ohio, Springfield, Massachusetts, St. Paul, Morro Bay, California, and elsewhere. I was speaking in Cincinnati when they were going to launch Nonviolent Cincinnati, and it was an amazing evening, a packed auditorium. They had these most wonderful high school kids who spoke. And it was electrifying. The next day, they had a workshop with all the key community leaders working on every horrible struggle in the city, from racism, police brutality, gun violence, this poverty, healthcare, and so forth and so on. And we had a really great morning uh, talking about how do we begin the process of moving toward a nonviolent Cincinnati, you know, as a, a new way to look at the city. And one of the great church leaders stood up and said, I'll never forget it. He said, me and everybody here have given our whole lives to Cincinnati. We're all working on one, some ter terrible crisis. He's working full time on fighting racism, others on homelessness and so forth and some gun violence, each working on our separate issue. And he said, it never occurred to me till right now that we share a common vision. And I didn't know what it was, but it's the dream of a nonviolent Cincinnati. And it was a turning point for him and we were all very moved because they have all this common ground. They have the same vision, but they didn't know what the vision was. I could go on and on about that, but I, this is one of the fundamental things. Levade has heard me say this. Uh, it's another way of talking about what we've been talking about all day, which is what is this nonviolent work about? And I think part of it is to help us reclaim the vision of our humanity, if you want to say, or, or you could put it this way. As I said on the video about the 75th anniversary of Hiroshima, one of the casualties of this culture of violence is the loss of the imagination. People can't imagine a world without war, a world without racism, a world without nuclear weapons, 
not, much less imagine a nonviolent world. Um, but that's our job, is to help people reclaim our imagination for peace and nonviolence. That's what the abolitionists did, as Rev said. They lifted up a vision of a world without slavery, of a world equality, a world of equality, and then organized toward the new vision. That's what Dr. King did, literally, I have a dream. And um, we need to help each other do that. And this is one little project. Uh, those of you who are involved in the Nonviolent Cities Project, I really thank you. And I urge you to keep out of it because I keep at it because I think we're sowing seeds for a more peaceful future that we may not live to see. Others, I invite you to consider this as a, as a tool for organizing. Even during this lockdown time, it's all there online and you can organize a little bit uh, like on Zoom. Ryan and I have published a fabulous brochure. I don't know if you can see it in Nonviolent Cities brochure and uh, explaining the whole project. You can write to Ryan at Pache Benny. He'd be happy to send you 100 for free, but it's all on the website. It's all laid out beautifully, uh, how, what the vision of it is. That's at campaignnonviolence.org. You scroll to Nonviolent Cities. Then if you go to the very bottom there, it says 10 steps how to organize an nonviolent city. I just read them over the other day, Levada. I think they're fabulous, but they're from Carbondale and, um, and uh, other cities that pitched them. They're very, very good guidelines and they're simple. You spread the word, you plan an organizing meeting. And as I said, you could do this on Zoom, eventually set a date and you start a committee, but it's gotta be all inclusive, not just the same old, same old activists. And this, is the key that Carbondale, Carbondale continues to say to me to remind everybody. It can't be the old group. That's the whole point here. And you begin to talk about uh, dreaming together. Well, what would our city look like if we could end all this violence? Well, it would look like this or that. Some people have spent months or a year working on that part alone. Other cities, I think of Springfield, Massachusetts, did a weekend retreat. Then you design a, design a strategy. You start the outreach, the implementation, and eventually can lead toward a public launch. So the committee and the group, the idea is you're reaching out to everyone in your city, starting with the mayor and the city council. You're building relationships there. Then the police chief and the police officers. You've got to get beyond your fear, and you've got to be really nonviolent and working together. And all the religious leaders and the educators and the healthcare workers, the housing authorities, the local media, the youth and the grassroots activists, the poor and the marginalized, children, the el elderly. It's no longer among ourselves. We're building relationships, practicing nonviolence, and what John Lewis called the beloved community. And under this common vision of a nonviolent city, I think you can address all these issues, and it's not in a siloed way, from racism, poverty, and police brutality to gun violence, but also the war preparations going on in the edge of town or the nuclear bomb factory, or the environmental destruction. If you can get your leaders, if we can get us to pursue this vision, I think we can accomplish more than single issue organizing. But the idea is everybody's gotta learn nonviolence. So we're promoting nonviolence everywhere in our city. Everybody starts teaching nonviolence. In every class, in every school, every religious community is preaching nonviolence. We're addressing every aspect of violence head on, and we're working toward institutionalizing nonviolence and toward a new culture of nonviolence. And this way, we also, this is my theory, Levada. Gandhi said that a lot of part of the nonviolence work is um, you have to have a constructive program. And that's where I think we get at it here. So uh, it's been my blessing to travel around the country and meet all these wonderful people. And one of the most exciting places, I'm just name dropping here now, is Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, and I've been there three times, memorable times. and. Uh, I could talk a lot about that, but I'll just say last September in Campaign Nonviolence Week of Action, the friends in Wilmington, Delaware, put over, put on 100 events in Wilmington around the state. That was just showing off, Levada. And thousands <laughs> of people against everything, racism, poverty, war, environmental structure. And then they marched to the church and they're calling for a new nonviolent Wilmington. And there's some great people there. So I want to introduce my friend, Leveda Owens White from Wilmington, Delaware. And Aveda, I just hand over the show to you to ask you to tell us the story. What happened with the idea of helping other people? And where are you on the journey? And what are you learning? And what tips do you have for others? So, friends, welcome, Leveda. 
Thank you, Father John, and everyone for inviting me to this important conversation. And on behalf of our nonviolent city Wilmington Steering uh, Committee, which there are nine members, uh, I'd like to just uh, say that we began um, with the idea of um, nonviolent cities Wilmington, uh, having heard from Father John about nonviolent uh, city Carbondale. Uh, which I am pleased to say uh, I grew up in my formative years. So I definitely uh, embraced the, the concept of nonviolent city Wilmington. At some point in time, uh, a few years ago, the New York Times uh, saw fit to dub Wilmington, Delaware as Murder Town, USA. We were having a um, influx of, of violence uh, during that period of time. And even uh, this past July was a particularly volatile month for us. Uh, and we almost had as many murders as there were days on the calendar. So it is something that we are, are still um, struggling against to uh, put down that identity as murder town. USA, because uh, as um, we started out the movement for a culture of peace in 2014, uh, it started out as a movement uh, with a, a, a march, but it became, has become a movement uh, through which um, Peace Week Delaware, which is a statewide event uh, inviting all different agencies and organizations to participate and, and uh, share their vision of what it would be like to have peace in our community. So we have um, begun the Peace Week Delaware. This will be our fifth year, our sixth year, going on our sixth year in uh, trying to promote the activities. In 2018, our governor, John Carney, uh, proclaimed Delaware to be a trauma-informed state. So this gives us an opportunity, furthermore, to uh, promote nonviolent city Wilmington and uh, try to get uh, some uh, attention and raise awareness throughout the state of what we're trying to do here in the city. Uh, at that time when we were uh, given the uh, nefarious name of Murder Town USA, our city council president, uh, Hanifa Shabazz, contacted the CDC to help us figure out how we can um, do something about uh, the number of uh, violent activities that were going on. And we still, to this day, have a, a, a group around, uh, uh, it's an advisory group, uh, to impact the, uh, the nature of violence in our cities. And since that time, we've created a, a, a teen outlet to address some of the kids that are on the streets, at, um, uh, it, particularly in the evening and after dark, where um, a lot of negative activity is likely to take place. So now we have uh, a, a teen outlet where uh, it's called the teen warehouse where they can gather and get on the computer and, and get involved in some community activities as well. So uh, we're, we're continuing to um, um, have this movement and trying to build coalitions with uh, our Wilmington Health Planning Council uh, the public safety, uh, again, with the, as, as Father John had said, uh, we're working with our public safety and police department. Just week, uh, weekend before last, we had a love walk. Uh, our millennials uh, took up uh, the, the uh, baton and marched with the Wilmington police in tow. Uh, across the bridge from one of our impacted um, neighborhoods, across the bridge into um, the city of Wilmington and up to our courthouse, uh, showing our solidarity. And so I think the momentum is growing. And, you know, sometimes when there's um, 
this COVID-19 had uh, put a put a, a crimp in our, our movement because we were using uh, Veronica and uh, Veronica Pelorik, Pelicaric and um, Nina Noavitz's book, Engaging Nonviolence. We had started a study group, uh, part one, which was a five week series. Uh, we got through that and it was uh, very involved and uh, people were looking forward to the next step when COVID-19 hit. So that put a little uh, uh, stop in our in our movement, but we are planning on doing a virtual study groups to see if that'll work out as well. It was very informative and uh, people were engaged and we hope that we'll be able to promote um, the study groups uh, throughout the, the coming weeks as we approach uh, Peace Week uh, in, Usually it's held in September, but this year, because of the Jewish high holidays, we are uh, moving to October. From October 3rd to the 11th, we'll begin our statewide uh, Peace Week Delaware, where uh, different groups will host their events. We have a, a annual event in Wilmington uh, called Wilmington Wellness Day, and we participate with uh, Peace Week Delaware uh, to let our citizens know that uh, their health is important, uh, how to access resources that are in the neighborhood. Delaware is rich in resources, but oftentimes people don't, uh, aren't aware of how to access those resources. So this is uh, just one of the ways in which we try to engage the community. And I must say that um, we have uh, avoided becoming an organization and, and, and trying to raise funds and, and things of that nature so that we can work with other groups such as uh, the Coalition to Dismantle the New Jim Crow uh, getting involved with the Poor People's Campaign, and, and, and um, we have uh, 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 an event called, um, it, it's a Peace Academy, and, we, and we're just doing a number of things here in Wilmington to bring together, we have uh, interfaith leaders uh, that meet on a monthly basis, uh, it's more or less a think tank, trying to get people to uh, break down those silos that has been mentioned on, uh, on the conference. So we're, 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 we have a, a interdenominational ministers action council. Uh, all of us are working together um, to, to, to plan to, to bring the community together That's to great. try and, and, yeah. and break down those silos. So um, Anita, you're doing such a great job and there's everybody really here is working. So do you have any one or two tips for others who are listening, working on your city, besides keep at it, because you all are persistent. Maybe that's it. I think it, it was, as you mentioned, Father, is that uh, you have to um, build coalitions and, and, and initiate planning groups that's going to reflect yeah. the community that you're trying yeah, to impact. Yeah. That, that if yeah. if, if uh, our grassroots folks aren't at the table, uh, we're bound for uh, failure. So yeah. it's important yeah. that uh, we build these co coalitions and, and engage our social networks to come together to uh, as one. That's great. Um, That's great. This uh, weekend or the next weekend, the fourth weekend of the month is our uh, annual August quarterly, which will be a big gathering uh, of, um, of the neighborhood to talk about some of these things and uh, to enjoy That's the great. spirituality of our people. Well, uh, our time is up, but thank you so much for all the great work you're doing. And please, feel, I know there's so much to talk about. We can talk all afternoon. And thanks to all the other good groups out there and working in cities. And uh, again, this is a tool for bringing nonviolence concretely to your community and employing all the great stuff we're learning today. Thanks so much, Levada. Thanks, everybody. I know our next big uh, guest is one of the greatest teachers in nonviolence in the world, so buckle your seatbelts, everybody. 
Thank you for having me. Thank you, Leda. I'll take care. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Leveda. Um, thank you for sharing such practical you know, wisdom on how to build coalitions and move things forward, organize, you know, be very strategic as far as moving forward as in nonviolent cities and nonviolent action. Um, so we did put uh, the Nonviolent Cities Project website in the chat box uh, for those who want more information. Um, and we encourage you to check it out um, and to start a nonviolent cities project in your city, okay? Um, so next, as, as John already mentioned, um, our next guest is Dr. Erica Chenowitz. Uh, she will be speaking on the strategic power of nonviolent resistance. Dr. Erica Chenowitz is one of the world's leading social scientists and scholars on nonviolence and the co-author of the groundbreaking work, Why Civil Resistance Work. She is on the faculty of Harvard University. Uh, thank you, Erica, for your continued research on your important work. Welcome to the Campaign Nonviolence Conference. We're glad you're here again. Thank you so much. It's very good to see all of you and to be with you um, again. And uh, it's amazing uh, what a couple of years can do uh, for the world and uh, uh, for this conversation. Um, so I was asked to speak about the strategic logic of nonviolent resistance and um, what I'll do is first talk a little bit about what we know about the general patterns and how nonviolent resistance succeeds and why. And then I want to talk about three things that are giving me hope about the state of nonviolent resistance in the United States, particularly right now and then uh, wrap up with a, a few uh, reasons for uh, explaining a bit more about the data that we have that uh, underlies that hope. So um, first, uh, civil resistance is a, a method of struggle where unarmed people, ordinary people, uh, basically get together and uh, struggle together against an opponent using lots of different methods like protests, strikes, boycotts, stayaways, and other forms of non-cooperation without harming anybody. And we've seen instances of civil resistance taking place around the world since we've been writing down our histories. Um, so anywhere uh, there's history written, there are examples of, of people using nonviolent resistance, even though the examples of people using violence typically get more attention. Um, the term civil, itself um, ought not be confused with civility. Um, people who use civil resistance are not always uh, being friendly or nice, um, but they are using a particular method of action um, that often uh, gets results. Um, in fact, the origin of the term civil comes from uh, the Latin civicus, which means citizen or community. Uh, and the Latin for resistance uh, comes from uh, sistera, um, which basically means to stand fast or stand solid. So uh, civil resistance really means a community of people who collectively stand their ground um, in the matter against which they're struggling. And it reminds me very much this term of uh, what um, John Lewis used to say about uh, we must get in the way uh, and we must get in some good trouble. So um, in comparing the rates of um, success of nonviolent resistance against forms of armed struggle with which many people are familiar, what we uh, know from comparative data from 1900 at least up until 2020 is that about 51% of mass revolutionary campaigns that relied primarily on nonviolent resistance succeeded and about 25% of armed revolutionary movements succeeded. So what that means is that nonviolent campaigns were basically outperforming their violent counterparts by about a two to one margin. And um, there are really important reasons why nonviolent resistance has been such an effective or relatively effective technique of uh, revolutionary struggle. Um, the first is that nonviolent resistance allows far more people to participate than your average armed struggle. So um, the numbers of people who engage in resistance when it's nonviolent, when people are using protests and other and forms of non-cooperation um, are about 11 times larger on average than the number of people that would participate in an armed insurgency. And um, one of the things that I've recently been uh, studying with my colleague Zoe Marks is that in fact, 
women are much more likely to participate in large numbers in campaigns of nonviolent resistance, which both gives these campaigns a numerical advantage and also many other advantages in terms of uh, public opinion and the sense of legitimacy that they carry with them and the different types of tactical innovations that become available to these movements. And so not only do nonviolent movements um, uh, become much more diverse in terms of their participation base, but that diversity is incredibly important in leading those uh, movements to succeed. Um, so movements with uh, at least 50% women on the front lines are far more likely to succeed than movements that exclude women uh, and exclude people uh, with different risk profiles essentially from participation. We also know that um, mass movements succeed when they maintain momentum. And momentum is uh, basically the ability to continue uh, to assemble large numbers of people in short periods of time uh, in order. Uh, so you can even think about this like physics, um, mass times velocity. Uh, the larger the numbers of the people and the shorter the time uh, between events, the more momentum a movement has. Um, we also know that movements are more likely to succeed when they create defections and nonviolent resistance doesn't necessarily always win because people become convinced that the movement is righteous. A lot of times they win first and over time people become convinced that the movement had a good point. Um, and um, a lot of times this happens through defections. Um, which means that people that reside in different pillars of support like uh, political elites or uh, different civilian bureaucrats or civil servants, um, security forces, police, um, uh, economic elites, um, uh, educational elites, kind of powerful cultural influencers, um, these people begin to change their position on the issue. Um, and the visibility of that begins then to convince others um, that maybe they want to be on uh, the movement side as well. And so, um, you know, sometimes defections look like people switching sides um, and joining a movement. And sometimes defections just look like people not standing in the way of the movement's success. Um, so there's a, a, a wide range of behaviors that we might call defection. But the key for nonviolent movements is that the larger the number of people who participate, the more defections tend to happen. And that's because uh, large numbers of popular participation um, come with large amounts of political and social influence. Um, the, the fourth thing that successful movements do is they maintain resilience um, to repression. So if repression starts to become um, uh, more intense against the movement, um, they have a good, strong organizational structure and a lot of coalition partners that can help to uh, maneuver around that repression. And they're so not just protests and demonstrations, um, but also forms of less risky action like stay at home demonstrations or other forms of non cooperation that don't expose people uh, directly to confrontations with police and security forces. And then the fifth thing that they do is they tend to innovate tactically above and beyond their response to repression. And this includes um, moving away from just protests and demonstrations into alternative institution building, uh, strikes or other forms of non-cooperation. But it also includes what John was just talking about, um, which is constructive program. So coming up with um, the, the alternatives while the struggle is underway, uh, not, uh, not just hoping that that will be resolved after. So one other kind of interesting thing in, in terms of the, the patterns um, of, of the data is that um, there's a common misunderstanding that nonviolent resistance works really too slowly um, for real radical change to happen and that if you really want a quick and, um, and um, uh, decisive struggle, a movement has to use violence. And in our data, at least, the average nonviolent campaign takes about two and a half to three years to succeed. Um, whereas the average violent campaign takes something like nine years to succeed. And so actually violence takes longer. And part of that is because it's actually really difficult to build political allies um, with an armed struggle. So um, I've talked a little bit about some of the comparative aspects of these two forms of struggle, which probably doesn't come as too much of a surprise to this audience. Um, but uh, where does that leave us now with regard to the United States? Um, Reverend C.T. Vivian, uh, who also recently passed away, used to say that nonviolence is the honorable way of dealing with social change. Because if we are wrong, no one gets hurt but us. And if we are right, more people will participate in determining their own destinies 
than ever before. And in fact, what we've seen over the past decade is more people around the world and more countries turning to mass nonviolent resistance than in any other period in recorded human history. And this has been true in the United States as well. Since the last time that I was with this group, um, at least a few years ago, um, we have seen uh, seven or eight of the largest uh, 10 mass demonstrations in US history. So if you kind of go back to the entire founding of the United States and you look at mass uprisings uh, or mass demonstrations, uh, if you count the largest 10 where there was the largest po popular participation, we've seen seven or eight of those in the last three and a half years. Um, and in fact, uh, the types of demonstrations that we are seeing are starting to capture some of these other uh, important factors of successful nonviolent resistance. For example, the diversity of participation, um, the ability to maintain momentum at key points, um, the ability to create defections uh, from the opposition, and numerous tactical innovations. So let me go to the three major data points that give me a lot of hope about where we are in this country right now with regard to nonviolence. The first is, um, is the current uh, anti-racism uh, movement for Black Lives that is underway in the United States. Now, the part of the reason this gives me so much hope is not only because um, we are now able to say um, in much broader parts of the country than ever before that Black Lives Matter for people who a few years ago, it was hard for them to say that, no longer is it hard for them to say that, but this is the largest and most sustained and broadest uh, mass uprising in US history. Um, polls suggest that between 10 and 25 million people had participated in at least one racial justice protest by mid-June from the last week of May. Um, that is between um, basically six and 9% of the US population. Um, the movement that is underway right now has taken place in probably over 10,000 different localities in the United States. Um, and in fact, if you look at the number of counties, we have about 3,100 counties in the United States. Probably over 85% of them have held at least one protest associated with Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives. We have never seen anything like that in the United States. It's completely unprecedented. And it's also unprecedentedly multi-generational, multiracial, and led by women in many of these different places. Um, so the second uh, key data point uh, is the incredible leadership of youth in many of the different mass mobilizations that we have seen around the country over the past three and a half years, where youth used to be um, considered by many people in this country, at least, uh, who are watching youth political behavior, kind of somewhat aloof to, to politics. Um, youth are highly engaged in politics and in street politics and, and street actions as well. So for example, um, in uh, February of 2018, there was a mass shooting at a high school in Park, uh, called Parkland in, um, in Florida. A month later, uh, students associated with that school and 4,439 other schools in the United States walked out of their schools at noon. Um, this included at least a dozen home schools. It also included about 150 kindergartens. And these were all led by the students. In fact, uh, what we have since found is that if you look even just at the state of Pennsylvania, there is a very high correlation between the, stu the, the school districts in which there was a walkout associated with that Parkland uh, uh, uprising two years ago, and whether they held a racial justice protest for Black Lives Matter this year. So um, not only are the youth uh, mobilizing, but they're organizing. They are able in incredible ways to maintain some of the experimentation that they have uh, gained and the, the experience that they have gained and bring it forward into future mobilization and increase their capacity um, for, for mass action, mass collective action. Um, and there's also been um, incredible uh, youth-led mobilization around climate justice and many other key issues um, that are so pressing in our country at this time. So the third data point that I want to, uh, to mention that gives me hope 
is related to the tactical innovations that have taken place, particularly during uh, the pandemic. So um, I mentioned that in the last decade, there were more mass mobilizations around the world than in any other uh, decade in recorded human history. And many of those seemingly ground to a halt with the arrival of COVID-19 and uh, the inability of people to gather um, in large numbers in public spaces in many places in the world, including in many in the United States. Um, but that didn't mean that those movements disappeared. It actually, in many cases, meant that movements were able to regroup, um, take uh, some time to reflect, to build new relationships, to hold teach-ins, to hold different trainings, and to link many of the um, truly unjust uh, and unequal outcomes linked to uh, COVID and, and the failures to respond to it and the failures to protect the most vulnerable communities among us. They were able to really frame that in ways um, that drew in larger numbers of people into many of the movements that I'm talking about. And the other thing is that the particular tactical innovations that have, that have really taken hold are related to very important parts of movement building that have, um, because of kind of the emergency nature of, of a lot of organizing these days, had been neglected. Things like mutual aid associations, which have gotten many more resources and the ability to organize emergency um, assistance to people living in one's neighborhood, food pantries, strike funds for those that wanted to walk out of their workplace um, because of uh, unsafe uh, working conditions, the ability to accumulate and distribute um, uh, PPE and different types of uh, emergency medical necessities, and lots of different neighborhood pods to try to help distribute tasks um, that were uh, of uh, necessity to people living in one's community. And these types of alternative institutions where people begin to um, organize in a way that uh, makes them have more power over their destiny um, are actually uh, really important in laying the groundwork for longer term sustained organizational transformation and mobilization. Um, and so it's no accident that the uh, mass mobilization that we've seen in the end of May and the beginning of uh, June and, and is still going on uh, related to the movement for Black Lives um, came in, in a context where not only are the, um, the grievances of the Black community in the United States so obvious and clear because of the intersection um, with the effects of COVID and um, the, the police brutality that took place and now the effects of the uh, economic recession, um, but also um, the, the types of communications that have been going on in communities between neighborhood associations lent themselves to wrap. Um, so to wrap up a little bit, uh, what I want to say is that it is clear that nonviolent resistance does not always work. Um, and many of the struggles that are underway today um, are up against incredibly difficult opponents. Um, with uh, huge amounts of resources and the status quo in their favor. But we also know that there has never been a progressive change that has occurred without nonviolent resistance. Um, and uh, so, in fact, we have already seen so many effects of uh, the movement for Black lives in the United States, concrete effects, and in some, in some cases, incredibly uh, kind of meaningful and, and costly concessions. Uh, for example, there are places all around the country that are now talking in um, very concrete terms about policies related to reparations, um, about policies related to reinvesting from policing and prisons into community-led uh, and community uh, participatory initiatives. We have seen voting participation increase um, in both primary and general elections. Um, for example, on June 2nd, uh, the week after uh, the current anti-racism uprisings uh, broke out. Um, in Ferguson, Missouri, Ella Young was elected the first black woman mayor, um, and uh, Cori Bush just won her primary uh, in uh, St. Louis to represent um, her district in Congress, uh, and she herself was uh, a veteran of the uh, Ferguson uprising um, and a product of grassroots organizing. Um, fundraising to Black-led organizations and Black-owned businesses has skyrocketed. Um, there has been a major shift in public opinion where a vast majority of Americans um, right now all across the country agree 
that uh, Black Lives Matter has an important claim to civil rights that has been unfulfilled and that police brutality is a major problem and it's not just a matter of bad apples and that um, major reforms need to take place, in fact, uh, to accommodate the legitimate demands of this movement. And uh, perhaps even uh, more importantly, millions of first-time activists all across the country have become active, inspired, and engaged in a conversation that is genuinely about reckoning with this society's original sin. So um, I just wanna leave you with um, uh, one final thought, which is the question of what, what can we do? Um, most of you are probably already doing quite a lot, and um, I am not in a position to give any suggestions. But uh, one thing that motivates me uh, is keeping in mind uh, the idea that the best way to predict the future is for us to choose it. Um, and uh, this uh, remarkable idea from Angela Davis which is that we do have to act as if it were possible to radically transform this world and we have to do it all the time. With that, I will um, stop and welcome conversation. Thank you so much, Erica. Thank you so much for um, such well-researched, thoughtful and powerful um, just words as it relates to nonviolent civil resistance and grassroots organizing. It's, Know, really um, powerful to even think about that we're at such a pivotal time in our lives and in our world, but also in history. We're kind of living, you know, our future. People will reflect back at this time and talk about what's happening now. You know, we're here living it. Um, right now, I want to invite Rivera Sun. We have quite a few questions coming in for you. Um, Rivera, welcome back, um, and we'll go ahead and make some time and space for some question and answers. Great, thank you so much, Erica, for this amazing presentation and for backing up all my earlier claims today with actual data, I love that. So thank you. you, you always do that for us in the movement and we love you for it. So speaking of a statistical data point, there's a couple questions that are coming up around that 3.5% number. Um, and, you know, first of all, you mentioned just a little while ago that six to nine percent of the U.S. population participated in the, the recent protests. So why didn't we have a massive revolution? Or maybe we did have changes get won. What's your take on the 3.5% mm -hmm. number and that particular statistic? And then I have another follow up on that for you. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, the, the three and a half percent statistics is based on basically a single day mass action. So it, it basically captures the peak participation on the biggest day of, of mobilization for a movement. Um, and we're still actually, my colleague Jeremy Pressman and I are still actually processing data from um, the Movement for Black Lives. We are almost finished entering June, but we still are working on entering data from June 6th and 7th, which was, appears to be the biggest weekend of, of the mobilization. And, um, and uh, we think it may have approached that three and a half percent number that day, but it's hard to know. Um, so the polling that was done by the Kaiser Family Foundation and a few others looked at whether people reported having participated in any protests over the last month um, up to then. So it's not exactly clear whether we hit that single day marker. That's just accumulated number. Um, but uh, for those that aren't familiar with the, the idea, um, there does seem to be a, a general rule of thumb that most, um, most countries achieve kind of revolutionary breakthroughs after mobilizing on a peak day, three and a half percent of the uh, of, of, of the national population. Um, one thing to know is that when when that number was observed there weren't any movements out there trying to meet a three and a half percent rule and so we don't actually know if when people are aiming for it like it's a goal post uh, whether there will be the same political dynamics because of course it's very hard to achieve that threshold that's like 11 and a half million people in the u.s um, but also if you're only trying to achieve that threshold without doing the political organizing and kind of um, uh, coalition building and, and developing a, a public claim um, that uh, becomes attractive to a, a broader part of the population. It's not clear that the numbers alone would, would win the political day. And does type of action matter to that 3.5%? Um, and a question that has come in that relates to that is about um, 
the role of mass arrests in terms of that. And we know the recent protests, we had about 10,000 arrests. Um, do, does the strategy of mass arrests uh, really help increase participation in the movement? Is it a detraction? What, what's your observation mm -hmm. about the role of that? Yeah, good question. So um, the first part of the question, um, well, I'll, I'll speak to the mass arrests piece first. Um, it, I'm not sure uh, the degree to which mass arrests um, always create a backfiring or a sense of um, sympathy for a movement. Uh, to me, it, uh, any form of state repression against the movement um, is, is uh, very risky for a movement to undertake because the movement is essentially gambling on um, the ability of that uh, brutality to appear excessive to a broader population that the movement doesn't already have on its side. And so it essentially has to, um, it has to make people sympathize who don't already sympathize with the movement. And so sometimes mass arrests might have that effect depending on who's arrested and, and what manner and for what claims and um, with what methods and other times that might not have the same impact. But, um, you know, at least in our counting, um, it's clear that ten, in fact, tens of thousands of people have been arrested over the past uh, two months um, related to this movement and many, many people have been injured as well. Um, but I would argue that the, the heavy handed state response is partially what has led it to be such a, a mass mobilization that has cut across so many different sectors of society. Uh, a question on that that relates is, uh, do you consider the, the Black Li that the Black Lives Matter organizations have adhered to nonviolent, uh, the question is, is about nonviolent principles, but even what about nonviolent action? What do you think about that? Yeah, our data basically look at every single uh, instance of crowd mobilization in the United States. We've been looking at these um, every day since uh, January of 2017. So we have a pretty good sense over time of how many injuries are associated with each event, whether injuries are police or protesters, whether there was property destruction, um, and how many arrests there were. So we look at this for every protest. We've got about 50,000 plus incidents in the database. And what I can say is that the, the, um, the mobilization around the movement for Black Lives, probably 98% of it has resulted in no injuries of any police and no property destruction of any kind by anybody associated with the movement. Um, it's probably an even higher proportion when all is said and done, when we've counted the, the protests that didn't make the news because they didn't have anything that was drawing um, uh, excessive attention to them. Um, and so uh, the idea that the movement has been, um, uh, uh, you know, more violent than violent is completely baseless. We have no empirical evidence to just the case. In fact, we have far more protesters, injuries, um, and as I mentioned, tens of thousands of people arrested with very, very few police officers being injured um, and very few events having any uh, registered incidents of property destruction. Great, thank you for the numbers on that. I, I know many people are confidia over playing some of those incidents. In the um, movements that you studied for why civil resistance works, you mentioned that 50% of the nonviolent mass resistance movements have succeeded over the past 120 years. Are there any common themes or lessons from the 50% that have not succeeded? How mm -hmm. can we learn from those? Yeah, um, so, Generally, movements um, don't succeed for the inverse reasons of why they do succeed. So um, it seems pretty clear that when movements can't, uh, can't grow their participation base or when their participation remains very homogenous, for example, they have all men or they have all people from one ethnic or racial group or one class, um, this can often be um, very difficult to develop the type of political levers that are necessary to, um, to create change. Um, the second thing they, they tend to um, have a tough time with is creating those defections. And so they think that by mobilizing large numbers of people, they'll convince others, uh, as opposed to trying to develop a strategy for pulling those pillars of support away from their opponent um, and kind of targeting um, uh, people in, in ways that uh, force them to reconsider their position um, and dis dislocate and dismantle those pillars. Um, the third reason is, um, is that uh, 
they they don't innovate or expand the number of techniques of nonviolent resistance. So um, one thing I've seen lately is maybe a, a tendency for some movements to rely exclusively on mass demonstrations instead of shifting to say stay at homes or, or general strikes um, as a method of resistance. Um, and uh, movements that only do mass demonstrations uh, tend to have a tough time um, staying together when repression starts to really intensify. Um, so those seem to be the main reasons um, why uh, campaigns tend to fail. I think the other thing is, is um, movements that tend to over rely on digital organizing techniques these days are much more vulnerable to surveillance and infiltration than was the case 10 years ago. Um, and also uh, governments have become much better at counter mobilizing their own supporters and their own propaganda through social media. Um, than was the case 10 years ago. So, um, so movements that are sort of aware of this and, and find multiple modes of communication, including in-person communication where people leave their cell phones at home um, is, is increasingly important. Uh, so a question came in, um, how do you do your research? What is the source of your data? Now, when you wrote Why Civil Resistance Works with Maria, you actually had to build a data, a comparative database, but you've mm -hmm. gone on to actually fairly revolutionize the way that we think about collecting data for resistance movements. Does it come mostly from news services? Uh, how reliable is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the data set um, that I was talking about the general global patterns from is one that, um, that I and my team update uh, basically every other year or so. It's called the NAVCO database. And um, that is uh, basically a consensus database where we review um, stories about different um, national histories. We look at existing databases of protests and state response, and we try to glean from that instances where there were mass campaigns that had revolutionary goals and where at least a thousand people participated. And then we dig deeper into the data, add a number of different characteristics and features. We control for a variety of factors related to the states that they're operating in and the time period. And uh, we come up with, right now there's about 628 cases in, in that database. Um, so that's peer reviewed and um, a lot of people have built on it or uh, built other databases that tweak some of the um, some of the coding decisions, but um, you know, it's, it's out there in public, it's uh, free for people to download. And obviously if people have uh, disputes about particular cases or they find an omission, um, we would love to hear about it because we try to keep it as high quality and as updated as possible. The data I was talking about in the United States comes from the Crowd Counting Consortium and that is uh, with Jeremy Pressman, who's a professor at U University of Connecticut. And that data come from a web crawl that happens every single day that uh, basically looks at every online newspaper in the United States, is about 3,300 newspapers, um, and sends us a report of data about protests and, um, and demonstrations around the country um, in, in various cities and localities. And then we also um, collect data from Twitter and Facebook manually with ourselves and our research team. And um, we occasionally get data from protest websites like you know, the climate strike. Um, they have a map that tells you where protests are. So we, we put those in our database. And then when we like, get a newspaper that tells us how many people showed up, that's when we type in an estimate. We always put in a low estimate and a high estimate. We look at the lowest reported number and the highest reported number. We put them both in the database and the data are always uh, only publicly verified sources and we include the sources in the data. So if you wanna look at them, they're at crowdcounting.org. We update them live and you can see uh, exactly how we enter the data. Great, well, you just answered uh, another question that came in about how they can get the data specifically on the uh, Black Lives Matter protests. Is, there, yeah. is that available there or they, should they look somewhere else? Yep, they can look at the, um, the crowdcounting.org data. Um, there was also a New York Times article that used the data. Um, it said uh, Black Lives Matter may be the largest movement in US history. It came out on July 6th. So if you click on that article, they did a nice infographic using the data. Um, so it's maybe prettier than what we have at our website. Great, thank you. I like pretty infographics too. Uh, so uh, someone asked this question about um, the data about low amounts of injury, deaths, et cetera, is amazingly low. 
uh, I think mm -hmm. in relationship to the recent protests, but the amount of property damage that some associate with Black Lives Matter and violent protests is very large. Um, how do we distinguish between nonviolent action that becomes associated with violence and damaging actions of others? So mm -hmm. I think the question is really like when those reports are overblown and it's starting to backfire on our movement, how can we counter that? How can we start to turn the tide on that narrative? Um, well, I would definitely ask a, a more seasoned uh, activist that question than me. But um, just from where I said, there's a couple of things uh, that, that researchers have looked at. Um, one is that it's definitely the case that when um, uh, that, that there is a, a media bias toward violent incidents. Um, and there's also even a tendency within mainstream media outlets or among journalists uh, to, um, to be ambiguous about who started the violence. Uh, so for example, if you're reading an article and it's, you'll very commonly see um, a journalist say clashes broke out between police and protesters. It's totally ambiguous who, you know, who was doing the clashing. Um, and in most cases, if you went back and observed the scene yourself, you could see that it was the protesters who uh, took the brunt of the, the violence in that instance. And so you might have written that article differently and specified the who, what, when, where, and how. Um, but I think um, that's just something that as, you know, as uh, people who are involved in these movements or who are studying these movements, we we are just constantly aware of that um, and making sure that movements um, have the uh, kind of, uh, they feel equipped to tell their own stories in compelling ways. And I, I think there's so many different training groups and, and people who are so skilled at that, um, that, that that's a really important investment for, for movements to make. And then the second piece is just more about not taking the bait. And I, I actually think that in this instance, um, I, I was kind of um, surprised that the, the week of like June 1st to, to June 7th didn't turn into a, a major public debate about what counts as violence and whether this is violence and whatever. It, it actually, there was maybe a day or two of that in kind of mainstream public discourse. But um, in this instance, the violence by the state, uh, meaning the federal government uh, and local police, was so overwhelming and so obvious in response to, to mostly peaceful protests the day before that that um, the, the uh, most most people uh, that I was watching from movements or local organizations speaking about this were kind of able to focus explicitly on the, the claims that were being made the fact that what this movement is about is is lawlessness on the part of police and police are um, brutalizing people and uh, and uh, basically able to keep the focus on on that legitimate claim, and so so much of that is about narrative control and uh, just being able to keep the focus on the claim and not being diverted into um, change what we're talking about, change the nature of the conversation. Um, and so that was a for me a very powerful learning in Black activists. Um, being able to speak so with such searing moral clarity about the nature of the problem right now. Wonderful. Well, there are a number of other questions that we're not going to have time to get to today. Every single one of these questions is completely worthy and fascinating. Um, but the, the question that I think we should look at just as a final question is, what do you see as the future of this research? Already this has been groundbreaking and so helpful for movements. So what's looming? What's, what's next? Yeah, well, so I have a book coming out this fall. It's called Civil Resistance, What Everyone Needs to Know. Um, and I hope this book is going to be much easier to read and maybe more fun to read than the book I wrote before, which I won't recommend anymore. <laughs> and then um, I'm actually writing a, another book called um, Rebel XX, Women at the Front Lines of Revolution with Zoe Marks. And that's the book in which we talk about this incredible pattern um, of the fact that not only do movements tend to win more often when they have high numbers of women visibly participating at the front lines, but also um, it's a major um, omitted variable um, in explaining the expansion of democracy through the 20th century, because most countries democratize after mass movements, um, and most of the movements that actually led to more egalitarian democracy were, um, were had very high uh, participation rates of women. 
uh, and women who play key roles in negotiating the terms of the post-revolutionary order. And um, as far as we know, nobody has talked about that before and uh, we think it's important. So um, we're working on a book and it, it'll be coming out hopefully in a year and a half or two. Well, I am already excited to read it. Thank you so much. Is there any one last, you know, 30 second closing thought? Uh, I don't think so. I think I'll have a chance to chit chat with folks later too, but um, I will look at the questions that people are asking and uh, if there's some that I can point people to quick resources to, I'll do that and I'll send it to Ryan um, and maybe he can post it on the website or get it to the conference participants somehow. Great. Thank you so much, Erica. You're such an important part of the movement for a culture of nonviolence and we're just glad to have you with us. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Rivera, for facilitating the question and answer. Again, everyone, uh, Erica will be back on um, in uh, just a, a little bit after Daniel shares, um, and Kazu will be facilitating that question and answer. So if you have a pressing question, you still have um, uh, some time to actually be present and to ask that question a little later. Um, so right now, we are going to watch a short video on Pache Bene's curriculum, Engaging Nonviolence. Wonderful, engaging nonviolence, and you can always find that at uh, pachebene.org. Next, we'll have Daniel Hunter, who will speak on sustaining campaigns and movements. Daniel is a training organizer with Training for Change, which practices a direct education style rooted in popular education. He is also the author of Building a Movement to End the New Jim Crow. 
Daniel, welcome to the conference. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, I wanted to say uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and um, as, as said, I'm going to talk about sustaining campaigns and movements. I'm a activist myself. I work with 350.org as a global trainer. And uh, I've been a community organizer. So I just have to admit right off the top, it's so weird to not get the chance to sort of see people and, and see the visual reactions. So I just want to honor that and, and appreciate everyone's just sort of flexibility and meeting in this way during this time. It's an unusual thing. So just thanks so much for inviting me to speak and thank you for everyone who's participating. And I also want to honor that all of this work, all of this knowledge and, and wisdom that has uh, already been shared and will continue to be shared through this conference, um, we really owe credit to our elders and ancestors. And so I just honor, uh, honor all those who came before us and particularly John Lewis today as someone who's still very much in my heart and mind. Um, so all the ancestors who helped us survive and thrive to be able to, to get here. So um, uh, I was asked to talk about sustaining campaign and movement. And somehow when I saw the language, it first came into my mind things like um, self-care tactics. So the sustenance of the individual. The, the, so uh, I started to go into like, oh, maybe that's what they have in their minds. Um, and I said, no, I don't want to do that. So uh, we won't talk about yoga and we won't talk about meditation. We don't talk about prayer or running, et cetera, et cetera. Beautiful things, lovely things. Of those, one of those I really love doing. Two of them I don't. That's an opportunity to just guess what will be. Um, but I want to just frame the question, what makes movements die or become irrelevant? So why do some campaigns take off and why do others just, just not become relevant? And I just want to invite you to think for a minute about what's your answer to that question? What are some of the different ingredients uh, that makes a, a movement uh, not take off? And um, I'm hoping in this, I, I'm trying to speak to the audience in front of me that I can't see, but I, I might try to be a little bit contentious and I hope that's all right. If, if you don't know me, uh, it's my way is to, where's the edge? That's, what, that's the part of me that's an activist. Where's the edge? And, Let's push a little bit on it. So um, I came with four particular things for this. I, I came with a long list, but I thought of four things that were really relevant. And so these, these echo actually some of what Erica just said. Erica talked about homogeneity as a theme um, and uh, relying on mass demos alone. So, so here's four that I came up with. So one is not really finding our source of power. So uh, I make the, the imaginary quote, let's just keep marching until everyone knows we're right. So the, the, the commitment to uh, sort of self-expression, whatever, whatever I believe, I'll just, I'll be a witness and just assume people will get it over time. And uh, it's been well experimented and, and has a pretty high failure rate. So a second is obsession with growth. Um, and I, I frame it around, uh, I, in this I have in my mind, capitalism loves growth. Bigger, 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 bigger. And uh, I work in an organization 350. We're also faster, faster, faster. We're, we're very attached to digital. And so we're often thinking, how do we keep growing? And I love growth. Don't get me wrong. But I think there becomes a point where we get obsessed with a particular version of that. Um, a third, tactile inflexibility. Uh, we have did that last time uh, and it didn't work. So let's do it again. Uh, maybe it'll be different this time. And a fourth being staying insular. So uh, there's a group that I've trained, and I kid you not, uh, there's a debate that broke out about one of them said, I'm an anarcho syndico communist, not a syndico anarcho communist. And they went at it for half an hour, 45 minutes. I didn't track the conversation, but I found it hilarious and sad. So I want to just kind of like dig into these four themes, knowing there's, there's lots of others um, that we could also come into. So not finding our source of power. So I think one thing I just want to start off with is some activists uh, still retain a kind of ambivalence about power because it has been such an abusive force. It's been used violently or, or we associate it with the kind of oppressive techniques. Um, and so one thing that, that sometimes leads us to is what I call the politics of self-expression. So rather than trying to make change, we, uh, we treat all of social change as an expression from my heart and my soul. And if I witness, then 
everyone else should see the light shining or maybe they won't see the light shining and they'll continue being you know not great but i've done my part which is to just express what's within so uh and i'm critiquing here and i i hope that's all right because i i wanted to say what what i see so one example of that is groups that i've run across who uh for example do commit themselves to a witness vigil every week no matter what here and day in day out and don't ever engage with other power holders or decision makers and it becomes simply about expressing what's in my heart and soul, which don't get me wrong, again, I love people expressing what's in their heart and soul. On the other hand, it's not a change strategy on its own. And therefore, it has to be part of an engagement. So uh, in that video that we just saw where they referenced King and Gandhi and Dorothy Day and, uh, and Cesar Chavez, those are all people who engage with power and they engage with decision makers. And so what that looked like for them, they all involved setting goals uh, that were sizable, chunks. So Cesar Chavez said, all right, we're gonna try to transform the way that labor is thought of in this country. Uh, and so we're gonna make this about an iconic campaign around grapes or Gandhi's salt march, which is taking a very big, large, almost impossible dream and finding a way to connect it to something that's meaningful, that touches people's lives. And, uh, and then they put pressure, they applied pressure on people. And uh, so it wasn't just we're, we're going to pray for their souls, but we would figure out a way, a strategy to do that. So I wanna give an example of that. So uh, I, I live in Philadelphia in the US and um, there's a group called Earthquaker Action Team. So Equate decided as a campaign, they, they, they said, we want to use the campaign model because they work with, it's predominantly Quaker, that, that's right in their name. And when I first began working with them, they said, what we've noticed is lots of, and I'm not, I love the Quakers. And what they noticed about their own community was that many in their community were uh, witnessers, where they would like take an issue and say, oh, great, let's run a petition. And then the next day they would do another thing and then another day and another thing and another day. And they, would, they just wouldn't stick on one thing over time. They just had many, many different issues that they would talk about. And meetings, meetings for example, would endorse, have long processes of should we endorse this campaign or this effort or not? And they said, we're not gonna do any of that. So they decided to make some strong statements to run up against their, or their, their sort of culture that they were coming out of where they said, look, we're never gonna do talks or presentations because we wanna be all about action. Whenever we show up, it's gonna be an action. If people say, meetings, for example, say, we wanna join, we wanna hear what you're up to, then we would say, great, come to our action that we're doing on such and such a date so that you get used to action, action, action. The second thing they said is they said, we're not gonna do endorsements of other campaigns or other movements or other issues. We care about them, but we're gonna talk about it through the context of our campaign. So through our effort, we'll, we'll like pick, uh, pick a particular campaign. And when you run a campaign, you can start talking about everything. It's, the intersectionality of things can come through, but it doesn't mean we have to go through long processes to decide do we endorse or not endorse. So uh, they decide that their first campaign would be around the issue of mountaintop removal coal mining. And uh, if you don't know, it's a terrible practice where you take a mountain, you blow off, you dynamite the top off, and then you begin layer by layer removing the mountain, dumping it into the river and uh, extracting coal. It's one of the most violent, destructive ways of getting coal, one of the dirtiest um, of the fossil fuels. So big issue. And they said, what's a place like a, a way that we can, in the, in, the, in the parlance of organizer, that we can cut the issue, way that we can find something that we can be meaningful, our great boycott, our, our salt march, our, what's something that, that we're connected to? And they realized as, after some research that one of the largest investors in mountaintop removal coal mining is a bank called PNC Bank, who just so happened to be historically a Quaker bank and had roots in this region. So they said to themselves, great, that's an available target for us to like apply pressure on. So they didn't go after all of mountain, mountaintop removal coal mine. They didn't even go after all of climate change. They said, what's a piece that we can do that we kind of build around? And so it's a way to motivate, connect, and build different kinds of connections and so on. 
So uh, just as an example of their, like, their action, how they decide to engage with power, um, this is a picture. Sorry, it's a little crummy because we had to kind of serendipitously do this. But um, what you see in front of you is uh, one of my colleagues, George Lakey, who's standing in front of um, the PNC shareholders meeting. And the tactic that we chanced on was we said, let's hold a meeting for worship consistent with Quaker value at the shareholders meeting where we would pray for their souls. And it would happen to be also a very interrupting kind of meeting because we would structure it in such a way so that it would be regular interruptions over time. So here's how it was structured. So you go into the shareholders meeting and uh, each, um, uh, as someone was called by the spirit to speak, and we had an order. So we had, I guess, I don't know, maybe the spirit had already decided the order, but so we had an order of people and each of the people would stand up and uh, say specifically to one of the people on the board um, of PNC uh, by name, you know, Nancy, we want to understand why are you still invested in mountaintop removal coal mining? Don't you know? And they would speak their mind about this. And security, as you might have guessed, would sort of huddle along and try to like get to that person and you shh, you can't speak, you can't speak. And when that person felt it was time, then they would sit down. And then the crew of uh, equators would all sing, uh, which side are you on? Which side are you on? And sing that to each of the board members. And then there would be another moment of silence from our perspective. The other meeting was still trying to happen. And then another person would speak and another and another and another and another. And um, it was a disruptive tactic on their behavior, on their, th their goals. It was, it was getting in the gears of the running of that, that um, uh, shareholders meeting. Very annoying. They took under 15 minutes to run the whole meeting because they were so annoyed. So it was the shortest PNC meeting they'd ever had. They halted it. They changed all the different policies. And this was how Equate moved, tactic by tactic, ongoing, ongoing, kept shaking up different things so that PNC never quite knew what we were gonna do next. And we kept doing, we did marches and long things, but ongoing pressure. So one of the ways that we can shoot ourselves in the foot as movements is we're so big, we ask for end of nuclear war or the commitment for, or no injustice anywhere or something that th nobody really knows what steps do they need to do. And instead we said, what's the specific target that we can apply pressure on and boom, we're gonna let them know, here's what needs to happen. So um, another, another one that I mentioned is an obsession with growth. And uh, I'll, 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 I'll take it this way actually, which is one thing I've seen is activist organizers, uh, taking Erica's 3.5% number and then instituting it as that's, that's our fundamental goal. We need to just reach that number. And if we reach that number, then we'll, ha, it will happen. And uh, I think I, I wrote, wrote recently about this in Waging Nonviolence um, and uh, I'll just read aloud. Movements have to be very careful about what yardsticks that we use to measure success. Capitalism teaches shareholders to look at how much money has been made, how many new plants have been opened. The goal is constant growth, and that's not a good yardstick for movements. The most obvious way to sink into our thinking is when we ask ourselves, are the number of protests growing? Are there more people in the street? Is more money income coming into movement organizations? And movement success shouldn't be measured that way. And I wrote this specifically about Black Lives Matter at this moment in time, though it applies to many movements, which is numbers go up and down. And there's not a consistent trajectory about growth as a kind of like, we just keep going up and up and up. In fact, we're reaching a moment when Black Lives Matter, we sort of seen a peak and there will be a, a natural decrease, which doesn't mean the movement effectiveness is necessarily gone down with it. And that's because you can't displace huge populations for such an extended period of time. At some point, people need to go back to their quote, normal lives, even under a pandemic, people need to go shopping. So, um, uh, so I think other measurements are also important. I, I think I'm trying to add, not remove, but that if we get obsessed with just that kind of measurement, we miss other yardsticks. So for example, how much are people being persuaded 
uh, about the fact that there's a problem, which is if we charted, you know, just a number of years ago when people were wondering openly in the U.S., uh, is has the U.S. when we've gotten Obama as a president, has the U.S. turned its corner on black-white relations in the U.S.? And that question showed such vast ignorance of where we are in this country. And so the fact that we could ask that question meant we need to start by convincing people, mainstream people, white people, that there really is a fundamental problem still. And Black Lives Matter has done that. And then, there, and then we have to convince uh, mainstream people yet again that uh, the current solutions, the current, the, the current options on the table that the current system has are insufficient. That, it, that there isn't a kind of natural growth curve where the US is just getting better and better and better. We, we actually have to organize pressure, push for it, et cetera. Um, and, and then the third is to actually, we need to convince people to embrace our alternatives. So we're currently in a debate about which, which of the different sets of alternatives do we wanna push? Are we into defunding police? Does that mean the removal of all police? Does that mean we're instituting alternative police systems? Does it mean, does it mean, does it mean? And uh, that's a great debate. I love that movements are now being able to, to focus on uh, that kind of, uh, of a debate. And our measurement isn't just how many people are in the streets. It becomes also about this question of how many people are convinced about these different uh, solutions. How many people get that there's a problem? How many people, et cetera. And, uh, and so just checking like how many people do we have on our Twitter feed or how many people do we have sometimes can get us really confused about, uh, I think, some of those pieces. Um, one example of how it's like showed up in my life was, so I was part of a group trying to start, stop the Iraq war. Uh, this was what, 2003. Um, so these were, uh, these are not actually pictures from our protests. I was trying to find them, but couldn't, but the last one is. But the, so initially we organized a march of, uh, well, the first march was about 150 people. And then the second march that came out was 2,000 people, uh, which is like a, a few weeks later, which is a big number. Um, we got a lot of press coverage. It was part of a national series of demonstrations. Um, and uh, so the group that was organizing it, we said, okay, well, that was really great. What should we do next? There was a debate where my friend Martin Wiley and Clarissa Rogers said, you know what we should do? We should really get, we should do some cultural events and we should do, bring in some music and da da da, da. And it was shot down by uh, a number of, of organizers who said, no, we, we know it works. We just need to get more people on the street. So let's do it again and we'll just do more outreach and da 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 da. And so this time they got 10,000 people on the street, which is huge. My friend Martin Wiley uh, was one of the MCs of the rally, pulled me up, we like co emceed it together. It was largest march that had happened in Philly in quite some time, really exciting. So what do we do next? Well, the argument was if, you know, we got 50, you know, 150 to, to 2000 to 10,000, the next step is to make it even bigger. And so we, we obsessed ourselves about this particular kind of growth and so what we lost was all the other kinds of growth that could happen. So we had 10,000 people on the street, but we did not have a depth of relationship with them. We had 10,000 people on the street, but we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't, hadn't done a lot of political education. We hadn't brought people in, so they didn't know uh, what, are, what are some of the different arguments for this. They didn't know, we didn't teach them about social change. So we didn't do nonviolence trainings for them. So they didn't understand the mechanisms of growth as it kind of arc, arcs and small, goes down. We didn't talk about escalation. So there's no tactical uh, consideration. It was just the same action over and over again. And uh, the result, uh, the next time after the 10,000 March, we got about 1,500 people uh, turned out for the March, which reporters called devastating and said, proof that people don't really care. Uh, it's not really a big issue. Uh, we felt bad. So we said, what should we do next? We did another march. And uh, yeah, that was, that was really pitiful. It was a couple hundred. It was pretty, pretty sad, sorry state. So we didn't have a plan. And uh, we, we had one version of growth, but we didn't have a kind of tactical ingenuity about it. So um, tactical inflexibility. 
as a, another piece. So what sustains us is when we're tactically flexible. So what you see in here is a picture of someone who's marching and uh, it's the same, the same thing, another march, another march, another march, another march. And it's endless action. There's, there's no sense of, of arc or story. It's, it becomes really about just how many people did you turn out this time, et cetera. So an example um, that I'm working right now with a lot of youth climate strikers, actually that image comes from a book that I wrote specifically for them. Um, and uh, climate strikers have really dedicated themselves to one particular uh, one particular tactic. I mean, it's in the name, uh, right? <laughs> we're climate and we're striking. Um, and, uh, and so we really needed to figure out uh, how do we do a different kind of escalation. Um, and, uh, and so rather than just having the same tactic, we needed to find some different ways about escalation. So, uh, this is a different arc. So I, I talk about the idea of a campaign where it's not just um, to your sort of question, Veronica, it's not just about we do one action after another and we hope more and more people get involved. We also have to become more uh, escalated in how our behavior recruits new people and also gets in the gears of the system. So said another way, marches as a particular tactic, uh, power holders can say, if we wait this out, will that energy disappear? And if the answer is yes, then most, most opponents, if they have any smarts inside of them, will wait it out. Therefore, we have to come up with different tactics that uh, aren't just like, really, marches are symbol. They're symbolic of how many people believe this particular thing. But we need to do more than just about belief. So I'll, I'll give an example of that. So, uh, I was, I'm, uh, like I said, in Philly, we were involved in a campaign fighting casinos uh, here in the city of Philadelphia. And um, oof, when we started, uh, it was ugly. We, we were, 80% um, of people believed casinos would be a good thing because they would bring jobs and revenue. That's what everyone told, jobs, revenue, jobs, revenue, jobs, revenue, jobs, revenue. And one of my friends, uh, Jethro Heiko, he lives uh, 250 feet from the, one of the proposed casino sites, Sugar House Casino, or five proposed casino sites, all of them in, all of them in poor neighborhoods, one of them in uh, right around the corner from a school, another one right around the corner from an addiction treatment center. And we already felt behind the times because the casinos had, they had effectively, from our perspective, bought out everybody. They bought out judges, council members, mayor, governor, everybody was solidly uh, exposed, uh, you know, against us. So what we needed to do was we needed to figure out some way to recruit, organize, gather, get people involved. So we came up with this strategy. We decided to not take an anti-casino campaign from the get-go. We were worried that um, if people just saw, um, uh, just saw us as anti-casino, they could get turned off right away. So he said, what's a widely shared value that's being violated right now in the process of casinos? What we identified was, while this process was ongoing, people couldn't see, like, so, you know, if any one of you were in Philly, you, and, and the casino was right across the street from you, you couldn't find out updated site plans, traffic plans, impact studies, economic studies, environmental impact, any of that. All those studies were made, were kept hidden by the game controller because they were moving so quickly. So we said, well, that's a widely shared value that even if you're not anti-casino, you can get behind it. So what we said was, we want everybody to uh, join us in asking for the uh, casino plans, all these documents to be made public. Now we said, it's not, you can't just do a demand like that without being interesting or having a, if, you, if we do this, then that. So the if this, then that came to play, or we said, if you don't give us the documents, uh, then uh, we will go to the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board offices and we will take them ourselves. We will do a nonviolent search and seizure on you. Which raised a lot of questions in people's minds, like what is a nonviolent search and seizure? How would you do it? Which we loved because it becomes interesting. 
if I organize a march, people say, oh, when, when is it? Maybe I'll check my calendar. But we said, so we want you to join us to do a non-violent search and seizure. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, we want you to go release these documents that you think should be made public. I'm sorry, how? Media would have the same question. They would say, how would, how would this happen? And we would be very sly with them and we'd say, uh, well, you'll find out. <laughs> so um, we developed actually a whole campaign around this uh, that we called Operation Transparency. I'm not sure how well you can see all of this, but I just want to give you a sense that we wanted transparency, so we were completely transparent with them. And so uh, we decided to uh, organize uh, a series of actions, make it really public. So leading up to this nonviolent do document search, we would give them a whole month to do the right thing. We had been totally open, and so we'd give them a chance to totally do the right thing. And so what we decided to do was we would uh, wait and uh, see if, um, do a series, excuse me, do a series of different actions. So for example, one action that we did is we went to the um, gaming, control board, gaming control board headquarters uh, that was in, it's just outside of Pittsburgh or somewhere. Anyway, we went to the headquarters and we took um, buckets and we went to wash their windows, uh, you know, to help them become more transparent. And so uh, we would do, what was another one? We went to, we did a practice document search uh, outside of one of the hearings uh, where people weren't allowed to speak. Um, and uh, so it was public hearings where the public couldn't speak. It's just a, another slight of democracy. So we, we did practice search outside where we would um, uh, bring our magnifying glasses, which is our like iconic image, and we would, uh, a cost is too uh, aggressive a word, but, but let's just say a cost. We'd cost all the folks who are coming into the hearing and ask them like, do, do you have the casino planning documents? Do you have them available? And so we'd like do this to all of them. And we like, it was lighthearted. We played Pink Panther in the background and we play like old spy music and I spy and various stuff. So, you know, we're lighthearted. And I remember one of my friends, um, she was really good at doing this and went up to this one guy and, he was a lawyer uh, with one of the casino companies. Uh, and he said, no, 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 I've, I've never seen them. And he like clutched his briefcase and like ran in. So we were light, that was our style. We were pranksters. We were building up uh, a thing. At the same time, and this goes to one of the questions here is, at the same time, we were also trying to diversify the movement by appealing to the different interests. So we, we framed ourselves as good government to try to grab the good government people. We were trying our best to pull media into it by identifying with a value that they also shared, which is access to good and good uh, data. There's nothing more important for uh, for folks than that. So we wanted to uh, get that. So in each of those, um, I I want to just like mark like we're trying different things to sustain, um, and so uh, I wanted to like march like some of these different tactics that we wanted to do. So we wanted to like stay creative tactically, not get caught in a box. We wanted to um, uh, in innovate our own tactics and our strategy. And we wanted to like develop a, a kind of campaign. So uh, I put some tools, um, just because I mentioned different, different campaigns really briefly. Um, and uh, I just like any of those tools and cases that I mentioned, I have some pieces about it. Um, and Eric's also, uh, commented and, and add some of those that are on waging nonviolence as well. Um, so sorry for running over time a little bit there. I, I missed the, the chat there, Eric. Um, and uh, sorry, Ryan, and I will um, stop there uh, and we'll like dig into it with, um, I'm really excited to get to chat with, with Eric about this. Yeah, wonderful, Daniel, wonderful. Thank you so much for um, such practical information on sustaining campaigns, movements, tactics, and also bringing in your personal examples. Um, they were really, they really um, helped to bring things to life for us. So thank you so much. Um, so right now we will um, move forward with a question and answer. And we invite Erica and Kazu will be facilitating. Um, so we're invite Erica back with Daniel and Kazu will facilitate the conversation. So we welcome um, anyone on the call on the conference to ask your question in the Q&A section of the chat. Thank you so much, Kit, and thank you, Erica and Daniel, for all of your wisdom. Um, we already have lots of great questions coming in that we're not going to have, we're just not going to have time to get to. 
So I'm just going to dive right in and let's get through as many as we can, starting with uh, a big question for both of you, which is actually a question that came up earlier in the conference that I wanted to get everyone's thoughts on, really, is there's a lot of concern starting to raise about potential violence breaking out after the, the, the elections here in November and would love to hear your thoughts on um, how should activist movements be preparing for that? And if violence does break out, then what becomes the role of advocates for nonviolence? So let's start there. Daniel, do you want to start with that incredibly easy question? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll say two things. Uh, one is, fortunately, there's been a lot of research over the past five or so years about um, nonviolent resistance in the context of mass violence. Um, and so there's kind of an increasing empirical base from which to say that um, in even all out wartime environments, people still find incredibly innovative ways to, um, to use nonviolent techniques, both to protect themselves and their communities from violence and to try to create um, meaningful change. Um, some of the lessons that come from that are that um, a lot of the forms of nonviolent resistance turn into more survival, kind of collective survival techniques and violence management techniques, um, and then also uh, mutual aid and negotiation or, or, um, or um, dialoguing with various groups that are active in, in, in this setting. Um, you know, honestly, I think um, for me, the, the second major uh, thing to think about is just more people attending and participating in nonviolent action trainings um, would be always a good thing for our country, but maybe especially good now. Um, and so, you know, when I'm giving talks with, um, with my students, for example, um, most of what I'm recommending to them is to find a, a, a group in their communities that they can contribute to. Um, and be of service and to attend nonviolent trainings, nonviolent action trainings right now to build capacity for that. Yeah, I'll just add, I, I think there's a couple of aspects of it, which is um, one is handling our fear, um, which is I, I don't think, it, I think we are, like 2020 is a great year to just kind of like believe anything is possible and whatever fears you had can kind of like grow. So. Uh, I totally like can get behind that. And I think it's good for us to sort of stay really rooted in the, the possibility, the practicality, the, um, uh, and I think there are some real like pros and cons. And so I, I want us to just like balance our, our own temper, our own fear. Cause I think one place that leads us to really bad strategy is getting really fearful and then paralyzed. And so as Erica says, like, I think getting connected with other organizations who are also thinking through this question um, and also just other people, even if they're not yet thinking through this question, because um, when something hits, uh, I think that that's going to be part of it. And I just want to mark, there's, there's, a, there's a series of questions here about how do we contrast ourselves from violence? And I think a different category of question that I think might be more useful strategically is how do you uh, connect with the underlying reason for that violence? And so violence erupts when people are angry, frustrated, and don't have an outlet. And so if we keep contrasting ourselves from that and we say, ah, you're that, we're this, then it doesn't provide an opportunity to connect. So just a quick example from my campaign that I referenced in the casinos, we had a moment where uh, some of our people got beat up and some of our people said we should beat up the other people and da da da. So we began to like, escalate into violence. And I took that strategically as a mistake that I had not given my people enough expression of their frustration and that the frustration had mounted without an outlet that people felt was useful enough. And when I looked back and scanned at what are the different actions that we had done, we had done a series of non-confrontational actions one after another after another. And we hadn't given people an opportunity to do an action that felt meaningful and com confrontive. And so another way to answer the question that sort of seems thematic here about nonviolence is how do we get ahead of the emotional state that causes people to go into violence more effectively with more frequency so that we can grab and support and connect with that energy 
in a meaningful way and channel it as opposed to what I see on the way these frames are good questions are asked, which is to contrast. Thank you so much to both of you for that. So it sounds like lots of work that needs to happen before the violence breaks out as well. Um, Erica, I wanted to ask, you know, the, the one piece of your research that I think a lot of people take away is that three and a half percent and the, the, the transformational powers that is possible when you can mobilize the millions of people. Um, and yet yeah, Daniel was also talking about the dangers of not getting too attached to numbers as like the, 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 the only thing that we need to be worrying about. So I'm wondering if you can just talk to us a little bit about the, the relationship between the, the, the possibilities that happen when there is mass mobilization without getting too attached to those numbers. Yeah, so I mean, I, I wouldn't do, I, I have no disagreement with Daniel. I, I think everything that he said is an important qualification to what really is a descriptive statistic from the historical pattern. It's not a prescriptive statistic, right? It's not telling us what we ought to do. It's telling us what has tended to happen in the past. Um, and I think it is useful in the sense that, um, for, for, from what I understand, the reason why it, um, it makes the rounds in a lot of activist circles is because it gives people a sense that it's possible, right? Like that they don't actually have to mobilize 60% of the population, that they can get a, a group of core people involved who are committed in active modes of participation um, that is a, achievable. Um, to, and, and, and feels a little more doable. So I think that's part of why it resonates. Um, but given that, I, I still think it's really important to think about all of the things that Daniel brought up and, and just talking about like um, the reason why um, that has seemed to be a critical threshold is because it seems to take that many people in order to create the types of political leverage points and the kind of uh, access points to people in positions of power and influence and start to change their behavior. It's not that people just went to the streets and everything collapsed. It's usually that it, it, it sort of initiated a process of political transformation. Sometimes be, exactly because that was the plan all along for these movements, like they were building relationships with um, people that um, resided in different kind of pillars of support or um, they were kind of um, using a, a longer term political plan, building a base of supporters, getting new coalition partners on board and targeting coalition partners that could help them get access to constituencies that they didn't before have access to. So, um, so that, that's what's powerful about it. The other thing I would say is that the, the, number, the number is limited to the sort of scope of cases that I've talked about, these sort of revolutionary campaigns that we're seeking to overthrow the government or territorial independence. And we just don't have data on other types of campaigns. I don't know that there's any reason why it wouldn't also apply to many other types of campaigns, but we also, uh, we would be basically trying to extrapolate um, from a really specific set of cases to make that leap. Uh, so that's just a couple of cautionary updates about the rule. Um, and like I said, I think everything that Daniel said, I, I would agree with in terms of the way the rule can be kind of misconstrued or, or misappropriated in a way. And I just wanna say one thing that's so, in addition to what you just said, one thing that's also so helpful about just having the number in addition to the sense of like, there's something to shoot for, is it also, it also both makes realistic the sense, but it also raises the bar for people who I think sometimes when we, we sort of say like grassroots or mass movement, but there's not um, an ambitious quality to that. We sort of say that we get, um, we on the left can get lazy and say, grassroots people know that dot, 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 dot. And polling doesn't bear that out and actual research doesn't bear it out, but we can say it. And so that also gives us an ambitious number to work with which I think is part of the, the beautiful part of it. I think it's just confusing when we, when we repeat it as, I think it will actually shoot Black Lives Matter in the foot for some of the organizers behind the scenes who know that number and then say, I think we might've reached that number or gotten X, Y, Z close to it. And if we've reached that number, why then didn't we win? And I think that's actually where we have to have a bigger conversation about how winning for a movement is never what you think it's going to be. It's never your full dream. Winning for a movement is, it's always reformist, even as revolutionaries you want it to be, because you, once you're in the movement, you always see the next thing. 
Um, and I think that's, that's a beautiful thing of being an activist. And I think that's psychologically, we just have to help people manage that, that rhythm and rhyme. Thank you. Um, this next question came up uh, during your presentation, Daniel, but I would also welcome uh, both of your thoughts on it, is just the importance of selecting strategic targets. Daniel, in your presentation, you talked about um, selecting PNC Bank because it had very strategic uh, reasons for, for that being the target. And I'm curious for, to hear from both of you, just like the importance of selecting strategic targets of actions and what might be some strategic targets that the, the movement for Black Lives can really focus on in, the, in, in this moment. I think there's, um, well, I'll say this, which is, uh, I think that on the left, we've, we've regularly gone for targeting uh, politicians that are well known. And I think that does us a disservice by not catching the range of things. And so politically, this is me speaking politically here. I think, for example, when we're asking for, like in the Equate campaign, we very intentionally said, we won't go after politicians because that's not where the money is. We wanna go where the money is, and that's in banks. So that's like one, one example of like a political value on targeting. Another one was we said, people often keep looking upwards, federally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we actually wanna give people a greater sense of efficacy and power, um, and so having more local campaigns. So with Black Lives Matter, like some of my conversations with Movement for Black Lives Matter leaders has been supporting them to, to keep their direction around localized campaigns, so city-based campaigns, which is pretty consistent with how policing are set up in some regards, but doing a lot of city local campaigns, both because it, it builds your capacity more quickly, also because that's where a lot of targets are, but, but just speaking psychologically, when, when we go after targets that are so large and have tons of people going after them all the time, if we go after Biden on our issue as a small group in Philly, we feel it reinforces our sense of powerlessness versus taking targets that are more local to us that we feel like we can get some, some handles on. Uh, so that would be an example, uh, just also seeding to like Veronica's earlier question around how do we get, uh, how do we do with mass protests in the US? Um, we just targeted Bush and we didn't have another set of targets to work with. Yeah, I, I think I would say that um you know, the, the, the types of demands that the Movement for Black Lives is making, if you look at the platform, are just really comprehensive and s systemic um, and cover many different dimensions of Black life. And so, you know, many of these are going to be local-based claims um, and local campaigns around how communities want to relate to local law enforcement or whether they don't want local law enforcement and they want to redesign that from the ground up. And I think there's going to be a ton of variation nationwide and how local groups choose to go about that. And I think that there is deliberate scope um, in the demand nationally for that to happen. And, is, and, and so that's really important. And then there are other uh, types of claims that will require more federal level or even um, state level types of uh, reforms or changes as well. And so, um, you know, I really think people who are, um, who are organizing have a good sense of, uh, of what they need in their communities where they're at. And so I don't, I, I wouldn't say that there needs to be like a one size fits all strategy for the movement for black lives. I think people have at the local level. Thank you. And Erica um, just sent us a link to an article that she wrote on this as well. Um, there's also a, a tool called Points of Intervention, which I find to be a very helpful tool in, in designing uh, campaigns and finding targets. Um, Erica, this is a question for you, but also would welcome Daniel's response. How do we deal with all of the right wing populist movements that are racist and non progressive that are learning from the nonviolent tactics and mobilizing of labor, women's rights, democratizing movements? Uh, there's large numbers uh, of, of this kind of thing happening and pushing back in many countries of the world, including the US. Yeah, I, there was a couple articles in the New York Times lately by a, a German uh, journalist named Katrin Benholt um, talking about. Um, uh, 
a couple of neo-Nazi groups in Germany who read Jean Sharp and um, Stellan van Hagen and have all the books on the bookshelf and are trying to figure out ways to implement strategies of nonviolent uh, resistance to expand their base of supporters. And so, you know, this is one of the, I think, very legitimate critiques of the way that some of the literature on nonviolent resistance has developed, sort of detached from underlying moral questions and, um, and philosophical aspects of the conversation around nonviolence. And I think it's deeply concerning that a lot of the different insights that are produced around the strategic logic of this are being appropriated by groups that want to use these techniques to suppress and, and destroy other people. So, um, you know, I, I think that's an extreme example. And then there are lots of other examples where counter mobilization is taking place, um, both in terms of right wing populism, but in terms of all kinds of other kind of policy areas as well, where there's been a lot of reversals regarding progressive outcomes. And, um, you know, uh, as far as I can tell, the, the main strategy um, uh, is one where uh, certainly where there are uh, successes that are going on uh, in terms of counter mobilization. Those are also things that can be watched and learned from uh, movements, uh, progressive movements to sort of turn the tables later on. Um, there are plenty of, of uh, examples where um, kind of progressive movements developed and successfully outmaneuvered right-wing movements. This is the case um, in Scandinavia. George Lakey has written a book uh, and a couple of really helpful articles at Waging Nonviolence about um, the ability of, of progressive movements in the mid 20th century in Norway, for example, um, to outmaneuver um, fascist movements there basically. Um, but I also think that um, there's a really important point of just totally outnumbering these groups on every occasion possible, right? So in Boston, a couple of years ago, there was a there was an attempt to have kind of a unite the right like rally uh, in Boston Common um, by a number of white supremacists, and I think about a hundred of them showed up, and ten thousand people showed up to counter protest. And you know, they were. I think that um, that the the problem is this has to happen pretty consistently, and it just has to happen over and over again. Um, but um, if it does, like they, they just can't expand their base, and and um, and it's it's uh, it's sort of you know it's true that numbers aren't everything, but numbers can be very important shows of force in key moments like that, and and so um, that that's the main strategy that I have to offer. Thank you. And we just have a few minutes. So I want to close with one last question for both of you. Um, you know, Daniel, one of the things that I love about your work and, and reading your book strategy and so is just the creativity. And you, you very briefly talked about the campaign around the, the casino. And I believe it was in that campaign where you made an agreement that you weren't going to do any marches or rallies, right, to like force creativity and creative tactics. And I think Rivera earlier did an amazing job summarizing some of the more creative actions that have been happening. But I just want to end with, with hearing from both of you, like what are some of your favorite creative actions that you've been part of or that you've seen recently to inspire us to kind of think outside the box of what we can do, especially in times of COVID? Um, you know, I always freeze when I get asked that question that way because I always think in context for something. So one of my actions that just occurs to me right now is uh, I, I really just appreciate that the same action can be done with so many different tones. So I was doing, I was part of, you mentioned the casino campaign and city council had done everything we wanted them to do for a while. And we didn't really believe them, uh, but we just wanted to like, I don't know, you know the term frenemy, like the friend that's your enemy, like it, th that's how our relationship was with them. So we decided that we would um, go to city council and we would um, give them awards for standing with the people. And we would do this by taking over city council and seizing control from the speaker in order to control the meeting. So that's what we did. So we went and we took over the meeting and thanked city council for what they were doing. And it was this, uh, I don't know if y'all are cursing people, I, I am. So it was this double bind. It was this like, there's a million ways to say fuck you is the, the way that uh, one of our organizers talked about it. And so I just appreciated that around, we can have a lot of different ways to do an action and the tone that we can hold can be one that can be both in that moment, it was both 
light and loving with our council members and also very clear in communicating with them, this is our city council. And so I think actions like that, that are clear, it's ours rather than waiting around for city council to do something. I guess I don't have too many um, good examples off the top of my head in terms of specific tactical innovations, but I will say that, especially during the pandemic, um, one of the big concerns was just the, the, the inability to hold street demonstrations, as I mentioned. So a couple of colleagues and I started to collect data on other forms of nonviolent action or innovations that were taking place. And very quickly, our list exceeded 100 examples. They were things like car caravans, and the most prominent form of uh, mobilization was around mutual aid. And um, that's really important because it does show um, the ability of people to form lasting connective relationships where they're taking care of one another. And that can lead to so many other types of really important tactical innovations later on. Awesome. Thank you both so much for not just your wisdom that you share with us today, but all of the work that you've been doing uh, over these years. And I'll hand the mic back to Kit. You both. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kazu. Thank you again, Erica and, and Daniel. Okay, so we'll move forward with Ken, but again, I'm sharing on gathering the wisdom for a nonviolent shift. Dr. Ken Budigan is a leading teacher, advocate, and strategist of nonviolence. He has worked for decades with many social change movements and currently is Pachavene's chief strategist for his campaign nonviolent National Week of Action. He teaches in the Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies program at DePaul University in Chicago and has public se published several books, including most recently, Nonviolent Lives. Ken, welcome. Thank you so much, Kit. We so uh, appreciate um, this incredible day and what, um, what we've been learning. So what have we learned today? There's a lot of great news. The first piece of great news is that we're rooted in infinite love. There's the great news that we can decide for a life for all and the well-being of all. There's a great news that we can finally deal with our core trauma as people and as a nation and as a world. There's the great news that inmates are our great nonviolence teachers. There's the great news that schools can be schools for nonviolence. There's the great news that the largest movement in human history has happened, certainly in the United States, and that it's a prelude for what's coming. There's the great news of a call from our indigenous sisters and brothers that they await a great movement where all of us connect the dots. There's the great news that this is the time for the silos uh, to come down. There's the great news that women often ignored or overlooked are actually the leaders of many of the great movements in our time and in history. And that uh, nonviolent movements are more effective than we're often led to believe. And the recent uh, demonstrations that have been happening across the country and around the world have been at least 98% nonviolent. And there's the great news that we can sustain our movements. There's even the great news that hundreds of people will set aside a whole day to get training and deepening in active, creative, liberating nonviolence. So what does this great news help us do? It helps reinforce the fact that we have more power than we think. It reinforces the fact that we are on the threshold of the greatest, the next greatest nonviolent movement in history because we have to go from the unjust normal uh, illuminated both by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, inescapable view of white supremacy and racism in this country and around the world. We have the great news to, that we can respond to this and we have the power to do that. 
So at Pace Bene in 2014, many of us had been involved in single issue campaigns for, for decades around a lot of different issues. But we decided, let's connect the dots in that spirit that Sherry Mitchell and Reverend Lennox Yearwood shared with us today. How do we connect those dots so that we come together in a movement of movements? And out of that came this vision of campaign nonviolence. And we said, let's set aside a week uh, every year in September, anchored by the International Day of Peace, to uh, bring all of this attention on building a culture of peace and nonviolence free from war, poverty, racism, and environmental destruction. We'll do work the rest of the year, but com we'll come together to call for that, that culture of peace. And the first year we had 240 events, and this past September, 3,300. And right now we're looking forward to this September. Uh, and we invite you all to be part of those efforts that, that uh, Campaign Nonviolence Action Week, third week of September. Uh, we're at 3,000 uh, actions so far. And uh, in the sense that we heard both from Daniel and from Rivera, uh, they're being um, beautifully uh, challenged to be as creative tactically as possible in light of the uh, pandemic and many other things. And so we encourage you to be part of those actions. And I just want to give a big shout out to our fabulous host today, Dr. Kit Evans Ford, who, as she explained at the beginning, uh, uh, has been working tirelessly with Pache Bene for 10 years now. And, uh, and for the last several years, actually for about five years, has been organizing the outreach around the Campaign Nonviolence Week of Actions, just as she's doing this year. So thanks so much for Kit, Kit for all that incredible, incredible work. Please go to our website. Uh, if you have not already committed to doing an action, uh, Campaign Nonviolence Week, please uh, really reflect on that and be part of it. Um, we have a very mysterious future ahead. We do not know what will come with this election. And some of us have been thinking of a contingency plan in case a certain resident of the White House decides to overstay his, his uh, welcome if, if he's not uh, reelected. And so we, we are going to be need, needing to be nimble and creative and deeply nonviolent to help uh, show the contrast with a, a system of violence and injustice. We're very grateful that you all participated today. Very grateful for all the speakers and the presenters and the panelists and people who led the conversations. Um, I also want to give a shout out to Ryan Hall and Aaron Bechtel uh, and uh, Robert Farrell who were behind the scenes and actually spent months uh, making, making this possible. We have more power than we think and uh, uh, it's just so exciting to be with you all day and uh, onward. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. All right, so closing, um, we have George Martin sharing about moving forward. George is a leading justice, peace, and climate organizer, educator, and trainer. George Martin has worked with more than 100 organizations. He has served as a national co-chair of United for Peace and Justice and was the recipient of the Peace and Justice Studies Association Social Courage Award. George lives in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Welcome, George. Hi, George. Hi, we're starting all over again. There we go. Hello, oh, it's good to see you. Welcome. Hey, hey. What a great conference we're having. Our Pache Benny Campaign Nonviolence continues to work for a new culture of nonviolence free from war, poverty, racism, and environmental destruction. We share this vision and our tools of nonviolent change. They are trainings and speakers, books and study groups, nonviolent cities, podcasts, blog and YouTube channel, and the Week of Action. All that I'm talking about today can be found at pachebene.org. Trainings help unleash the power of nonviolent change in our lives. 
using storytelling, exercises, role plays, small and large group discussions, short presentations, and journaling. These workshops explore the vision, principles, and concrete tools of active nonviolence. Our speakers are available to present in local communities on the power and principles of nonviolence. Speaking events can be tailored to your needs. Speakers include John Deere, Kit Evans Ford, Terrence Ryan, and Kit Bu Ken Buttigan. We publish books, manuals, and other resources on the power and practice of active nonviolence. One of our newest is Engaging Nonviolence, Activating Nonviolent Change in Our Lives and Our World. Start a study group and join our global community of readers. Several of our publications are designed in a study group format to explore active nonviolence. This includes the new Engage edition and others. Formats offer participants a wide variety of principles, stories, exercises, and readings for learning, experimenting with, and practicing the power of creative nonviolence. 50 cities have joined our Nonviolent Cities Project, actively exploring how to end the cycle of nonviolence. Nonviolent cities not only envision cities that could become nonviolent, it's working to make this vision a reality across the US with organizers in 50 cities. We invite you to work with people in your local community to claim this vision as a way to forward, to uphold this vision, to make your city a nonviolent city. On the first day of each month, we are pleased to post a free new podcast featuring Father John Deere, reflecting on some aspect of nonviolence. Reverend John Deere is an internationally recognized voice and leader for peace and nonviolence. He's been nominated many times for the Nobel Peace Prize, including by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Tutu. John is on the staff of Pace Bene. You can always find the most recent podcast on our website and many podcast subscription services. Watch our YouTube channel. Check out the videos from our intern, Rosie Davila, and her Peace Out with Rosie series. See past trainings, interviews, conferences, and talks on nonviolence. We're organizing online nonviolence workshops each month, covering a variety of topics, topics around nonviolence. Upcoming are nonviolence training and workshop August the 12th, applying meditation for nonviolent living August the 13th, and nonviolence in action planning and strategy course, August the 18th. And the big one this year, September 19th to 27th, everywhere, marching, organizing, speaking out for a new culture of nonviolence, for an end to war, poverty, racism, and environmental destruction. For the last six years, we have organized a national week of action across the U.S and around the world built around September 21st, the International Day of Peace. In 2019, the Week of Action held over 3,300 actions. We have over 3,000 this year so far. We expect many actions will be online. Join this campaign, Nonviolence Week of Action, September 19th to 27th, by helping organize an event or joining an event in your community. Family, all that I've talked about is on our website, pacebene.org. Please continue in our Pace Bene campaign on violence. Peace and love. Thank you, George. Thank you for getting us fired up and ready to go. <laughs> we appreciate you. All right, everyone. So we have 
uh, journey to the end of the conference together. I know there have been several thank yous throughout, um, but I wanted to thank um, Aaron and Robert behind the scenes for helping to organize technology. I wanted to thank all of the amazing speakers who have been present and shared so transparently as it related to and as it relates to your research, wisdom, and knowledge. We appreciate you. Um, and last but not least, I um, wanted to thank the core staff of Pacha Bene Nonviolent Service, Father John Deere, uh, Veronica Pillkirk, uh, Ken Buttigan, and our Executive Director, Ryan Hall. We know that you put in endless hours of time. Yes, let's give them a hand. We know you put in endless hours of time, um, organizing, planning, and you've done such a great job. We are appreciative to you for you, and we thank God for you. Um, thank you to everyone who joined uh, the Campaign Nonviolence National Conference. Um, we, this was the sweetest next thing to actually being in person. We did it together, we journeyed together, and we got an abundance of great information to help us move forward on the nonviolent journey. Um, the whole conference was recorded, so Pache Bene will be sending you a link where you can uh, share or and also use as a resource moving forward. All right? We will uh, finish off with Brother M singing a song coming from South Africa. Blessings and peace, and thank you again. Bye. Hello, everybody. My name is Mapumba, also known as Brother M. I am based in Cape Town, and I am very glad to be part of the campaign Nonviolence Conference USA. I'll be playing you my song, Please Don't Blow It. Much more than we ever, 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 ever had before. Please don't go. Let's start. And whatever we're gonna go for has to be much more than silver and gold. People, we know this. Let's start blowing. Let's start blowing. Let's start blowing now. Let's start blowing now. Silver and gold people, we know this. <laughs> Please don't blow it. <laughs> Please don't blow it. Please don't blow it. Please don't blow it. No. <laughs> Please don't blow it. <laughs> Please don't blow it. <laughs> Let's not blow it. <laughs> 
Yeah. Let's not blow it. Me and you, let's not blow it. Oh, no, 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 let's not blow it. You and I, let's not blow it now, 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 now. See, we've got an opportunity to learn much more than we ever, 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 ever had before. No, no, let's not blow it. <laughs> let's not blow it. <laughs> let's not blow it. <laughs> let's not. And whatever we're gonna go for has to be much more than silver and gold. People, let's know this. <laughs> let's not blow it. Come on. Please don't blow it. <laughs> Please don't blow it. No, no. Please don't blow it. <laughs> Please don't blow it. No, no. Let's not blow it. Let's not blow it, blow, 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 no, 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 let's not blow it, <laughs> grow together, <laughs> so much better, <laughs> much, much further, <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> let's not blow it, no, no, let's not blow it, <laughs> please don't blow it, <laughs> please don't, cause we've got an opportunity to learn much more than we ever, 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 ever had before. Please don't blow it now.